Surgical Alumni, I extend my warm welcome to all of you who have gathered here for the Professor Aram Verma Memorial Neurosurgery CME. Teachers hold a very special place in the lives of their students. They play a very important role in shaping a nation's future. We are here today to celebrate the honor of knowing and learning from a few of the best minds in neurosurgery. To get the program started, may I kindly invite the following dignitaries onto the stage. Professor Sanjay Bihari, Honorable Director, ACTIMST. Professor Ishwar HV, Head of the Department, Neurosurgery, ACTIMST. Professor Ravi Gopal Verma, Director, Global Center of Excellence in Neurosciences and Lead Consultant Neurosurgeon, Astra Hospitals, Bangalore. Dr. Ramakrishna Ishwaran, Chief Neurosurgeon and Director, Neuro One Hospital, Tiruchirappalli. Please take your seats. begin that auspicious event with a prayer in the name of Lord Almighty and invoke the choicest of blessings, may I invite Ms. Anju, Ms. Danya, and Ms. Aparna for the opening prayer. May I request all the dignitaries, faculties, and delegates present here to rise for the invocation. Thank you for that wonderful prayer. As we begin the formal event, it is only right to invite the man behind the conception of this program, who, along with his team, have put in a great deal of effort to make this CME a reality. I kindly request Professor Ishwar HV, Head of the Department, Neurosurgery, ACTIMST, for his welcome address. Over to you, sir. The Honorable Director of the Sri Chitra Institute for Medical Science and Technology, Dr. Sanjay Bihari. Um, <clears throat> the two guests in our midst, uh, Her Highness Puyam Tirunal, Yori Parvati Bai, Dr. Professor Dr. Ramakrishna Ishwaran, my good friend Dr. Evi Gopal Varma, also my senior at Sri Chitra, and my revered teacher, Professor Suresh Nair, and his wife, Dr. Vinita Suresh, my beloved members of my Chitra family who have assembled here at our invitation my dear faculty, and all the esteemed members of this audience. Good morning to you all. <clears throat> if you look at all of us who sit in this august audience named after the famous Chief Minister of Sri Yachudamenan as part of the Sri Chitra Institute of Medical Sciences, you will see a common thread or an invisible thread that runs through us. This thread is that we have all been benefited by this institution, that is the Sri Chitra Thirunal. We have either received salaries or have received great value additions in the form of a degree from here. 
This thread gives us a sense of pride. The pride is because we have a social standing in our, in our community around us. And this social standing comes because of the credibility that our institution has, the compassion for poor that we have, the not being blemished by corruption of any sort as we render great patient care to the poor and needy who need it. And to this, we owe to none other than the founder of the institute, that is Maharaja Sri Chitratirnal Balarama Varma. This man lived abstemiously, was addressed as Ponnu Tamburan. The Tamburati told me that he doesn't wear a shred of gold unless it is for a ritual or protocol, and always believed that he should do something good for the people. I'm sure that he rightfully deserves the title of Ponnu Tamburan. I, pay, I begin my invitation, my, my, my job, by thanking him, paying the tribute that he deserves to Maharaja Sri Chitratirinal Balarama Varma. Now, why do we have it, this function to celebrate, venerate late Dr. Aram Varma? After all, he has not been in Sri Chitra. It's almost 100 years since uh, he has been here in, on this, or since he, and he, he had spent, this is the 101st year after he passed, he was born in, in, the, in this world. Uh, this man set up the National Institute for Mental Health and Neurological Sciences, which was a game changer for many people in this part of the world. Nimhans catered to the poor and needy of this country and also trained hundreds and hundreds of specialists in neurology, neurosurgery, and psychiatry. The impact of this can never be measured in the form of any wealth. Also, incidentally, Dr. Varma has been instrumental in guiding shaping up Chitra's neurosurgery department in the initial years. You have to understand that Sri Chitra, in India was a fledgling country. And there were no hospitals of repute in any part of India as the British left. It was left to a few great men who strived to create centers of excellence in our part of the world after getting degrees from elsewhere, abroad. And these institutions have served this nation very well, especially our public institutions. We have to understand that if you want an MRI in Canada, it takes about three to six months. And if you want an elective neurosurgical procedure in uh, Great Britain, you call it Great Britain, it takes about six months before a meningioma can be removed. But in our country, as we stand today, thanks to the great investments that have been made in public sector, our turnover on time has come down to a few weeks. An MRI can be done in a few days, whereas a person in Canada who needs a dental treatment has to come to India and do it and go back. We owe this to the people who set up great institutions in this country. And it is for this reason, specific reason, that we commemorate the memory of Dr. R. M. Varma here today. Let me come back to the guest of honor today, Princess Puyam Tirunal. She is a very familiar face in our part of the world. She is a constant presence in the social scene. When you say social scene, then immediately you think that they are page three personalities. No, they're not page three personalities. They are versatile speakers, they are eloquent, and more importantly, well-versed with the history of Triangur. In fact, having lived close to Maharaja Sri Chitratinal Balarama Arma, they had an insight, insight into the history and shaping up of our society in recent times. And I'm sure that she is going to share with us today how this great institution, Sri Jitra Tirunal, came into being, and more importantly, what Dr. Aram Marma's role was in here. My next person that, that I should invite to this audience is Dr. Ramakrishna Ishwaran. We share the same surname, but incidentally, he's a great legend. I came to know of him when I was posted in Nimhans about 20 years ago. And when we were going through the old files, we found very crisply written notes with all the information about patients, which are relevant even after 30 years, 40 years. And it belonged to none other than Dr. Ramakrishna Ishwaran. Professor, uh, um, professor of that time, uh, Dr. Shastri told me that this is one man you should emulate to be. Uh, in the neurosurgical circles, he is known as an intellectual because he conducts all the 
uh, clinical pathological correlation meetings everywhere. And also, when he speaks at medical meetings, we listen. Sir, I welcome you to this meeting and to give us a narration on a talk on RM Varma. The next person whom I have to say welcome is our beloved director, Dr. Sanjay Bihari. Dr. Sanjay Bihari is an outsider for us, but who has become an insider within one year. He was a professor and head at the Department of Neurosurgery at an institution of national importance at Sanjay Gandhi Institute for Postgraduate Medical Sciences. He served as the editor of Neurology India for quite some time and served creditably well. He was also in a partnership, research partnership with the Indian Institute of Technology at, at Kanpur. And more importantly, he was a man who was a very good photographer. His photos and the new cover pages of Neurology India were always attractive and appealing. Over the years, you know, he, you know, he decided to you know, shift the scene from Lucknow to Trivandrum, and he is with us today. In fact, he has always been raising the bar for the neurosurgery and other departments in our institution. How does he do that? His grouse is that Sri Chitra does a lot of things, but does not let the world know that they are doing it. There are many institutions in this country which punches more than uh, you know, the, the strength that it has and gets away with it, whereas we remain relatively anonymous. He has always been telling us to go and tell the world what you do. In fact, uh, six months ago, when we decided to commemorate the memory of Dr. R.M. Routh, the legendary professor and head of the Department of Neurosurgery, he backed us to the hilt and ensured that the governing body of the institute, he navigated the permissions through from the governing body of the institute, ensured that eminent speakers from all over India and the guest speaker from abroad all came and participated in this. I should say, I should not be saying welcome, sir. I should be saying thank you, sir. Thank you for being here with us, playing that sheet anger role behind us. Let me come to my teacher, Professor Suresh Nair. I am not a sycophant. Nobody can, of all the crimes that I can be accused of, sycophancy is not one. Professor Suresh Nair is a legend here, out here and for the rest of the world. As a stickler of academic punctuality, you can see his car parked there at around 6.30 a.m. in the morning. He never leaves the house without reading about what the patients about the patients who are admitted there, the clinical conditions that the patients have, and what is the best treatment for them. He is abreast with what is latest in neurosurgery. In fact, he is the most well-read person in the world in neurosurgery. I'm sure many neurologists look down upon neurosurgeons because they are seen as people who do the technical job of fixing the plumbing, removing the tumor, et cetera, et cetera. But then with Suresh Nair, sir, well, the neurologist kind of deal him with him with a lot of respect because he knows more neurology than the neurologists themselves. Let me come to the radiology. He has constantly strived to ensure that all of us are well versed with radiology. His, uh, you know, every day he will go and sit with the radiologist and discuss newer things and share it with us. This was his passion for neurology and neurosurgery and radiology as he was a professor, which he continues to do so even after his superannuation from Sri Chitra. You know, sir, there is an element of Suresh Nair, sir, in all of us. And that is because imitation is the best form of flattery. Sir, thank you for being a teacher par excellence in our midst. Thank you for being here. <laughs> I would fail as a human if I don't recognize and acknowledge the presence of Dr. Vinita Suresh in the life of Dr. Suresh Nair and in our lives. In fact, since 1997, we have shared a lot of good vibes between each other. And I must confess a great uh, sense of, you know, appreciation and respect for the kind of intellectual that she is. She reads a lot and she kind of gives us wise messages. Welcome, madam. <clears throat> Last but not the least is my good friend, Ravi Gopal Varma. He, <coughs> we have some water.
Ravi Chetan, as I call him, has been a good friend since 1997, when he was a second year resident and I was a lowly, lowly houseman. He treated me with a lot of kindness and care, ensured that I become a neurosurgeon. He kindled the interest of neurosurgery in me. In fact, in Bangalore, he is uh, one of the most busiest practitioners having in dealing with the state-of-the-art neurosurgery, including spinal cord stimulation. When we discussed about this idea of having a commemorative program in the name of Dr. R. M. Varma, he readily agreed and agreed and promised to do something more. I do not wish to steal his thunder, and I am sure he will make an announcement about that when his time turn comes. Welcome to Dr. Revi Gopal Varma, an alumnus of Sri Prakashan Institute. You know, last but not the least, I should acknowledge all my staff out here who have come at our invitation. More importantly, the people in the neuro operating rooms who had done an excellent job in making up, in stitching up, suturing up an operating room nurses manual from a nurse's perspective. They have worked hard in the last few weeks to make sure it happens. Because in India, what happens is there is a wealth of knowledge and experience that we accrue over the years. But unfortunately, this wealth of knowledge dies with that person. Many of things like Ayurveda died because it was never chronicled in the, in the way that science should have been. In order to buck this trend, we are trying to come up with our own experiences often from a developing nation on how to develop an operating theater for neurosurgical purposes. I compliment all my staff at the neuro operating room who made this possible. Congratulations. <laughs> Last but not the least, there are a lot of eminent personalities in our midst and our pensioners. We, you know, it has been a great effort to make this happen, but then this effort uh, will show, will all light up our lives because only because there are a lot of people present here on our invitation. There are many professors from other institutions and other uh, part of, uh, and former scientists and doctors from our own institute who are present here on our invitation. I welcome you all to this meeting. As you know, as you know, we have spending, we have crossed 75 years of being an independent nation. It is, we are in the cusp of history because finally, India is seeing a lot of prosperity, development in science, technology, and all social, on, and the social aspects of life. All this would not have been possible, but for the sacrifices of people who gave up their lives and livelihoods and futures for, the, for getting us the freedom from British. I, I, I end my words with glorious tributes to all the freedom fighters because of whom we got freedom and we came here and we reached here. Thank you very much for all of you for coming here at our invitation. Jai Hind. Thank you, sir, for that heartwarming and erudite welcome speech. Light is a symbol of brightness and prosperity. And to make this event a blessed one, I request Professor Sanjay Bihari, our Honorable Director, to kindle the lamp of knowledge and wisdom. I invite all the dignitaries on stage to join this ceremony. Thank you. 
Thank you, everybody. May I now invite Professor Sanjay Bihari, our Honorable Director, for the inaugural address and his talk on neurosurgical training in India, the quest for utopia. Over to you, sir. Uh, a very good morning to you. Uh, it's an absolute privilege and honor for me to welcome all of you to this August occasion. Uh, as editor of Neurology India, uh, I had this very good fortune of collecting histories of all neurosurgical departments. And uh, in this process, I was also uh, you know, directly involved with collecting history of NIMHANS. And then I realized what a special person Dr. Raja Marthanda Varma was. And uh, his ideas and his concept uh, really has developed an institution which actually acts as a citadel of inspiration for all other institutions of India and is now regarded as one of the best institutes of national importance. And I'm so grateful to the Department of Neurosurgery for actually having this program which recognizes his work and his inspiration. Uh, Her Highness Puyam Tirunal has been um, so inspirational. I've been in very close contact with the royal family. In fact, when my family came here, I mean, they were kind enough to actually invite us all and uh, uh, to dinner, and we had the good fortune of actually seeing them uh, at close quarters. And their humility and their ability to, you know, inspire everyone as well as to actually, uh, you know, uh, create a sense of absolute uh, inspiration for all of us in Kerala. Uh, all I can do is to say thank you, ma'am, for all your good wishes for our institute and for all your support for our institute. Professor Ravi Varma is a very close friend for a, a long time. And uh, we, we keep meeting in several neurosurgical um, meetings. And uh, I mean, he has actually in Bangalore um, um, worked on a very niche area um, that he got trained for in uh, Sri Chitra. And that was uh, the implantation of neural prosthesis. And a lot of work in that area is being done by him, pioneering work. And I think it is to Sri Chitra's credit that all this pioneering work which people uh, establish in different places um, all over the country is because of the teaching which comes from Sri Chitra. So thank you so much for coming here. <laughs> Dr. Ishwaran, we have been closely associated, I would say, for almost 20 years now. Uh, we were actually co-authoring the textbook of neurosurgery together and um, um, the several areas, and I tell you that his work in, uh, has been very, very important, not only as a clinical neurosurgeon, but as an academic neurosurgeon. So thank you so much, sir, for coming here. Um, Professor Radhakrishnan, all the other senior professors, faculty members, distinguished guests, I welcome you, all of you to this uh, absolutely august gathering. Ms. Lailamma and Ms. Shaini, the nursing in charge of neurosurgery ICU, SCT, MST, and neurosurgery OTs, leaders of the team that have brought out the neurosurgical manual. I think uh, I had uh, ab ability to glance at it, and I can tell you that this will, it will serve as the foundation for nursing care all over the country, especially in neurosciences. So I congratulate you on this outstanding effort. Thank you so much. Dr. Matthew, Dr. Bahulian, Dr. Dilip Panikar, and Dr. Ravi Mohan Rao. All of them have my close friends, and we've been you know, uh, meeting each other for nearly 30 odd years. And uh, I can say that they now represent the doyens of neurosurgery in India. And I'm so proud to be a friend and a colleague. So thank you so much for coming here and sharing your knowledge with all of us. Thank you so much. Professor Keshav Das, the Deputy Director, former Dean and HOD, 
ISIR, Dr. Professor Manikandan, Professor Sham Krishnan, they represent my colleagues, my friends, my advisors, and they have been um, instrumental in guiding me all through my one and a quarter year that I've been here. So thank you so much for being here. And finally, Dr. Ishwar, Dr. Krishna Kumar, and the entire team and faculty, residents, nursing and paramedical staff of the fraternity of Sri Chitra, I welcome you to this August gathering. Thank you so much for being here. I was given this uh, honor of talking about the changes in neurosurgical cur curriculum. And of course, this not only works for neurosurgery, but for ev every other subject. So what is the quest for utopia? What is the roadmap for the future? I'd like to share with you 20 tenets. First of all, is a very strange thing which happens because of which most of the senior residents now don't take up neurosurgery as a career. And that is basically because the same thing happened to me. I was an MS general surgery resident and I never thought that I could actually become a neurosurgeon. But it's a long training program and at the end of the training, somehow you make it. So the point is that there has to be sufficient exposure to the subject during the MBBS and MS programs and also, we need to somehow introduce the six-year training programs in neurosurgery so that we can catch them young. And I think because of lack of sufficient exposure, there is a self-inadequacy because of which many children are unable to take the leap of faith. So the first is influence them young. I think this is a very, very important aspect to it. As soon as a resident comes into neurosurgery, I've often noticed that within the first six months, a lot of them quit neurosurgery. And that's because they find it a very artist going. They don't know what is happening. They have never been exposed to brain surgery. And it's long hours, sometimes very painful. Sometimes patients don't do well. Sometimes it's a very high risk surgery. And every day morning, there is a class. And you are expected to actually talk about a lot. So I think in the first month, I think a lot of personal issues need to be sorted out for the senior residents. They include introduction to faculty. The f they should know who the faculty, who the nursing staff is, who the people are, workflow and time schedules, duties and responsibilities, hospital information systems, introduction to subjects and subspecialities, record keeping, research responsibilities, consent taking and breaking bad news basic procedures, ethics, and patient confidentiality. These, are, these appear to be very simple things. But if they have a prior knowledge of these small and simple things, it really makes their job much easier. So they get a direction on which to work. So the second conclusion is foundation training is absolutely mandatory in the uh, system. There was this wonderful paper which came in Neurology India where they talked about teaching. And so they asked all the residents in India, what kind of teaching do you want? And almost 72% uh, almost of them said that they either wanted a clinical case presentation or pre-operative discussion. And the other very interesting thing was now, from the traditional textbook teaching, from publication, reading teaching, it is now being gradually shifted to electronic teaching. So most of them will have iPads, they will go to electronic media, they will actually learn from there. So I think the most important thing here is that what they are emphasizing here is that rather than having this long didactic lectures, what you need is participatory training, bedside teaching, mentorship in uh, surgery. You need, they need to have a hands-on program, which includes cadaveric dissection, simulations, group discussions, evidence-based learning clinical pathological correlation, electronic teaching with diagrams and figures, short focus teaching, less than 20 minutes in small groups with continuous responses. And they need electronic resource material. So the third conclusion is short participative training is the need of the time rather than one long didactic lecture which they, in which they actually fall asleep. The third very the, the fourth conclusion is that when they were evaluated, only 49% of centers in India have a periodic assessment. And even these periodic assessments don't actually count towards the final assessment. And 67% of the residents in this um, uh, you know, the survey were in favor of having periodic assessments with only 6.7% actually disagreeing to this 
pattern. And in Sri Chitra, um, I think this fantastic internal assessment, which actually counts towards the final MC program, is a very unique uh, um, endeavor, which I think should be emulated by every medical institution of the country. So my conclusion for this, credit-based evaluation and periodic internal assessments are favored by every single resident of neurosurgery. The conclusion five is that I think now modern methods of uh, teaching have to come in, which includes medical simulation, virtual reality. And with the biomedical technology wing, we are in the process of you know, getting various medical simulation models, and we hope to get, uh, achieve something by the end of this year. And that includes uh, immersive systems like graphic rendering, haptic feedback, uh, tissue deformation, surgical planning and complication avoidance, 3D printing, and skill assessment. So conclusion five is that computer-based methods with haptic touch and skill assessments are needed rather than you know, just going on uh, reading from textbooks. So this is all said by residents. The other very important thing which everybody emphasized was that they don't want a teaching in isolated subjects. They don't want anatomy, physiology, radiology, pathology as isolated subjects. What they wanted were clinical modules, which means that if you are looking at one particular aspect, say raise intraclinal pressure, then you will have basic sciences, paraclinical and radiological sciences, clinical sciences, biomedical sciences, and engineering, all combining together to, to talk about that specific topic and not as an isolated thing. OK, you're, there's a chapter on pathology, then there is a class on microbiology, then there is a class on radiology, and a class on neurology. So they want a combination on a focused on clinical modules. That is what they want. And that is the next point that I like to talk about. The other very important point is a flexible complementary subspeciality scheme. So the millennials have a different outlook towards life. They say, we don't want to learn everything. Why should we waste our times on, time on ev learning everything? What they want is more focused areas which can develop into great subspecialities. And therefore, these are neuro-oncology, cerebrovascular surgery, minimally invasive spine surgery. We have started several postdoctoral fellowship programs in this. But the important thing is that important areas like radio surgery, endovascular surgery, epilepsy surgery, deep brain stimulation surgery, minimally invasive spine surgery, spinal deformity surgeries, head and neck surgery, and so many other areas, they, they want to develop and they cannot develop simply because they don't, they're not focused upon it. So a flexible complementary subspeciality scheme means that they, they are desirous of a particular subspeciality. And in the residency program, focus can be actually given to them individually to actually focus on their own subspeciality so that each resident develops his or her own specific subspeciality. So conclusion seven is teaching should be based on comprehensively created clinical modules rather than it being a general area. Then the other thing is in the UK, you have this RETA, which is known as Record of In-Training Assessment. So what happens is every six months, the resident has to go back to the consultant and has to say, OK, this is my yearly CV. These are my demands. These are the perceived lacunae in my training that I perceive myself. These are the total number of cases that I did. This is the total number of research I conducted. And this is what I actually want for the next six months. And in a centralized way, which goes to the Royal College of Surgeons, they assess that and give a feedback back to the professors. So this is a very, very centralized system. I think this also needs to come to India because each person's demand is different. And you cannot treat them uniformly across the board. You have to understand that each person is an individual who has his own desires, ambitions, and uh, ways of progressing their own careers. This is a very, very important thing that we need to get into our system. So an assessment of the resident's demands and a centralized computed objective reporting of his or her needs is required on an annual basis. Then, of course, there are some fundamental 0-1 courses. Uh, there is immediately going to be a, a, a no on this, but I would say that there have to be mandatory courses. These include biostatistics, computers, scientific communication and literature research, intellectual property rights, and elective courses like you know, bioethics, informed consents, uh, surgical safety, know your equipment and its maintenance contracts, scientific record keeping and data management, 
starting a startup company, all of them should be a part of the curriculum. So conclusion nine is fundamental courses are necessary for overall development of students. And there should be a spectrum of, fund, of these fundamental courses that this resident should choose from before they appear for the final exam. A very interesting thing is, almost 70% of our students go into private practice. And there is no focus, no focus in any academic institution on how to develop your um, private practice. And how to set up a practice, how to set up personal and professional financing, general principles of administration, excelling in daycare procedures, excelling in management of pain, setting up standard operating procedures for private hospitals, how to negotiate a contract, how to sterilize equipment. I think this is a very, very important aspect of the curriculum. So my conclusion 10 is a part of the curriculum should focus on establishing private practice, which will be the focus of a majority of residents. One way, place where all of us Indians lack is retrievable record keeping. The emphasis is on retrievable record keeping. And so they have to be co coded according to the International Code of Diseases. They should be linked to finances. They should be linked to statistical charts. The input is more important than the output. And therefore, conclusion 11 is maintaining proper records and its retrieval and utilization is an very, very essential part of the training. It's a self-audit. You suddenly realize, oh my god, this case which I was doing, this procedure which I was doing was not as successful as I thought it would be. And this is a very, very important part. And now with all this litigation coming in, retrievable record keeping is mandatory for all of us. Conclusion 12 relates to research, publishing, and technology development. It, there, there's this continuous emphasis on saying that, OK, publications are not good enough. They are, they are useless. Uh, what is the point in wasting time on publication? This is a continuous thing. But what happens is that an honest clinical publication actually starts from the day that the patient first visits the doctor in the outpatient clinic. This leads to self-auditing, like I've already said. Acknowledging the work done by peers in the field in your own country authenticates the author's own work and improves one's own citations. Nature shows its patterns provided you learn to recognize them. And finally, learning to recognize predatory journals in the era of publish or perish is a very, very important part. And any evaluation, scientometric evaluation that is done for your institution or of you as an individual always considers publications which, you, which emanate from you and from your institution. So I think, Conclusion 12 is publication does encourage innovation, teamwork, ethical advertisement, self-audit, mastery over subject, liaison with other players in the field, and also leads to the development of medical vocabulary and writing skills. And I don't think this should be underestimated. Then comes immersion. Conclusion 13 is that immersive experience in different aspects of medicine, such as basic research, community health, and development of biomedical technology has now become an integral part of our curriculum. And therefore, senior residents have to mandatory glow to our different wings, learn for themselves biostatistics, computers, large data processing, development of biomedical projects, technology development, intellectual property rights, because sooner than later, you cannot copy things from the West. You have to make your own things, and you have to copyright them. You have to make your own patents. And it's better you learn it, the better it is for you. The next is, conclusion 14 is diversification of skills. You know, we only think very unilaterally till we come get into the MCH. But you know, when you reach higher and higher, it's not only your your, your skills are important, your public speaking skills, your ability to recognize data, your ability to negotiate contract, your, your, your own or humanities you need to develop. I have seen so many uh, students who are such fantastic artists, and they suppress their talent simply because they are reading from books. And the same people in a different setup, in a different uh, curriculum, would also enhance their artistic skills which will be so much more handy in their educational uh, armamentarium. So I would, conclusion 14 is, diversification of skills and rotation to other national and international departments, humanities, biostatics, and computers is a very, very important aspect of this. Conclusion 15 is, 
that when I got an interview, as I mean, got a call for interview, I was shortlisted for Sri Chitra. The first question they asked me was, how will you handle harassment at workplace? And to my surprise, I had no answer for it. I didn't know how it is handled. Honestly, at the level of director, I didn't know. So the point is that all these things are very, very important. What is communication? What is zero tolerance policy and protocol? Workplace violence training, encouraging confidential reporting of concerns or specific incidences. Consider the use of outside expertise to provide threat assessment training and physical security upgrades, the POSH Act. All these things should become a part of your MMTNM. You should know how to actually work on this. So conclusion 15 is that standard operating procedures for workplace violence and harassment should be in place and should be widely taught during your residency program. Then comes the examination. So what the, what the interesting thing is that everybody, all the residents want an examination. And they said that all the patterns are perfect in that national poll which was held. So which actually states that there has to be a nationalized theory examination with multiple choice and theory questions. The second is that focus on wide coverage and objectivity on comprehensive learning by partial you know, uh, modules, which are PowerPoint based, clinical based, and partial clinical tests. And a very important aspect is integrate the internal assessment in the assessment program. So the conclusion 16 is a three-pronged examination system, which includes a nationalized test, an OSCE, and a clinical test, internal assessment. All of them are needed now. So the examination pattern has to be actually changed. The other very important thing is, you know, we, during our era, it was like we are machos, macho surgeons. OK, we can work for 24 hours. We can work for 365 days. Our family is not important. But things are changing. And gradually, in the West, people have realized that as you become tired, you make mistakes, you become irritable. And uh, for a, you are a marathon runner. You're not a 100 meters runner. And for that, the decreasing number of residents opting for neurosurgery is also related to a skewed life balance and the fear of litigation. And therefore, one important thing is that we need to decrease and our work hours for residents and make them more rationalized. I think this is a constant demand, and that in actually in, uh, encourages creativity and uh, you know innovation. And that is something that we need to now focus on. And finally, conclusion 18 is improving the gender ratio. 50% of the potential applicants actually don't apply. And uh, uh, there was a very interesting study on, uh, on leadership. And they found uh, in, that women do it better than men in several parameters in terms of initiative, in terms of teamwork, in terms of self-development, in terms of developing others. It comes naturally to them you know, to be self-effacing and self-sacrificing. And what prevents them from actually getting into the system is lack of flexi time, the persistent motherhood penalty, which they all make. And so a lady will be offered in the West almost $11,000 per annum less than their male counterparts. And the macho image of a surgeon, oh, he, he can spend hours and hours in this. All this is going. I think we need to ensure that this gender ratio is improved. And 50% of the potential candidates should also apply to subjects like neurosurgery. Conclusion 19 relates to aftermath of training. The responsibility of an institution does not stop at giving imparting training. A proper job placement, follow-up assessment, and revalidation is absolutely essential. Therefore, campus placements, focus sociality, national and international training, dual degree programs, alumni input in the training programs. And for this, I would request the alumni to actually come and help us in our training programs. And reassessment of skills every five years is a very, very important part of the training program. Then we come to self-development and self-awareness, which is my conclusion 20. We need courses in self-awareness, which includes self-appraisal. There are several scientific methods of self-appraisal, 360 degrees of feedback and development of personality. And I need to understand that we need more programs on this so that we see ourselves 
as others see us. So I think this is a very, very important part of the training program. So I thought that, um, thank you so much for hearing, and I think Professor Naya is the epitome of the uh, teaching program from the morning till now, he teaches. And uh, I can tell you one small thing, that uh, when the president of the, uh, new, um, there was this election for the presidentship of the Neurological Society of India, which has nearly eight to 9,000 members now, if you look at all the technicians and nurses and all the faculty and residents, and uh, this is the only year in the recent times when he appeared for the president's post and nobody else uh, stood to oppose him. And that speaks volumes of uh, his mentorship and his uh, teaching abilities. So thank you so much for all that you have done for all of us. So thank you very much for giving me this patient hearing and kind attention. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for that passionate, immersive, thought-provoking speech. May I now invite on stage Her Highness Puyam Tirunal Gauri Parvati Bhai, member of the Travancore Royal Family, niece of the late Maharaja Sri Chittira Tirunal Balarama Verma, to share her thoughts on this August occasion. Ma'am. to all the dignitaries on the dais and in front of me, because you are all dignitaries. A very warm good morning and my namaskarams. Whenever our family has a chance to associate with the function held under the aegis of Sri Chitra, it gives us a very maternal sense of pride because we feel this is our baby. Our baby has grown. Our baby has gone past the teething troubles and is now standing on its own feet, being an example to others in the country and overseas. Dr. Ishwar said, talk about the history of the institute, which many of you may not know. When my uncle was turning 60, the Shashtabda Burti is an important uh, event in one's life because according to the, to, the, to the books, and it is correct also, when you are born, there is a certain planetary configuration, and that configuration gets repeated in the exact way on the 60th birthday, and then again on your 120th birthday, which most of us don't make, but that is the Purusha is uh, mentioned in the scriptures. So when his birthday was coming around, you know, he was a person who never wanted any, any projection or anything done in his name. He was a very retiring personality. But my grandmother, she, she called me one day and she said, uh, we must do something for uh, Kutan's birthday. She called him Kutan. This is also a Kutan. Dr. Aram Verma's son is also a Kutan. We have a lot of Kutans in our family. So she said, we must do something for uh, his birthday. And if you ask him, he will not permit anything. So what about some ideas? You have a little chat with uh, Professor Narana Pai. Dr. Pai was our family doctor. And you know, poor man, he would come to see my grandmother. Five minutes later, a call would come. Some patient is critical. So he was always on the run. But that one day, it so happened, nobody called him. So he even had time for a cup of tea. So I said, doctor, no, grandmother wants to do something for uh, my uncle's 60th birthday. And do you have any suggestions? He didn't even have to think. He said, you know what is the problem with our uh, uh, country? All the best brains are going away. We are having a brain drain on a massive scale. So we must give some kind of speciality education and also attach a research wing to it. So he said, don't try to make a hospital with every kind of speciality. Choose one and develop that. So we asked him, what would be your uh, first choice? And he said, you know, looking at the number of cases that come up before us, 
I would say go for cardiology. And as a sister, go for neurology. So this was his suggestion. This was when my uncle was 58 years old, that long ago. So once the thought was being translated into action, you need the help of so many people. You need all the red tape clearances. It was a very difficult thing because the, the government, they said, OK, it's a very good idea. We will be happy to accept. But then, how are you going to run this? We said, we are not going to run it. We are only going to set it up and hand it over to you to run because we can't obviously run a medical facility, especially with the research. I mean, we are not equipped for that. But we'll build the infrastructure and hand it over to you. And they said, OK. So we made the infrastructure. And this is the time that Dr. Aram Verma, who's also uh, related to us, we used to call him Sumaramavan, he came in. Because for neurology, we could think of nobody else to consult. So he gave us a lot of input during those early days on how to set up the institute, how to go about it. Because he had considerable experience in administration and um, founding of hospitals. He was an all-round personality who, who was a teacher, who was an organizer, who was a doctor, and above all, a very caring and fine human being. So with Dr. Pai on uh, one hand, and with Dr. Aram Verma on the other hand, the Sri Chitra Institute took shape. You know, there was a building, there was a car, there was a director, there was a fourth class employee and two security men, but nothing happened. It sort of stagnated. And then it was the involvement of the central government and this institution coming under science and technology that led it to its present status. Unfortunately, many uh, hospitals and doctors saw this as a competitor, as a threat to their own institutions. And this is wrong, because nobody is in competition. You are here to help people, to help sick people, to treat them, to make them better. You are healers. And so there is no question of who is better, you or I. We have to all work together to make the life of the poor patient. Every, everything is, after all, finally it comes down to human beings. The doctors are human beings. The staff are human beings. And the poor patient is also a human being. The patient comes with an attendant, especially in India, family. And now there is another involvement. There is yet one more involvement, and that is the social media. The social media is doctor, critic, the press, judge, jury, everything. The social media writes about things they don't know about. You get these forwards. These are medical forwards. Now the person who is sending them, does he have any knowledge of what he is forwarding? No. But you can do a lot of harm to the reputation of people. You can do a lot of harm to the very uh, state of the medical profession by forwarding these misleading informations. I have a big job in the morning. I spend about 20 minutes deleting. Other than the good morning uh, messages, if I see these medical forwards, I delete them immediately unread. Because I think if there is something worth reading about, it should come from a person who knows what he's talking about and what he's forwarding. So today you have that big uh, social media as your judge. And that unfortunately does influence a lot of people. You see about violence against doctors. You read about all that. No, I don't think we have the right to be violent against anybody. A doctor is a human being. OK, a doctor can make a mistake. A doctor can go wrong. But you have no business to be the judge and come with a knife or a gun and uh, take law into your own hands. But that is today's trend. Today, you are seeing what is happening in the rest of the world, and you think it's fine. A friend of mine who is a doctor in the UK, 
he was talking to us recently, as recently as two weeks ago. And he said, you read about gun violence in America. Here we have to deal with knife violence. He said, you can ask for uh, more and more uh, restrictions on selling a gun, but you can't say you shouldn't go into a shop and buy a bread knife or a meat cleaver. And he said, we are now concerned about knife violence. So today we are dealing with human beings who are, who are afraid in some way or other of consequences which they do not even know consequences to what. Why are you being attacked? Why is somebody going with a gun into a school and killing nine-year-olds? There, there are no answers to all this. So in this scenario, I think the doctors and the medical po po uh, profession, they are vulnerable. But you are also looked upon. I was telling Dr. Ishwar that one of his uh, patients recently uh, told me, he said, you know, in your uh, Sri Chitra, we have a doctor who's called Ishwar, and to us, he is God. Because he fully justifies his name. He is really, we look upon him as God. So I was very proud and pleased to hear this. Because you feel, now this is one of my own children about whom uh, these compliments are being said. So to come back to Dr. Varma, he was here when my uncle was in hospital, when my grandmother was in hospital, and I was uh, uh, telling the young man that my grandmother and he had a conversation three days before she passed away in this very same hospital. And she said, Sumaira, I have a question for you. And he thought she was going to ask some kind of uh, uh, question about her own state of health. And she said, you know, I'm very interested in music. And there are the Saptaswaras, the seven notes. Why is it Saptaswaras? Why didn't they make it uh, 10 or 9 or 5 or whatever it is? In the Western scale and the Carnatic scale, we have the Saptaswaras. So the resonance... The sari, gama, when you, when you sing it, the arohanam, avarohanam, it must be having some kind of reaction on your nervous system, on the neurological system. Can you tell me what it is? And I, I was there, so I remember. He said, well, may, I never thought of it. But I will, however, try and find out and come back and tell you. Unfortunately, she never lived to hear his answer, and I'm still hoping that somebody will tell me if there is a connection between the saptaswaras and the nervous system of the human being. One more little story and I shall finish because this is a technological thing, and I am a palmer in, in, a, in, in a gathering of panditans, so I should not uh, waste your time telling you grandma's tales. But one more thing, about five years ago, I had a missed Air India flight. And this happens quite often, but when you are a victim, it's not so nice. I'm sitting in the Air India office in uh, Mumbai, trying to get to Frankfurt. Those days you had paper tickets. And the paper ticket is there. A sleepy looking man, he is looking most disinterested. Another person is sitting in a chair and sleeping. Nobody is doing anything. I've been sitting there for four hours. Finally, at six o'clock, the shift changed, and another set of people came. And one lady came. She picked up my ticket, and then she said, who is there from Trivandrum? So I raised a, a weary hand, and I said, me. I've been sitting here for four hours. She said, you know, I have a very soft spot for Trivandrum. I said, oh, good because she's a Punjabi. Her name was Kiran, actually. I still remember that. She said, you know, I have a niece who has epilepsy. And we took her to all the hospitals in North India. They couldn't help her. Finally, we took her to Trivandrum, and there is a wonderful hospital there. And they were able to help her. And that is why I have a very soft spot for uh, Trivandrum. And I asked her, and what is the name of that hospital? And she said, oh, it is called the Sri Chittira Thirunal Institute. So I told her, now that you have said all these wonderful things, that we had a small hand 
in the privilege of setting up that hospital. And if your niece has benefited, I'm very grateful and happy. In 15 minutes, she had everything sorted out. <laughs> she had my, she had my uh, ticket done, everything done. She personally escorted me to the uh, Air India departure lounge. So in that way, I was a beneficiary of uh, Sri Chitra's expertise. And it's nice when strangers, total strangers, who know nothing about your uh, connect with the institution, coming and talking to you, good things about it. We are very proud of this institution. We have been here as patients, as bystanders, as visitors, and we watch with eager anticipation this institution being raised to greater heights. If I had a small hand in bringing about this meeting, I'm doubly grateful because I think Dr. Aramarma deserves to be remembered by his own Malayali community and the Sri Chitra community. You may not have realized how much of a role he played in the initial setting up of this institute. But it was, you know, those days you had no, uh, you couldn't communicate with the WhatsApp and all these things. So it was a telephone call, uh, no delay call or letters. But he never, whenever he came uh, to Trivandrum, and he had his sisters living here then, he, he never omitted to come and uh, call on my grandmother and uncle. And whenever he came, one of the topics of discussion was always the Sri Chitra. So we are proud to see this baby now grown up into adulthood. I'm sure you will all be there to take the institution forward and bring greater glory to its name and also remember those who put in the spade work in the early days. I'm sure my uncle is smiling from up there. He didn't, he didn't want uh, his name to be put for this institution. And my grandmother, she said, Kutta, I've never asked you for anything. I have never asked you for anything, but I'm asking you for this one thing. I want your name to be put for this hospital. And he could never say no to his mother. So he didn't say yes, but he didn't say no either. And we took silence as consent. And that's how this developed with all the prime ministers, all the chief ministers. They were all enthusiastic about it. And once the baby started running, nobody could stop it. And so let it be in the years to come. God bless you all. And may the blessings of Dr. Varma be with all of you in the years to come. I'm very happy, Kutta, that you are instituting this uh, award because without a teacher, there is no future. So that you are, I was a teacher myself, but in a very small way. And I know what a joy it is when all your students write the exam and all of them pass. You are, you are waiting with bated breath to see what the result is. And when you have a 100% pass, you know, you feel a sense of achievement. So I would con congratulate Dr. Suresh Nair and wish him many, many years ahead of useful commitment to the field of medicine. Thank you all once again, and God bless you. Thank you, ma'am, for that very thoughtful speech. <clears throat> Professor R. M. Verma's illustrious career is a light that shines and inspires us to shine brighter. <clears throat> a gifted surgeon, teacher of our excellence, a practical visionary, philosopher, artist, and above all, a self-effacing, generally caring human being. And for the lucky lot who had the honor and privilege of knowing him, Professor R. M. Verma is all that and more. To speak about this extraordinary personality, I call upon Dr. Ramakrishnan Ishwaran, Chief Neurosurgeon and Director, Neuro One Hospital, Trichy, to speak about him. Thank 
Mr. Sanjay Bihari, the director of Sri Chitra, Her Royal Highness Puyam Tiranaj, who's given us such a beautiful uh, account, flowing, lucid account of the history of the Institute. A lot of things that you said were very new to me because though I've been associated with this Institute for quite some time, right from my training period, I had not realized that so much of work had gone into building such an institute of great importance. Uh, Dr. Ishwar, who's uh, been the spearhead for this uh, function today. Professor Suresh Nair, my good friend, and uh, a person who richly deserves receiving the award on, instituted on the name of my professor, Dr. Aram Varma. The faculty of uh, Sri Chitra, all the ex-members of the faculty, the nursing staff, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. I bring greetings to you from one Ranganathan to another uh, person who's lying on a serpent bed, and that is the Ananta Padmanabha Swami's place of Trivandrum, and also from the Tamil Nadu Institute uh, of uh, Association of Neurosurgeons. Thank you for inviting me to this uh, August gathering. Uh, to share my thoughts about uh, Dr. Aram Varma. Professor Raja Marthanda Varma, um, I think it's a great privilege for me to be asked to speak about him today. We all come in contact with several great persons during our uh, training and uh, during our professional life. Some of these people have taught us the science and art of neurosurgery. I can see the example of Dr. Suresh Nair sitting here, who's imparted training to hundreds of neurosurgical residents. Some have had a sustained influence on our uh, personality and on our uh, conduct as human beings. I think the first name that comes to my mind is my own uh, professor, late B.S. Das, who was such a molding influence on our characters for the five years of contact that we had with him. I fondly remember him today. But then, it is rare to see someone with whom you come into just a casual contact. And he leaves a lasting impression on you, an impression that lasts a lifetime. Aram Varma was one such person. Because by the time I joined neurosurgery department, he had already retired. And he, he, had, he used to come in occasionally as a visiting consultant, as a professor emeritus. So our contact with him was uh, rather short. But even in those very brief interactions, he impressed us and he, you know, he, he didn't have to teach anything. You just have to look at him and you could, you could learn a lot of things. And that was the greatness of Professor Aram Varma. Uh, let me, uh, please indulge me when I go down the memory lane. I, um, one morning, it was uh, I think sometime in 1984, Uh, my senior, uh, Dr. Venkatramana, who was senior to me by two years, we were looking at a picture of an MRI. And this picture was brought from somebody who had gone abroad for a meeting. There were no MRIs at that time during our training. And we were all gazing with wonder as to you know, all the structures that are so clearly visible, even in that poor quality MRI of those days. It's not like the MRIs of today. And suddenly, I heard a voice from behind. The, you know, it's on the X-ray lobby, and we are looking at it, two of us. Suddenly, come, someone comes up and says, puts his fingers there and says, that, that is the ventrolateral nucleus of the thalamus, you see? I was taken aback. I, I just turned back and saw a short person with a stubby mustache. I didn't know who he was, because I was just very new in the department. And uh, you know, I could see that intensity with which he could relate to the anatomy there when he is seeing it, and how he's able to spot that immediately, and then he's able to convey it so effectively and with so much of enthusiasm at his age. And that is uh, something that was very striking to me. And as soon as he turned back on us, uh, Dr. Venkatraman told me, hey, you don't know him. This is Aram Varma, man. He said the words with such awe and reverence that I said, there must be something special about this person. That is when I started experiencing more, him more often when he used to come for seeing his patients in Nimhans. And it was these brief moments, I'll allude to some of those moments later on also in this talk, to tell us how he has uh, changed our thinking about, about 
how he was able to you know convey his enthusiasm his uh, interest he he he's literally a person who charges everybody around him and that is the kind of man that he was so he uh, actually is a royal family i know you all of you know that you heard so much from uh, uh, her highness about his royal connections but then when he went to do his neurosurgery at uh, bristol uh, he had a call i think from the health minister of those days i uh, i think it must have been uh, rajkumari amritkaur because she was the one at that time 1957 she was the first health minister of india she was there for 8 years almost so she called up and said uh, you need to come back to india you need to work in a uh, in the all india institute of mental health so he accepted the offer and he told his professor that look i'm going back to india and his professor said look young man you're making a mistake you stay on in england and you will become faculty very soon in the french hospital he said no no i think my calling is in india i'm going back to india that is something that is rare for people in those days to say because he would have had a comfortable life over there and he chose the difficult path of coming back to india setting up institutions it's not it's not an easy job at all in those days and that's what he chose and his professor told him i think you're making a mistake i think you may regret it you may come back i'll keep this post waiting for you for 2 years and uh, in case you wish to return you can always come back but there was no looking back for professor arun verma he stayed on in india so i call him the royal who was also a patriot so he came back to this institute which was looking like this at that time this is the all india institute of mental health it is also attached to the government mental hospital of mysore state and there he started the department of neurosurgery and when they heard that a surgeon was coming over there they had lined up a lot of cases that's what dr ravi had told me a few days back in a telephone conversation all cases like hernia hydrocele etc but the greatness of verma was even at that time he was intent on developing only neurosurgery he said i'm not going to do any of these general surgery you send them all to the general surgeon i'll do only the neurosurgical cases and so he started with a subdural hematoma in uh, january of 1958 the first case to be operated as a neurosurgical case before that a lot of psychosurgery was being done by the psychiatrists themselves and he progressed on to doing things like acoustic neuromas within uh, a few months and you can see the uh, kind of growth before most of us were even born the kind of number of operations that he did and all this as a sole neurosurgeon sole neurosurgeon till 1966 there was no other neurosurgeon to help him to carry on the department the entire weight of the department including seeing the emergencies looking after the patients doing the surgeries all by himself and that too with such large numbers in those days with very very basic and mean facilities that he had his uh, ward was actually a part of a uh, small uh, you know set up within the psychiatry hospital and he didn't have a full time anesthetist he would he would have to rely on the anesthetist who comes from the general hospital so the general hospital would allow the surgeon to go back only in the evenings so all neurosurgeries were done only in the evenings in the beginning and then gradually the, he began to get his own anesthetist and the things started looking up so you must be uh, i mean you, you you will realize that he would have been buried in work the routine mundane work but that would not bog him down because in spite of being a tireless surgeon he was also the innovator and this is a very important facet of uh, dr verma and that is why he decided that a place like sri chitra tirunal should not just focus on clinical sciences but also on the basic sciences he, he was uh, interested in the science behind neurosurgery and that's how he was able to develop these uh, procedures this is a very innovative procedure called percutaneous salamotomy that he developed it was for the tre- tremor of parkinson's disease uh, I, i had not seen him personally do this procedure but many of my seniors many of my teachers have actually seen him assisted him they have also done this procedure and they used to tell me that he used to finish the whole procedure in 20 minutes imagine a person who's been having tremors for years together not controlled by medicine there were no medicines in those days to control the tremors of parkinson's nothing very effective at all and as an outpatient procedure he was able to permanently cure the uh, tremor of parkinson's disease by doing a percutaneous ischemo thalamotomy so how did he do this procedure i was interested in doing uh, knowing how he did this so he looked up the uh, literature that that is there both from verma and from others what he used to, he would do was stick a needle in the face go through the base of the skull through the foramen ovale 
he would put an outer needle which is slightly curved. You can see that needle in the picture then, this in the X-ray. The larger needle is a slightly curved needle so that the inner needle, the thinner needle, 26 gauge needle would go, it will get directed towards the ventrolateral nucleus of the thalamus. And uh, once you reach there, I have uh, been told by, especially by one doctor, uh, Sundararajan, who was his direct disciple and who now practices in uh, Salem. And uh, he used to tell me that as soon as the needle touches the ventrolateral nucleus of the thalamus, the patient's tremor would just, just stop like that. That is what he has seen with his own eyes. And that is a confirmation, a physiological confirmation. Now we do a lot of awake surgery and all that, and uh, you know, not much is being made about it. This was done in an awake patient. In an awake patient, you could immediately get, gauge the response. And in case the problem occurred, the needle was not in position, you would also know that you have done something wrong. You could always readjust the position of the needle and come back. So all this was possible. It is just like doing awake surgery in those days, back in those days. And uh, once you get it, it's not enough to confirm just physiologically. You also have to be anatomically accurate. So he would have this, uh, you know, there is a template. You can see that on the X-ray uh, lobby, he is placing the X-ray on top of a template. And that template tells us exactly the distance to the, uh, that, that's drawn from the uh, Shelton Brands Atlas. Over that, you, could, you can overlay the X-ray and you can make out exactly where you are in the thalamus and you could do the lesioning to cure the patients uh, permanently with a very, very cheap and effective procedure. So that was the greatness of uh, this procedure called percutaneous thalamotomy. Once the, um, now it's important that we, you not only do things, but you also uh, record the, uh, the things that you do. That's very important. You heard uh, Professor Sanjay Bihari talking about the importance of publication. And this is what he did back in 1964. A paper, mind you, this was written up in Neurology India. So there is no need to write it up in any journal. Neurology India has got a great standing, especially under the editorship of uh, people like uh, uh, Sanjay Bihari, and it's become uh, a favorite destination for uh, um, neurology and neurosurgery uh, articles from all over the world. And in that uh, fledgling publication, this, uh, this uh, uh, article was written up. And then he went to Copenhagen to present this paper. Nowadays, we, it often happens that we you know, make presentations on platforms, several platforms, the same presentation. And uh, we don't end up writing it up. But this is not the problem with uh, Professor Verma. He wrote it up first, and only then he took it to the rest of the world. Then there is another very interesting thing, thing that happened. After Verma had grown quite old, he had retired. And uh, uh, there was a person called uh, Dr. Uday Mutane, who was my two years junior. He was a neurology colleague of mine. And uh, he decided to look back at these patients on whom Dr. Verma had done the chemothalamotomy. Because now more investigations were available, MRIs were available. In fact, one patient had died of an unrelated illness and he happened to die in demands and uh, an autopsy had been done on him. So you could see exactly where that lesion was. And it was found that the lesion was not exactly in the ventrolateral nucleus of thalamus, but it was just below that, about a centimeter below that. And that is called the subthalamic nucleus. And now from your uh, uh, stereotactic uh, surgery for Parkinsonism, the uh, DBS and all that, we know that this is a very important uh, target for Parkinsonism. So though he originally assumed that he was in the ventrolateral nucleus of the thalamus, actually it was in the subthalamic nucleus. And uh, see, uh, he, it has been a, his pet theory for you know f several decades that he has been lesioning it in the thalamus, in the ventrolateral nucleus of the thalamus. But when somebody comes up and says, no, it's not in the thalamus, it's all in the subthalamus, he has the scientific spirit to accept it. So when the paper came up by Dr. Uday Mutane, Dr. Verma was the second author of the paper. And I mean, how many of us can take such a turnaround in our uh, you know, lifelong uh, obsessions? It's, it's very difficult to do that. Only a person with a very scientific mind can do that. And Dr. Verma was an example. And when I talked to Dr. Uday Mutane when he was well, he told me that Dr. Verma actually read through the whole paper, made suggestions, and he was a very important part of this whole exercise. So that means he welcomed somebody doing this kind of research and upsetting his findings. This is a rare quality in any scientist. Once you become attached to your pet theory, you will not like to give it up. Any, and anybody who says that you've not done what you had actually intended to do, 
would, would not be, I mean, you, they would be discredited. But Verma was not such a person. And that's why he contributed to this paper, which said that the, the lesion was actually in the subthalamus. So he's also made uh, several other uh, scientific presentations and uh, papers. So he was quite an academic. Apart from being an uh, operating neurosurgeon, he had also been an academic. Now you would have imagined that, you know, being involved with all this uh, scientific work and with the running of the daily work of the department, uh, one would lose his focus. One would not keep the focus very high. Your focus would be to get around for this day, next day, or the next day, and not for, think ahead of times, think ahead for the next five years, ten years. That requires a visionary, and that exactly was what Varma was. Even in 1963, barely five years after he had come into Nimans, he realized that there was a need for an institute in which you could look at the brain as a whole. That means the psychiatry, neurology, the basic sciences, neurosurgery, everything coming together. So that is why he had his brainchild of uh, neurocenter, the idea being developed. And a lot of us have a lot of dreams, but how many of us have the tenacity to pursue our dreams? And this was something which Dr. Varma was able to do. And you'll be surprised to what lengths he went in those days to be able to convince people, and that it is important for people who are in the administration today to have the same kind of singleness of purpose and the tenacity of holding on to their dreams and pursuing them. And you can see what he's doing. He's uh, explaining to the uh, speaker of the Mysore Assembly, I think his name was Baliga, uh, and uh, he's showing him a film on, uh, you know, the, that 18 mm projector about his chemothalamotomy. And he's convincing them that, look, neurosurgery is a good thing to do. It's something, a good thing to invest upon. It's very necessary for the times. And this, he did it in several, uh, uh, yes, with several uh, people in the, in the government, both in the central government and in the state government. He was able to, within uh, two years, he was able to get all the grants that are required to build the neurocenter. But then uh, with, the, with the war that came in, the Bangladesh war that came in and all that, there was some delay. And finally, only in uh, 1973, the Neurocenter building was inaugurated. And uh, there, the uh, neurosurgery, neurology developed from that small seed, it, it grew up. Soon after that, the, it, uh, it was merged with the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, and then it was made into the Nimans. And here you can see no less a person than the President of India, V. V. Giri, coming up and inaugurating Neurocenter in 1973. I think the person who's next to him in the dhoti is uh, Nijilingappa, I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong. Nijilingappa was not in power, but he was instrumental in giving a lot of uh, funds to the institute. And so, in spite of not being in power, he was invited and he's, he's coming, coming in as the front person in this uh, group. So once you've built an institute, it's not enough to just start the institute, it's necessary to run it well. And that he was able to do because he was not just uh, an administrator, but also a teacher. So the teaching program of MCH in neurosurgery was started by him. And uh, within a year of inauguration of Neurocenter, NIMHANS was established, passed by an act of the uh, president. And he became the first director, founding director of this institute. Ran it very well, ran also the teaching program there. Then uh, for some time he shifted as a uh, deputy director of health services to Delhi. But uh, I'm told that uh, he didn't uh, enjoy the stay over there because he, he was, there was a disconnect between his patients, his clinical work, and uh, you know, being in an office just you know, looking at files. And this is the reason why he decided to quit that. Had he stayed on, I'm sure he would have become the Director General of Health Services of India. But he didn't want that. He wanted to come back to his clinical field. So he came back to Nimans, and he was directed till 1979 till he superannuated. And it was then that uh, this phase in which he helped the, uh, the uh, uh, Sri Chitra Tirunal to come up in, the, in, this, in this phase. And this is something which I'm hearing about today. I, I, I know that he had some contact, but I didn't know how intense and how personal his in involvement in this institute was. And it's so right that you people have decided to honor him with this uh, award. And uh, a, a person who's, who richly deserves it is getting it today. He continued as Professor Emeritus, and that was when my contact with him was, those brief moments of contact. He would come to the ward for about you know, 10, 20 minutes, and then he would see patients. And then he would, each, each time he would learn something from him. And that was uh, what is great about Professor Verma. 
Of course, a lot of honors came by his way, including the Padma Shri. Several awards have listed over there. I think it is a, you know, they, as they say, it is the awards that get their honor because they are being bestowed upon Dr. Verma rather than the other way around. He was also the honorary surgeon to the uh, President of uh, India. Now, once you become a powerful administrator, a big uh, scientist, you know, a high-ranking neurosurgeon, it's very easy to lose the human values, and that is something that Dr. Verma never did. He was always a caring human. I'm sure even uh, the speakers before me had always had mentioned about his, this facet of uh, Dr. Verma, the caring human. I would uh, again go down the memory lane. Uh, there was one day when he came for rounds in the ward. He came to see a professor of Indian Institute of Science who was admitted. In, in those days, the special wards were nothing but what you call as, uh, you know, twin sharing rooms today in private hospitals. Two beds, one by one, in one room. That was the maximum special ward care that we could give to patients in Nimans in those days. I don't know if things are different now, but uh, nothing compared to the special wards which you see in private hospitals these days. So this big man, the professor of Indian Institute of Science was there, it was his patient, he came and saw him. And just as he was about to leave, the other patient who was having a Riles tube in his nose, he came out of the toilet and he sat in the next bed. Dr. Verma did not know anything about that patient, but he spent a few minutes, patted him on the shoulder, talked to him, and uh, said, okay, you're going to become all right in two, three months. He came out. Then I was flabbergasted because I know that he, he's seeing his patient, but he's seeing some unrelated patient. Then he told me, look, if I come into the room and see only one patient and go away, the other patient will feel very bad. He may not be my patient, but I am. They, they know that I am the big doctor over here. And when I come in, if I go away without seeing that patient, he's going to feel very bad. So you, you look at that care that he gives to the patient's uh, psychology. Not only that, and he said, I think he's got Wallenberg syndrome. He must, he must be recovering in a few weeks' time. I said, I, then he himself explained. If a person is walking about with an azogastric tube in a neurology ward, most likely he's got a Wallenberg syndrome. <laughs> because other patients who are on nasogastric tubes are comatose, they are out at sensorium, they are not able to walk about. It's only in this condition that they'll be walking about with an azogastric tube. So that is the, also the clinical acumen that you can see. So these are the kind of facets of the person that you see. And these are the things that impress you when you're a young resident. And then, uh, his uh, care for the patient is richly uh, paid back by the patients to him. And there is this story about uh, Mr. Yogananda, a Rotarian, who returned about 50 years later after wandering in many other countries to thank Professor Verma because he had done an operation for a head injury on him and saved his life 50 years back. So 50 years back, somebody remembers the doctor and comes back. And then Dr. Verma is 92 years old to come and thank him. I think. Uh, we don't generate that kind of loyalty these days. I don't know, is, is the problem with us or with our patients? I think it's there for, from both sides, more from our side, because we don't inspire that kind of confidence. We don't, we don't uh, I mean, we, we don't have that kind of a fan following these days, which the people like Professor Verma was able to command so easily. And this is something which was written uh, about from Hindu. I think uh, you read from this and uh, you, it's all that there. I mean, it's all capsulated in one single paragraph. Multifaceted would prove to be an inadequate definition to describe Dr. Verma, a gifted surgeon, a relentless researcher, a teacher for excellence, exceptional organizer, able and proven administrator, a practical visionary, adventurer. I know all these uh, facets, courageous, willing to venture, venture into hitherto untrodden realms, philosopher, okay, artist. This is something that I learned about only from this and I hope uh, Dr. Ravi will be able to uh, enlighten me on this aspect of uh, Professor Varma. I didn't know about this till I you know, started looking up material on him. A giant among men and above all, a self-effacing, genuinely caring human being. I think that is a very, very important quality. You can be all of this, but if you lose that one last facet, then you will not be celebrated like how Dr. Varma is being celebrated today. Dr. Verma is all this and more. He best symbolizes the concept of the ideal man who always aspires to better the lot of others without consideration to self. And this is a beautiful writing by a journalist in the Hindu paper. He was also a, a caring family member. You can see the picture of uh, Dr. Ravi sitting here. And 
I am sure in spite of all this, he was able to give uh, quality education to his uh, children. And uh, I am sure now, after uh, Dr. Ravi, his son is also going to become a neurosurgeon. There will be a third generation of neurosurgeons in this family. I would like to close with a quotation from the Bhagavad Gita. Yadyata charati sreshtaha tattadeveta rojanaha sayat pramanam kurute lokasthadana vartate. What it means is, whatever actions great persons perform, common people like you and me will follow. We'll have to follow. We'll be following and we'll have to follow. And whatever standards they set, the whole world follows. I think it applies so perfectly to Professor Varma. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you so much, sir, for that ardent and eloquent speech. I'm sure that did bring back many memories about the visionary that we are celebrating today. There is one person among us who had the privilege of knowing Professor Aram Verma up close from the time he took his first breath. We all know him for his achievements, his personality, his charisma, and for his unrelentless efforts to spread happiness. We all follow the paths shown by our parents, but there are a few who go the extra mile beyond and ahead. May I now invite Professor Ravi Kopal Verma, Director, Global Center of, uh, Center of Excellence in Neurosciences and Lead Consultant Neurosurgeon, Astor Hospitals, Bangalore, the son of Professor Aram Verma, to share his thoughts on this occasion. Over to you, sir. Thank you so much. Um, a warm good morning um, to all, one and all who are here. It's a great privilege for me to be here and uh, talk about my father. Um, all, all my early, earlier speakers, Dr. Ramakrishna, all have spoken wonderful things, and which are all true. And uh, there's much more which I would like to add on, but then time constraints. So there are a few things that I would like to add. First of all, I would like to thank uh, uh, Her Highness. Um, she was the one who said, we need to do something, because he has done something for us. And at home, we have had multiple discussions with Daddy when he told me how uh, he had to work with um, the royal family and to bring in Chitra and all that. So there are a few things that I will be mentioning. I thank you so much, Madam, for uh, really initiating the whole thing. And um, it was very closely followed by uh, Dr. Sanjay Bihari and Dr. Ishwaran, who took up the, um, the suggestion given by her immediately. I mean, in fact, this was only two, three months, I think, since we even started. It started, I think, when we had Professor Raut's oration, and when um, Madam had told me that this is what's happening, we should do something for him also. And when I spoke to Ishwaran, and he came up with this plan, I think it is the most uh, fitting um, you know, um, gratitude towards my father, because he, above all, was a brilliant teacher. He was a great teacher in every form of life, not just neurosurgery, but he has taught people how to live, how to realize, how to think, and starting, and age was never a barrier. He used to talk to a, a toddler, a, 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 an infant, the way he used to talk to a 90-year-old gentleman, because he never saw the difference. He said, everyone can understand. If I talk, and the, surprisingly, the babies used to look at him and un, sort of act as if they understand what is happening. So he had the ability to uh, you know, attack attention, to whichever age it might be. Um, so after that, uh, uh, the most important thing, I think a few highlights I would like to say. One is from so when Sri Chitra wanted a director, he looked all around for a director, fitting director, because he, we, the whole thing was discussed, so much of money was being spent, it shouldn't go waste. So he then by, um, met um, Dr. Uh, Vilyatan, who was deputed, he would, who finished his cardiothoracic surgery training from a USA and was working in Indians of Science, Indians of Technology in uh, Chennai. And uh, he went and convinced him to come here as a director. And then he told that he is the ideal person to meet technology with clinical uh, medicine. And that is how I think Dr. Um, Malitan came in here and then uh, the rest is history because he took it up to what it stands now from that point. Uh, secondly, as a teacher, um, he all this administrative work he was busy with, there were certain things he did which made a mark. 
For example, Dr. Sundarajan, you had mentioned. So he was working uh, as a non-PG resident in uh, Nimhans, and um, he was working in the library in the evenings to make some money to meet ends. So my father told him, if you're interested in university study and do the entrance, I, you will do well, you will get in. Because those days, he was running around to get people to do neurosurgery. Many people were very happy with general surgery and never wanted to do neurosurgery. So Sundarajan worked very hard and uh, did this night job and the day job. And then uh, when the results came, he was number three. And there were only two seats. So before releasing the result, he took a flight to Delhi and increased the seat from two to four. And then he came back and released the result with Sundarajan inside. So he was to do that. He used to go to that extent. Another such story is um, Dr. Suresh Arur. He's a pediatric neurologist. So he was one person who was doing pediatrics. And daddy had this, um, um, you know, every month he used to go to medical colleges in and around Bangalore and talk about neurosciences so that to increase the um, passion for neurosciences. So this person who was doing his MD pediatrics came and said, I wish I could do neurosciences, but I can't because I'm MD pediatrics. He said, uh, don't lose hope. I'll get back to you. And within three weeks, he got back to him saying, please do the entrance. I have cleared pediatrics also can do neurology. He went to Delhi and got that cleared. So he was a very, very ardent fan of spreading education. And that is why this is so appropriate, I think, um, to f felicitate him for this. Because there's, uh, apart from that, you know, many things, you know, many anecdotes, a couple of few more I would mention um, connected with Trivandrum. One is, uh, he had a call uh, from uh, Dr. Sambashivan, who was then here as a neurosurgeon, uh, late uh, Sri Sambashivan, where there was an aneurysm, and they wanted uh, daddy to be involved in that. So um, he said, we don't have the equipment here. Can we shift to Nimhans? So then he said, no problem. I will come with the ambulance. And then because there was no ambulance facility here at that point, or it was not available. So he took the Nimhans ambulance and uh, went with the ambulance, with the driver. And then he picked the patient from Trivandrum. And uh, on the way back, he saw the ambulance driver sleeping, dozing off, because he was doing up and down. So he made him sit across and drove the ambulance for half of the distance with the patient to Nimhans, and went straight into the operation theater, operated the patient in continuation. And he couldn't clip the aneurysm. Those days, no clips were available. But he did the lasso technique and tried the neck of the aneurysm. And the patient did well. So that was his commitment to neurosurgery, where he didn't bother about these things. Another anecdote is, as uh, mentioned by uh, Dr. Ishwaran, the patient operated neurosciences. Neurosurgery was done only after 4 o'clock. Because the anesthetist continues to work in Victoria till 4, in doing general surgical work. And then he comes back. And those days, there was no uh, ventilator. It was the AMBU that they used while the surgery was going. And this is a huge meningioma, which he had started about at 6 p.m. And then uh, there was a lot of blood. And it was a Muslim patient. And there was a lot of blood, a lot of bleeding. And uh, the blood lab uh, bank called and said, we don't have any more blood. So we can't do anything. So the anesthetist is ambuing and saying, so what do you think, Dr. Varma, shall we just call it a day? He said, no, 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 wait, wait. He packed everything, descrubbed, went to his car, drove his car to Russell Market. Those days, it was a very famous uh, place. And he took the relatives and then said, this patient requires blood. Some people come. So he had a carload of people, nearly 15. Those days, it was a Buke car. Nearly about 15 people, he loaded in the car, bought them to Nimans, bled them, got anyone matching and then the blood was released. He came back and continued the surgery and was able to remove the meningioma. So these are small things that he used to keep telling. And then, uh, uh, you know, that was throughout my childhood. These were the stories I heard about what is happening. And so that's why um, I had this uh, you know, intense desire to become first him, and then secondly, it was neurosurgery. Now, it didn't, it didn't end there. My, all my children were very small, when, because he married late and I was born late. So they were little small, and he was retired, and he was, he was working in Maligay Medical Center, and he used to go for rounds. So my first son, he used to take and go in the car. He used to play with him, and on rounds, he used to take him around. So three of them, that is my two sons and my brother's daughter, all of them want to do neurosurgery. They all want to be like what he was. So it is passing on. That feeling, that passion just passes on from generation to generation. I think 
that is another thing that uh, you know he was able to impress people and impress any age to do what they think it is he never stopped from learning any surgery going on he used to up to the age of 90 he scrubbed for cases uh, i used to operate we used to operate sitting me or my assistant whoever it is he used to stand there scrubbed and then wait he used to stand never used to sit at the age of 90 and till the surgery is over, then he de-scrubbed and gone, went back. So up to the age of 90, he used to be there. And there was always somebody to you think, okay, now I think you can stop. Because we are avaricious surgeons. We want to try to remove. So he always used to say, operate the patient, not the tumor. So that was a dictum that we always remembered. And then uh, he used to take notes from interns and says, interns also teach us. So certain things, the interns used to say, He'll, thank you so much. This is a knowledge for me. And he used to make us, he used to have pads, which he used to write and then thank the intern for teaching him certain things. So I think um, I'm so happy and uh, privileged to be here. And uh, so we have decided, I think Dr. Ishwar and myself all had a talk, and we thought we'll do this annually. Um, every year, one teacher will be recognized, and the Outstanding Neurosurgical Teacher Award would be given. And I'm giving a small, um, uh, small amount of money that would help uh, them to conduct this annually. And uh, so that uh, throughout, um, however long the alumni lasts, which is lifelong, I'm sure, this sort of um, uh, CME with um, award to a great teacher would be given. And I'm so happy it is Professor Suresh Nair, who is the first recipient of this. And he has been instrumental in many of the things that I've been doing. His uh, nine o'clock rounds in the night, I still follow. I asked my residents to call me at 9 o'clock and find out about every patient. He knew everything about every patient. We always tell our residents, you should know something about every patient. And if you're in charge of a ward, you need to know everything about every patient. But Suresh Nair was not like that. Sir was, he knew everything about every patient. And things that we even look into the file and we can't find, he'll be knowing it as in mind. So that was a great uh, teacher and uh, uh, person who would inspire um, a neurosurgeon to be a neurosurgeon. Thank you so much, and I would wish um, that we continue with this. And um, I think I would probably give the director and Dr. Ishwan the first check um, of five lakhs to start with. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir, for that heart-filling speech. We are now moving on to the second leg of our inaugural ceremony. No man can reveal to you aught but that which already lies half asleep in the dawning of your knowledge. The teacher who walks in the shadow of the temple among his followers gives not of his wisdom, but rather of his faith and his lo lovingness. If he is indeed wise, he does not bid you enter the house of his wisdom, but rather leads you to the threshold of your own mind. These are views of the famous poet Khalil Gibran on teaching. It is our duty as disciples to honor our gurus, for we, take, for we took our baby steps in front of them and they taught us to fly high. This occasion is one such event, and we, the Sri Chitra family, is joined by the rest of the world to honor a visionary who made his name himself with dedication and commitment to neurosurgery, Professor Suresh Nair. May I kindly request Professor Suresh Nair and Dr. Vinita Nair, ma'am, to kindly take your seats on the dais.
May I now invite Professor Krishna Kumar, Department of Neurosurgery, ACT IMST, to introduce Professor Suresh Nair to the gathering. Over to you, sir. A very warm good morning to the dignitaries on the dais, off the dais, dear friends, colleagues. What is bestowed upon me is actually known to everyone. And like the speakers before me spoke, there is no question or there is no, uh, there is no second choice for this prestigious award. But let us uh, go through what this great man has given all of us, a teacher par excellence. Professor Suresh Nair, a distinguished faculty in the Department of Neurosurgery at Sri Chitra Tirunal Institute for 31 years. So, way back in 1952, Unni and Kannan were born. Unni continues to teach all his students all over the globe, while Kannan is giving quality medical care in another part of Kerala. They are so identical twins that all the occasions where we meet both of them, we get confused. <laughs> who is who? And even though uh, he, Professor Suresh Nair, belongs to a family from Mitrangur, that is Kotayam, most of his academic career is inbred with the development of this city, Tiruvananthapuram, where he had his schooling. In those days, there was no plus two. It was called pre-degree. And interesting to note that he a, has a vested interest in chemistry. He is a first class degree holder, bachelor degree, bachelor's degree holder in chemistry. Then he came to his alma mater, Government Medical College, Tiruvananthapuram, in the year 1972. And uh, after graduation, and we're coming to this pre formal training in neurosurgery, he did his MCH neurosurgery at the prestigious Government Rajaji Medical College in Madurai. So after his uh, medical graduation, I think two people influenced him a lot. One was his stint at the Medical Trust Hospital in Cochin, where one of the our beloved patrons of uh, Neurological Society of India, Kerala chapter, uh, he influenced Professor Suresh Nair a lot. And of course, the man in the picture, Dr. George Matthews, while as a registrar in neurosurgery, which I think uh, is a very strong influence on him as he relates how an autographed textbook was also gifted to him during that occasion. So after his training at Medical College, Rajaji Medical College in Madurai, Professor Nair joins back the department as an assistant professor and, and the, the strides go up and uh, the distinguished position of the dean also reaches him in 2013. In the academic ladder, as a professor of neurosurgery from March 1919, he headed the department from July 2006 till his superannuation in 2017. And the most em emphatic fact is the, the 101 not out. That is, 101 residents have been trained by him, and still, sir, is training most of us, most of the residents. That is a most remarkable achievement, I think, for unmatched by any neurosurgeon in this country. Did it stop there? No. He served as a professor consultant in the upcoming, in those days it was upcoming, the All India Institute of Medical Sciences in Bhopal in November 2018 and 15 months spent there 
our alumnus adesh would relate that every single aspect of setting up the department the operating rooms as well as according to adesh the mbbs graduates of the, the students of those days are now very strong in neurology why because sir used to take almost daily classes for him in clinical neurology and of course he could uh, start kick start the neurosurgery residency program in the all india institute very rare to see you sir in this white apron which we never used to see here <laughs> what about the academics outside the neurosurgical uh, teaching rooms in the hospital as mentioned by our beloved director professor sanjay bihari unopposed or nobody else uh, put in their papers for when he put his miss nomination as or elected unanimously as the president of the prestigious neurological society of india and at present professor suresh nair has been made president elect of the international meningioma society and he will take over as the president at the next international meningioma congress slated for september 2023 in jaipur and of course the secretary of wfns skull base societies this march till march 2022 doesn't stop there has been constantly interested in training the observers within the country and outside the country as you can see in the picture a gentleman standing behind him now he is a international figure in minimally invasive neurosurgery professor watanabe as a young watanabe he was had a stint in our department under professor nair for skull base surgeries and doesn't a uh, lot of them have come and gone and of course if you list the number of orations he has given all over the country uh, it is it, it won't it will become a very prolonged speech from my side so cutting short i am displaying the prominent ones of course the prestigious starting with the prestigious professor aram varma oration so professor nair is the most sought after orator in the country other than neurological society of india i think he has to his heart or his core the wfns if you see most of the committees of wfns along with his very dear friend professor b k mishra he has been spearheading medical neurosurgical education in all the corners of the world interacting with all the stalwarts and we were beneficiaries of it as very young residents who will have the fortune of having dr kawase dr lalingam shekhar dr chandranath sen dr hiratoshi sano yoko kato professor sano uh, professor kano to visit this institute 177 peer reviewed articles more than 350 papers delivered in the international meetings and look at the citation index h index and i10 index sir you are an outstanding personality and most of us have read the chapters he has read in textbooks and it is like you have to once you start reading it you have to finish it before putting the book down that kind of as a surgical guru yes he is a well accomplished surgeon in his fields of choice that is surgery for vestibular schwannomas and uh, vitreoclavial meningiomas trigeminal schwannomas and spinal intramedullary tumors as a family man and wife uh, vinitha ma'am was the medical director of the medical wing of vikram sara vai space center anirudh he is an ent surgeon dear sir actually you have taught us a lot i am not mentioning neurosurgery alone you have taught us how to interact with people you have taught how to interact with patients you have taught us how to keep time how to be on time and how to move about in the academic field staying focused and respecting work with that i end this sort of introduction i know it is not near complete but uh, thank you so much for this opportunity thank you sir 
now may I kindly request the dignitaries on the stage to join our honorable director to confer the Professor Aram Verma Distinguished Teacher Award on Professor Suresh Nair. I request the August crowd to give a well-deserved standing ovation during the award ceremony. The citation is, says Professor Nair is a passionate teacher who inspires his students to raise the bar of neurosurgical learning. His enlightening lessons have molded many neurosurgical leaders and shaped several skilled surgeons. Professor Nair's surgical teachings have saved li many lives and elevated the art and craft of neurosurgery. The neurosurgery department of Sri Tirunal Institute for Medical Science and Technology is grateful to Professor Nair for his role as a distinguished leader and inspiring mentor. Thank you very much, sir. May I now request Professor Suresh Nair, sir, to share his thoughts. Thank you, Krishna Kumar, for the kind words. A respected director of the institute, Professor Sanjay Bihari, Her Highness Puyam Tirinal Gauri Parvati Bai, Professor Ishwar, my friend, Dr. Ramakrishna Ishwaran, my old student, Dr. Revi Gobal Verma, Professor Keshavadas, Professor Manikandan, Professor Syam, and Professor George Vilanilam, and dear colleagues and friends. A sense of immense, indescribable happiness and fulfillment fills my heart on this special day. It's a wonderful and unforgettable honor that you have bestowed on me today, and my heart swells up with gratitude. 
I am truly thankful to each and every one of you, including all my medical college friends, all the nursing staff, everybody, and other department colleagues, Pooja Pera staff, who volunteered their time to be here today morning for this function. I am so honored and grateful to be the first recipient of Distinguished Neurosurgical Teacher Award, and I am humbled by the recognition you have conferred on me. I congratulate Professor Sanjay Bihari for instituting this award in the name of Professor Adam Verma, one of the legends of Indian neurosurgery, who was the first director of NIMHANS and who himself was instrumental in starting Sri Chitra Tirunal Medical Center along with Professor M.S. Veliathar in 1974, which later became SCT-IMST on 1st January of 1981, thanks to the blessings of Prarji Desai, the then Prime Minister of India. This was told by Professor Viliathan only. And this institute became a national institute because of the visionary of none other than Morarji Desai. When I joined the department way back in late 70s as a non-PG registrar and in the mid-80s as a young faculty, I had never imagined a day so special would come by, a day when I would be honored by an award instituted in memory of legendary neurosurgeon and prolific teacher, late Professor Aram Verma. I fondly remember many moments spent in the company of this kind, gentle, humble, and towering neurosurgical leader, Professor Martanda Verma. His childlike curiosity to solve neurosurgical mysteries continued to inspire me and many generations ahead. I will also quote some anecdotes about uh, Professor Aram Verma. Uh, because everything has been told by Revi and others. Uh, so in Nimhans, uh, say my friend was appearing for uh, MD in uh, psychiatry. In uh, that time, Professor Verma was the director of Nimhans. And you know, directors, they don't have, they just casually scan the application only. See, it so happened, this person's name is Philip John. He appeared for interview and he said, okay, go, go like that. So after he left, he just scanned at the application form and found that this particular fellow was first rank SSLC in Kerala state. So he called that fellow back and he reconducted interview and selected him. And he's a big psychiatrist in Cochin. His name is Philip John. And of course, Professor Varma sir was my, my technical expert when I appeared for professor's interview in this institute. I, I am so thankful to Sanjay Bihari, Ishwar, and now Revi Gopal Verma. Just now only I come to know. And the whole team who selected me for the award, considering my modest achievements and contribution as a teacher, and words cannot express my happiness. Even though I have received many accolades as a teacher from other institutes, this recognition as a teacher from SCT IMST holds a special place in my heart for bringing in a sense of reassurance that I have lived up to the ideals and values of this great institute. I gratefully acknowledge all the previous professors in various departments of SCT IMST who taught me that whatever one does become meaningful only when it is guided by love, compassion, and selfless service. This great institute, which has a legacy of caring and motivating teachers. I was lucky to have been motivated during my MBBS days by stalwart teachers like Professor Krishna Das, Professor Sambasivan, Professor Matthew Roy, and my medicine chief, Professor Edwin Rose, to name a few. And during my neurosurgery residency days by my then Professor, Professor Nadarajan, and none other than another fellow, my DM resident that time, Dr. Chandra, who later became professor of neurology at Nimhans, Bangalore. After joining Chitra in mid-80s, so many astute teachers, including not only all the previous directors during my time, Professor Viliathan, Professor Mohandas, Professor K. Radhakrishnan, Professor Jagan Mohan Taragan, and Dr. Asha Kishore, but also neurosurgery professors, Dr. George Matthews, Dr. Raut, Dr. Bhattacharya, many neurologists, Dr. P. K. Mohan, Dr. Sarada, Dr. M.D. Nair, neuroradiologist Dr. V.R.K. Rao, Dr. Sandosh Joseph, Dr. A.K. Gupta, pathologist Dr. V.V. Radhakrishnan, Dr. Chandrasekhar Karta, 
anesthetist Dr. Patmanabha here, and many of you sitting here. I am seeing Keshavadas, Bijoy, Mani Gandan, all of them have taught me, Shailaja. Everybody has taught me, even many of my residents have taught me. But one person who really motivated me to be a good teacher is Dr. Madhusudanan, who was professor of neurology at Kottayam, and I have to admit that even now I learn from him. More, more importantly, I am so much indebted to my former neurosurgery colleagues, Basant Misra, Dilip Panikar, Bhaskar Ravu, Ravi Mohan Ravu, Girish Menon, Rajanish Kachara, Matthew Abraham, and to all of you sitting here. I will be failing in my duty if I don't acknowledge Professor George Villanilam for helping me with innumerable speeches, Dr. Prakash Nair for my presentations, and both Dr. Girish Menon and Dr. Adesh Srivastava for my publications. I have to thank three persons who between them had assisted me for more than 1,000 CP angle surgeries. Dr. Vigas Vade, who is professor now at Nimhans, Dr. Gobalagishan, who was a faculty with us now in Abu Dhabi, and Dr. Jayanan Sudhir is sitting in front of you, his editor professor here. And to Dr. Ishwar for his empathy, showing exemplary interpersonal relationship with patients and their relatives, and of course, to dear Krishna Omar for everything. And if I have to give a message to the young faces sitting here, it is to learn to work hard, to learn to dream high, and to learn to believe in one's power of making that dream come true. Neurosurgery is not just one-time learning and lifelong earning. Most of what you have learned will be outdated in 10 to 15 years' time. One should see continued research for knowledge, and we should see criticism, admit mistakes, and modify educational behavior accordingly. I am remembered of a term metacognition, which means understanding one's own gaps in knowledge that is accompanied by a desire and ability to fill these gaps. In other words, knowing what you don't know. Satchel Page, who was an athlete, a philosopher, once quoted, it is not what you don't know that hurts you, it is what you know that just ain't so. We need to look inwardly to we need to look inward to honestly assess what we do not know. We should not craft clinical solutions and derive conclusions that are based on inadequate and biased evidences. In the words of William Osler, father of modern medicine, quote, we must avoid lying to ourselves. We should learn from our doubtful cases and mistakes. There should not be any self-deception and we should not shrink away from truth." Unquote. According to German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche, the most common lie is lying to oneself. Lying to others is an exception. There should not be any disconnect between our recommendations and our beliefs. Sometime back in a national surgeon's meeting, a surgeon presented a clinical case to his colleagues. Using an audience response system, he asked the surgeons in the audience, whether they would recommend an operation which he has described for the case presented. About 80% favored that surgery. He then rephrased the question. This time he asked whether the surgeons themselves would undergo the same operation if the case represented is their own illness. 80% said no. So there was a disturbing disconnect between surgeons' recommendation and true surgeons' belief. One should be honest, particularly with oneself. We must always ask ourselves the question, how would I want to get treated if I am in patient's position? I am always reminded of a quote from the book of Leviticus, dated 1400 BC, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. On the eve of my superannuation in June 2017, I remembered with great pride the splendid achievements of each of the 100 plus residents who trained during my time. Today, six years ahead, as they have risen to greater heights, I feel even more proud. I remember, I also remember Dr. Gulsar Gupta, one of my favorite residents who passed away due to an aneurysmal bleed a few years back when he was at the peak of his neurosurgical career. I thank all of you, all the Chitra people, alumni, who have supported his family during the difficult days. My dear sisters, so many of my sisters, I, I, if I start 
telling their name, there won't be any end. I am seeing everybody. And Elizabeth all is staring at me, Prema, John, everybody. And uh, uh, so I am so happy that from the, my dear sisters and friends from the nursing staff, they are so much a part of my triumphs and tribulations. They strained every nerve to make sure that our patients did well and survived the long hospital stays. I can never, ever thank them enough. They shared my pain, though I may not have shared many successes enough with them. Many of them have told after assisting me, I, we don't want to assist you again. And uh, after that, uh, C.D. Elizabeth, Prema, John, they all used to come and sit near me with blotted face. And then the, the times were like that. But really, you know, if I shout my wife like that, I'll be out of the house. <laughs> but these poor people, they uh, listen to all nonsenses from our end when we had some problem in the theater. Many memorable days and patients come to my mind on this special day. There were those turbulent days when things didn't go well despite our best efforts. Yet there were other days when we felt triumphant, having vanquished neurosurgical ailments and transformed lives. As I look ahead, I can see all my fellow faculty and residents soaring high and reaching greater altitudes. May the God Almighty bless you all with abundant success and help you to mitigate the sufferings of many. I am grateful to each and every one of you, my wife Vinita and son Anirudh, who have been part of my long and exciting journey. My wife also joins me in expressing our deep sense of gratitude to each and every one of you and your love and friendship. Thank you all. Thank you, sir, for that very enlightening speech of yours. <clears throat> May I now invite Professor Keshav Das, Deputy Director and former HOD, Department of IS and IR of Sri Chitra, to kindly address the gathering. Respected uh, Suresh Nair, sir senior teachers in the audience, and my dear friends. First of all, a big thanks to the neurosurgery department for giving this honor to my teacher. Though I am a radiologist, I consider him as my teacher also. When I was a junior resident in Trivandrum Medical College, those days we used to come to uh, Sri Chitra. The main things that we noted in Sri Chitra was the manpower here, where at the top you had professors, whether it is neurosurgery, radiology, or any other specialties, you had uh, really top uh, people as the faculty members. You had the technology, which was the best. The CT was already there when the medical college did not have a CT scan. The MR machine was there. And all the facilities were there, and the teachers were ready to teach us uh, neuroradiology. So we used to come here. But the most interesting thing those days was the interdisciplinary meetings. And these meetings happened on Saturday mornings. And uh, this is still continuing. The Saturday mornings, when we used to come, it was Professor Raut, Professor Mishra, Dr. Suresh Nair, all uh, would be there. They will be asking questions. And it was verbal thrashing of the, uh, the neu neurosurgery residents and neurology residents which was going on there. And it was at that time I always thought that it was good that I did not take neurosurgery or any other surgical specialty. Because they were asking questions, and these residents were really trembling in front of them. But after Dr. Uh, uh, Mishraji and uh, Rautsar left, then things were better. We, uh, by that time, I had become a senior resident here. And when we used to go for this meeting, the, the interdisciplinary meetings were just not the meetings where uh, Sir used to teach us a lot of radiology, but it was also full of fun. He used to crack jokes in between, and we always uh, felt extremely light. And the most interesting thing, and this I have to tell, as a senior resident, I had just joined Sri Chitra, and uh, the cases were kept. And uh, once uh, the discussion was over, 
he always looked back at me or Bijoy or somebody there sitting there and was, what, what is your opinion on this MR? Now, we knew that he knew better than us. Neuroradiology, he knew better than us any day. But still, he always used to ask us, what is your opinion? And then he would ask us whether, do you think that this is so-and-so, can it be so-and-so a tumor? So then it ra uh, raised a point that every case we used to read before we used to come. So he not only helped us to improve ourselves in neuroradiology skills, he later on also asked just about the spectroscopic findings or uh, say the diffusion, perfusion imaging findings, which he knew extremely well. So Sir has taught us a lot actually, and I'm sure that many of the uh, neuroradiology residents who were posted in uh, neurosurgery and who have attended these meetings, and even now many of the radiology residents from medical college come here to learn neuroradiology in those sessions because of the legacy that has been set by uh, the uh, neurosurgery and neurology teachers who were here. And of course, my teachers like uh, Sir, Santosh sir is here, who have all been so helpful in making uh, the department, the neuroradiology department, as you know, the DM neuroradiology could be started in Sri Chitra as the first center where uh, neuroradiology started in the country because of the good support of the neuro, uh, neurosurgery and the neurology departments here. Sir, I am thankful for all the help that you have given me all these years and to the neuroradiology fraternity. And I uh, thank the neurosurgery uh, for honoring such a great man. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. May I now call upon Professor Manikantan, Associate Dean and Head, Division of uh, Neuroanesthesia, Chief Chitra, to kindly address the gathering. Good afternoon to all. Respected director, uh, uh, dignitaries on the dais, and my dear colleagues and uh, uh, beloved sisters, my re residents, and for good morning, good afternoon, sir. Uh, especially special thanks to Dr. Suresh Nair, sir, because uh, it is from the bottom of the heart uh, I am just telling these words. So I joined this uh, ancient. I started uh, immediately after finishing my MD anesthesia. I wanted to. I have special passionate about uh, neuro neurology at my MBBS days. So when this advertisement for uh, training in neuro anesthesia came first time at uh, Nimhans. 1998, I just joined there and, uh, as a first thing. I have, uh, from 1998, I have been uh, the passionate neuroanesthesiologist till now. It's almost like more than 25 years over. So I have been seeing many different surgeons as uh, consultants, as of junior trainees, as various residents. I have seen all the residents and their different walks of life. So we spend a lot of time, uh, we share the good times and bad times, like Suresh Nair sir already told, we have seen a lot of good and bad times inside the OT. So we know that uh, we have to be very stubborn, uh, taking all the uh, what are whims and fancies of surgeons, then only ultimate goal for both of us is to be the patient care. So I have learned a lot. He has been considered as a great teacher. Everybody has told from the, for the residents, it's a great teacher. Being an anesthesiologist, looking in the other side of the curtain, so he's been very thorough in each and every step. Not only that, he will be always in the back of mind watching what we are doing. Hardly, uh, very few uh, surgeons will notice what is the blood pressure and all those things. But sir knows each and every step what step the blood pressure will change. So he'll be looking behind whether we are all attentive or not. So immediately he will alert us. So he will just tell, we learn a lot during the surgical time. So uh, uh, not only that, one of the most uh, amazing thing I used to tell him also, he's basically a skull-based surgeon. Basically he does a lot of CP angle tumor, but he's, he will go to the other OTs. And then if he will be watching other surgeons who are operating, as I told he will be doing, but he will be telling to us next structure which is going to the surgeon, next uh, structure which is going to come. So he will know where the bleeding comes, what are the important structures the surgeon, junior surgeon is doing it. So I used to always ask him, sir, how do you know all these things? You are not uh, day in and day out operating. You are only focused on CP angle. But he told, uh, neuro neurosurgeon should know each and every aspect of anatomy, physiology, and everything. 
Every time before any MCH exam is there, he will ask what are the anesthesia points which he will uh, learn. Immediately, the uh, residents, neurosurgeon resident will come to know, sir has asked me what are the anesthesia questions. They will ask me, sir, what are the things you told him that he will ask in the exam? Same questions he will be asking. So they will come, <laughs> immediately they will come to know, sir has asked me questions, what are the latest about anesthesia? So this, that's why he makes people to understand things. He's not like one-way teaching. He makes people to go there, look for the answers in the books. It's not only, not only for him. When uh, the dip, uh, dip, uh, division, new division was started in 2010, I learned particularly a lot of things uh, interacting with him because I had more responsibility. Till 10 years, I was uh, there were HODs who were taking care of everything. Once I uh, became a little more senior, I had more responsibility, more involvement in the patient. I also should, uh, uh, and I understood that I should also step in the shoes of the surgeon. Then whatever his mind reading, till uh, 2005 and all, he was a mystery for me. So he will be doing, he will be telling me to do that one. Then I came to know that what he wants, what is the background in which he is approaching the patients. So I could, nowadays I am able to feel what the surgeon wants, how I could step in the sh shoes of the surgeon before they, uh, I am 10 steps ahead of uh, all of them. So I am telling my uh, junior colleagues also, my residents also, you should think like a surgeon, not like anesthesiologist. So if you know that what they need, you can easily know, you can prevent all the complications or whatever uh, 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 thing. So till now the OTs are running smoothly. We are doing everything very smoothly. And not only that, sir, because I have been, after the SIRS uh, super animation, I have worked with Dr. Matthew, Dr. Ishwar. Whatever sir was the, the same legacy is continuing. The teaching is 100 times improved, much better. Not like I'm not telling, because they had carried out all the legacy. They have used all the modern uh, techniques which uh, our director sir was uh, describing. Same thing, uh, one more thing uh, I would like to tell his, when uh, uh, Suresh Nair sir was the dean, he was very uh, aggressive in this uh, internal evaluation. He was very particular that all the evaluation should be uniform and smooth. He was one of the main pioneers, uh, along with Dr. Asha Kishar Madam, to bring out the Board of Study documents and the student evaluation forms. And uh, as the director has pointed out, he has uh, done most of the things. Now, uh, uh, now we have the integrated PhD program, uh, thanks to director. I think uh, you were mentioning about subspeciality training. So it is a very great opportunity for all the residents. During the MCH program, all has to be uniform training. That's what probably NMC is doing. Beyond that also, our institute is giving opportunity in the form of integrated PhD. They can, at the junior level, they can have a subspeciality program. Again, sir was telling about the feedback of training. From this year onwards, we have actually implemented. Every six months, the resident will tell what are the training, whether the, what are the lacuna, and what are those things. So these are the legacies which has actually, beyond being a teacher, Dr. Suresh Nayasar has started this. The curriculum of whole institute, he has uh, shaped up the uh, curriculum of the whole institute. And uh, uh, I still feel that, you uh, know, even uh, the uh, two days before he was super animating, he did a major uh, uh, CP angle tumor. I was the anesthesiologist. I, at the end of the day, you will see his uh, legs will be swollen, and then uh, it will be because he'll be standing for nearly uh, six, seven hours. He never used to sit or never used to take any break during this entire surgery. That was his commitment. That is the legacy which he has uh, left in this institute. And I am sure your legacy is not wasted, sir. Every one of your students is carrying across all over the country and internationally. I had a great opportunity to work with you. Thank you, sir. And uh, I thank Dr. Ishwar for uh, giving me this opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. May I now call upon Professor Shamke from the Department of uh, De Movement Disorders, Department of Neuromedicine, to kindly address the gathering. Honorable Director, uh, Professor Sanjay Bihari, sir. Uh, Her Highness, Puyam Tirinal Gauri Parvati Bai. Beloved Professor Suresh Nair, sir. Professor Rivi Gopal Varma. Uh, Dr. Ramakrish uh, Ramakrishnan Ishwaran, Dr. Ishwar. Uh, all other uh, senior faculty members here. All other dignitaries of the dais. I consider this as a matter of great privilege to be here today, representing the Neurology Department on this occasion commemorating Professor Aram Verma, who had the role of a mentor and guiding light 
when our neurosurgery department was in its infancy and its childhood. I am all the more happy as this is an occasion to show our respect and love to our beloved teacher, Professor Suresh Nair, sir. I consider sir not only as an ideal guru in neurosurgery, with all his punctuality, clarity of ideas, excellent com communication skills, and success for teaching and mentoring, but also as an ideal human being. Sir, Suresh Nair sir was always a formidable figure for all of us, even uh, our residents or faculty, whoever. But I have also seen his human side. I have seen sir and um, uh, heard sir fluently recollecting all the names of all the neurology alumni all these years, year-wise. Uh, uh, he is able to remember each person ex clearly, each person, uh, the features of each person, characteristics, where he is working, how is he is working. And I am sure none of the neurology faculty will be able to do that, including me. So, uh, sir, sir was always a formidable figure, but I have also seen his uh, human side. I have seen him weeping like a child on the day of his retirement in front of all the staff here in the Swasti Hall when the staff were giving him a farewell. And most of the staff also, when hundreds of people assembled there, they were also weeping. I saw tears in the corners of most of, most of their eyes. So that is the human side of uh, Suresh Nair, sir. That is like, uh, uh, so that, is, that shows the, his bonding to the institute. Uh, and now uh, it is a pleasure to see the neurosurgery department of ACTMST nurtured benevolently by doyens like Dr. Routh, uh, um, Professor Bhattacharya, Professor Suresh Nair, Professor Matthew, and now Professor Ishwar, flourishing like anything. Uh, and uh, the neuro Department of Neurology owes a lot to the Neurosurgery Department. The comprehensive care programs of our Neurology Department, be it comprehensive epilepsy program, the stroke program, the movement disorders program, many of which were the first of their kind in India, would not have been possible uh, without the wholehearted support of Neurosurgery Department. And it is commendable to note that all the heads of the department and faculty of Neurosurgery have been continuing this tradition of wholehearted support enabling us to take the comprehensive programs of neurology to new heights. I also understand that a neurosurgery nursing manual is being released today, which is a need of the hour. I, on behalf of the uh, Department of Neurology, wish all the success for this program, the nursing manual, and the upcoming CME in the afternoon. Thank you all. Thank you, sir. We now move on to the final part of the opening ceremony. Sri Chitra is not only a beacon of hope for the patients that we cater to. We lead by example and shoulders the responsibility of upbringing our nation along with others who believe in the same. The result of such a character is the initiative taken up by the nursing officers of our neurosurgery operating room to bring forward information that will help form the foundation of successfully running a dedicated operating room in neurosurgery. We fall short of words to describe the rich curation of insightful information that they have brought forward to the world by their unrelenting efforts. May I now request our beloved Laila, my sister, to speak a few words about the Neurosurgical Nursing Manual. Respected Director, Dr. Sanjay Bihari, sir. Um, head of Neurosurgery, Dr. Ishwar, sir. Head of Nursing Service, Nirpala, madam. And our favorite, uh, Suresh Nair, sir. Distinguished dignitaries, faculty members, seniors, residents, my fellow nursing and other staff. Good morning to all. Today, I stand before you to express my gratitude and appreciation for the incredible teamwork and dedication that went into the development of our operating, operating room procedure manual. When I first proposed this idea to my nursing team and discussed it with our esteemed HOD, Dr. Ishwar Sar, I was pleasantly surprised by their unwavering support and encouragement, which motivated me to push forward. We commenced work on this project in mid of April, and within a relatively short period of one and a half months, we have su successfully completed this endeavor. This achievement was only made possible 
due to the exceptional team spirit and hard work exhibited by the nursing, surgery, and anesthesia, anesthesia team. Despite the demanding schedule and busy duties, they all managed to find extra time to contribute to this manual. I am especially great, grateful to our HOD, Dr. Ishwar, for taking the initiative to synchronize the surgical team and describe multiple operating procedures. I firmly believe that this manual will serve as an in, invaluable source of information for all the personnel working in our operating room, especially the nursing staff, enabling them to provide safe and high quality care to our surgical patients. Furthermore, it will be a valuable resource for future generation seeking to work in the neuro operating room. I would like to take this opportunity to express my sincere gratitude to each and everyone who made valuable contribution to the formulation of this manual. I extend my heartfelt appreciation to our Honorable Director, Dr. Sanjay B. Harisar, for sparing his valuable time to write an introduction to this humble work. I must express my deep thanks to our HOD, Dr. Ishwar and his team, as well as the anesthesia team, for their tremendous support and cooperation. I feel proud of my nursing, nursing team for taking such an initiative to prepare this manual. I also wish to extend my gratitude to Nursing Superintendent Nirmala Madam, Assistant Nursing Superintendent Ms. Anasuya Madam, and Lecturer in Nursing Suja Raj Madam for their support and guidance. Thank you once again to all the stakeholders of this manual. Thank you. May I now request the dignitaries on stage to join our Honorable Director for the official release of the Manual of Neurosurgical Operating Room, A Nursing Perspective. May I kindly request uh, Ms. Shani, Senior Nursing Officer, Neurosurgery ICU, SCT IMST, to felicitate the efforts of her nursing staff in bringing forward this book. Honorable Director, Respected issue, sir, <coughs> Professor Suresh Nair, sir, all the dignitaries from other esteemed uh, institutions, my colleagues, seniors, my dear friends, greetings from Nursing Service Department. I feel honored and humbled to stand before you on the occasion of honoring and felicitating Professor Suresh Nair, sir, with Professor R.M. Vama Memorial Outstanding Neurosurgical Teacher Award. Working in neurosurgery is quite challenging for nurses because nursing care demands for each patient is very high. The nursing care hour for each patient may be around four to six hours per shift. The nurses has to have critical care skill as well as an empathetic heart to address the basic nursing care need for their patient. I salute all the nurses currently working and previously been part of this department for their hard work in making patients physically and physiologically stable. On this occasion, I would like to congratulate Dr. Isho for going to complete successfully his term as a head of neurosurgery. With his guidance, we could organize some events to keep the morale of our staff lifted. It is commendable that he is very much keen in being attentive to all the categories of staff and encourage and motivate them with a smile or a wish, which will make their day 
I thank him for inviting us all and making us part of these academic events to feel as a sense of being part of a larger healthcare mission. This time, I congratulate Professor Suresh Nayar sir for receiving the right and deserving honor from his previous students. The neurosurgery OT team rightly deserves applause for their effort in releasing the neurosurgery OT manual, <laughs> which may be the first of its kind, at least around the part of our world. I wish this manual acts as a patient safety guideline during perioperative period in the operating theater. The neurosurgery ICU team is also preparing a nursing manual incorporating the nursing care implications for patients with various neurosurgical conditions. With this, let me conclude my words. Thank you all. Wish you a very good day ahead. Thank you. Thank you. May I now uh, request Professor Ishwar HV, head of the department, to hand over the mementos uh, for the dignitaries on the stage for, for their participation. To Dr. Ram Krishnan Ishwaran, sir. Dr. Ravi Gopal Verma. One to our Honorable Director, Sanjeev Bihari, sir. May I now invite Professor George C. Villanilam, Department of Neurosurgery, SCT IMST, for delivering the word of thanks. Uh, dear teachers and my dear friends, uh, word of thanks is something that we all look forward to very excitedly because it's the last hurdle to clear before uh, Sumter's lunch. Uh, most of you uh, skeptically would ask why we really need this uh, formality. But uh, even though we are from the same family and extended family, a word of thanks, if rightfully placed, is perhaps irreplaceable. Uh, let me begin by very, very profusely thanking uh, our very dear teacher, Professor Suresh Nair, sir, and Vinita, madam. Uh, we very fondly still remember sir's early morning rounds abound with a lot of neurosurgical tidbits, words of wisdom, buzzer round quiz questions, uh, cricket and Wimbledon trivia. Thank you very much, sir, for helping us relive those moments after six years once again today. Uh, thank you very much, Vinita, madam, for being that uh, guiding light and force behind, sir. And uh, I know many of us here, when we have moments of despair and dejection, uh, we actually reach out to madam first, uh, and madam has always offered a shoulder to weep on to all of us. Uh, thank you, ma uh, madam, for being there for all of us. Uh, I also would like to thank uh, our dear director, uh, Professor Sanjay Bihari, sir, for being uh, you know, for very brilliantly doing that balancing act between uh, academic neurosurgery and running the administration so well. Uh, sir, tireless efforts have inspired us to raise the bar in almost everything, not just neurosurgery, in academics, research, publications, everything. Uh, we are also very, very grateful to our beloved neurosurgery chief, uh, Professor Ishwar, who has been the heart and soul of this uh, very special day. His uh, painstaking efforts... Uh, has brought all of us together uh, on this special day and uh, helped us honor and realize the, uh, the countless and matchless contributions of uh, Suresh Nair, sir. Uh, from the half suit that all of us are wearing here today to the radiant uh, Ganesha uh, that was the plaque awarded to uh, Suresh Nair, sir, every minute detail has been looked in so brilliantly conceived by Professor Ishwa. Thank you very much, sir, for all of that. Uh, I'd also like to express my deepest sense of gratitude to uh, uh, Her Highness uh, Poem Tirunal Gauri Parvati Bhai, uh, Madam, for uh, expressing uh, so brilliantly uh, some of the personal touches from the lives of uh, Professor Aram Varma. Many of our residents, I can see their hearts beaming with pride, and now they have absolutely uh, no doubts on having selected uh, Sri Chitra Tirunal Institute for doing the MCH course. Thank you very much, Madam. Uh, the legacy of uh, late Professor R.M. Varma has been very aptly carried forward by uh, Sir's son, Professor Ravi Gopal Varma, who is very dear to each and every one of us here. Uh, I'm sure a father couldn't have been more proud uh, of his son. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for helping us conceive this award for your very invaluable contribution and for guiding and supporting us all through. Thank you very much, sir. 
we also very profusely thank uh, professor ramkrishnan ishwaran sir we all very fondly remember his brilliant clinical notes uh, and records that he has maintained over so many years over four or five decades of his clinical practice thank you sir for uh, those wonderful words of wisdom that you have shared with us for those fine moments from professor arun verma's life and uh, for those wonderful reminiscences and most importantly sir for uh, also teaching us so much about syringomyelia yesterday you know that uh, we thought we knew so much about but there were so many deep and dark corners of the syringe that we never knew nothing about thank you very much uh, i also would like to profusely thank uh, all our uh, senior retired faculty members from the other department prof sunni sir uh, many other our fellow faculty from uh, the bmt wing uh, i am very scared to take names because i might miss out someone and uh, all our friends from trivandrum medical college the hod professor rajman sir and all the fellow faculty from trivandrum medical college and other uh, sister institutes and the corporate hospitals of trivandrum Uh, I also would like to thank many of our alumni who are here, Dr. Uh, Anudat, uh, Dr. Jinendra, uh, Dr. Avinash uh, Haridas, and many others who have sp- uh, chosen to spend their precious Saturday morning uh, with us. And uh, though we are all uh, family, I would still uh, would like to also thank uh, Professor VVR VV Radha Krishnan sir, who just uh, left us, who was there right from the beginning, Professor Santosh Joseph sir. uh i would fail in my duty if i uh, do not thank my fellow faculty members professor krishna kumar for that uh, wonderful introduction of suresh nair sir and for being uh, a man of few words but a man of full of action uh, both uh, from the neurosurgical perspective as well as as an administrator uh, being the uh, the medic- the assistant medical superintendent i would also like to thank rupa madam for uh, the, the unstinted support to the neurosurgery department as medical superintendent uh, i would also uh, like to thank uh, all our senior uh, scientists and many of our uh, retired faculty from the bmt wing who are with us here today my fellow faculty members uh, dr jayanand who is an expert in anastomosis also brought us all together to run this program dr prakash uh, who is known for his extended endoscopic approaches has stretched that extra mile both in running this program as well dr ganesh who is an expert in spine surgery has also been the spine of this program by his by leading us as a treasurer handling the financial matters dr gautam who uh, f- you know who did the little uh, who screwed the last bits of nuts and bolts to get this going uh, i would personally thank all our uh, post doctoral fellows uh, dr srinath and dr darshan the master of ceremonies here uh, uh, srinath and uh, dr Su- uh, uh, dr suraj gopal and each and every one of our residents especially so because many of them whom you don't see here have been working behind the scenes running the holding the fort in our neurosurgery wards and icu as we uh, spend these moments together a special word of thanks to uh, sam akhilesh uh, lokesh bhushan suraj Uh, pooja who got these uh, these men's wear stitch for us uh, vamshi uh, ashutosh ram nirup sagar ankush uh, and arvin uh, i also would like to profusely thank uh, the team who run this who helped us run this team sprazo uh, led by shaji and his team the audio visual team liji and viji may i also uh, thank uh, professor uh, sham uh, maniandan sir and keshada sir for those very warm words of felicitation which took us back to some of the earliest teaching days under uh, suresh nair sir and uh, just like every neurosurgical procedure votes of thanks also carry an element of risk a risk that you could have missed out despite all your attempts missed out thanking someone and if there is someone out there whom i have not thanked enough uh, the nursing fraternity who have released this uh, wonderful manual today uh, sister shani and team uh, sister lailama and team uh, i would like to uh, thank you profusely as well and if there's anybody out there whom i have missed uh, please accept my humblest uh, apologies and i am sure that poetic justice will be done to you in other ways uh, and perhaps it wouldn't be wrong to end my vote of thanks by thanking myself for rendering this vote of thanks thank you very much Thank you sir. The nation we call ours is gifted by the selfless efforts of our freedom fighters and visionaries from the past. 
they still pave the way for us to be a better human, better society, and a better country. In the spirit of 75 years of independence and celebration of Asadi Ka Amrit Mahotsa, we dedicate this educational venture to those who laid down their lives for our freedom. May I kindly request the gathering to rise for the national anthem. With this, we come to the conclusion of our opening ceremony. Lunch will be served at the first floor of Swasti Hall to the right of this auditorium. I wish everyone bon appetit. We start the CME program in uh, half an hour's time and I kindly request all of you gathered here to to gather back at the auditorium in half an hour for the enlightening CME program that we have curated for you. Senior Consultant Neurosurgeon at Lissy Hospital, Kochi. Dear friends, uh, it's a great time to uh, be in a CME session here. After long, after a gap of almost 10 months, I find it a very pleasant experience standing here. But without wasting much time, let me start my topic. A surgery for thalamic tumors. If you see, the, the trend is to see each of the uh, structures in the brain as a single entity. This is exactly the issue when it comes to dealing with the thalamic tumor. The thalamus is not a single entity. If you look at the brainstem, you will say the brainstem is a single entity. You may talk of the putamen as a putaminal bleed or a putamen as a single entity. But each region of the thalamus has an independent uh, pattern and its approach has to be different. Now, if you see, I'll uh, go to the basics of the basic principles of operating on thalamic lesions. Only lesions of the pulvinar, my slide changer is not working. Slide changer has stopped working. I would like to go that side. Okay, that's fine. The only lesions of the pulvinar, the geniculate bodies, the medial and anterior thalamus, and perhaps this region, that is the LP and the LD, the lateral posterior and lateral dorsal, nuclei are really operable. The rest of the region, that is the entire lateral thalamus, ventral anterior, ventral lateral, ventral intermediate, ventral postromedial, ventral postrolateral are all difficult zones to access and they present with bad deficits and perhaps can be considered as uh, inoperable lesions. Along with that, all along the lateral surface of the thalamus, you have the reticular nucleus. 
And deep within the interior, you have the internal medullary lamina, which are uh, closely associated with arousal and consciousness, and hence cannot be breached. So you have to decide which zone of the thalamus you should attack or you should enter. You can't uh, approach a, a, a pulvinar lesion from anterior. You have to uh, decide your trajectory because you can't traverse the internal medullary lamina or the reticular nucleus or any zone into another. So the zone should be directly in front of you. And no dissection, needless to say, should not cross any of the, the, the fine blood supply to the thalamus, that is the, the PCA. You cannot go perpendicular. No approach can be perpendicular for any sustained amount of time uh, or extent to the perforators from the PCA. And thalamic lesions are not ideal for a second look surgery. So go for it in one go. They tend to, uh, the anatomy gets um, um, altered when you go for a reapproach. So the basic principle is you should access the region of the thalamus through a suitable trajectory without traversing any other region of the thalamus. You should, under no circumstance, cross the internal medullary lamina or the lateral reticular nucleus. This is my personal series, 268 lateral ventricular tumors, of which the diencephalonic lesions are 237. Thalamic lesions is 124. This statistic is taken in uh, 2020. The, if you see, uh, I have classified them into posterior thalamus, medial thalamus, inferior thalamus, and lateral thalamus. This covers almost all the regions which can be actually operated through decompression or excision. The posterior thalamus, if you see, that's a significantly large number, which means it is much more amenable for surgery. That is the, the pulvinar lesions and or the posterior aspect of the thalamus which, which bulges into the, uh, the lateral ventricle. Then you have the medial thalamus, which gives a convenient border against the third ventricle and against the a good part of the lateral ventricle. And the inferior thalamus, that is the lesions of the uh, lateral geniculate body, those which are in close association with the optic tract, and they form on the inferior inferolateral aspect of the thalamus, and the lateral thalamus, that is the uh, lesions on the lateral. If you see, the number of lesions tackled is very little, six, which means those are not lesions which are readily operable. Um, there are much more than that, but uh, this, uh, because of limitations of time, um, it's difficult to go into the details of each. I will just show you the approach towards going for each of these lesions. You, uh, I would like to remind that when you approach each lesion, you cannot just see it from a uh, radiological uh, or a structural point of view. You have to see a functional point of view. If you're having a dense deficit, that means the lateral thalamus is already involved. If the sensorium is involved, the reticular nucleus or the whole entire thalamic function has been affected. Mm -hmm. Or on the medial surface, if you do not have any deficits, it's likely to be one of the less eloquent zones. The thalamus has multiple uh, uh, functions. You can, it, it can act as a, uh, a receiving nodule, as a, as a reception point, or it can act as an association point, or it can uh, act in uh, connection with uh, th the cortical regions to stimulate them. So the, uh, those regions which are acting as uh, uh, receiving um, uh, sensory information, if you, if, you, if you remove them, that means that sensory function is fully gone. It is these, those association nuclei of the thalamus which are more readily operable. And they, are, they always have a copy at a cortical level. So this is the approach towards the pulvinar lesion. You can see it is projecting posteriorly and almost out of the thalamus. This is perhaps the easiest of the thalamic lesions to operate. The axis here, this patient has actually presented with uh, some degree of mild hemiparesis, but it was quite mild, no significant pyramidal signs, mainly with mass effect obstructive hydrocephalus. This is actually exactly the same as an inferior parietal lo lobule approach. I have entered the, the ventricle and directly entering the thalamus. Here you are not interfering with any other blood supply, you are going from above. Only thing you have to achieve is 
uh, good hemostasis and ensure that you don't cross any other zone through this thalamus. One fortunate thing about pulvinar lesions is that a significant number of them are low-grade lesions and many of them are pilocytic astrocytomas. Accusa is invaluable. With careful adjustment, actually, the Cusa can be used for all intraaxial dissections. So we have actually almost removed the whole thalamus. Hemostasis is only when you have removed significant amount of tumor will hemostasis come. A lack of hemostasis in evidence that they have a significant residual tumor. Minimum essential surgery cell. An EVD must. Lifesaver. So this is a post-operative scan. You can see almost no tumor can be seen. The, this is because this tumor was bulging into the ventricle from the surface of the thalamus, from the posterior surface of the thalamus. You get a clean resection most of the time. Um, this is actually an inferior parietal lobule approach. I will show a second type of pulvinar tumor. Here, the, although it is on the surface, it is invading into the thalamic body. It may be extending a little beyond the pulvinar, maybe into the lateral posterior uh, nucleus or the lateral dorsal nuclei also. This is uh, actually a, a girl uh, who presented with difficulty in reading and writing, a, the loss of prosody of uh, reading along with mild hemiparesis and ICP features. She was a brilliant student, but uh, in school, they, they suddenly noticed that she's unable to write, read. She, she can understand the words. Uh, she can write it slowly, but the flow of language was gone. This was a presentation that she had. So this is a post-operative scan. You can see, unlike the last one, we have invaded into the thalamus, but still, again, it's on the posterior aspect. This is a post-op patient. She sent me down this video with the permission to show it. She has no mortar deficit. She had subtle hemiparesis before preoperative. Pre Many of you may remember this patient. She is uh, from Tamil Nadu, a very brilliant girl. She find that, found that her uh, handwriting has improved. And uh, she can write uh, in a flowing manner. The idea of an unfriendly had been briefing among the people, but... The prosody also returned. So this is a medial thalamic tumor. I have a personal experience of around 28. They are a product. This approach is actually, from my point of view, a product of my hypothalamic hematoma approach where I went interfornicial uh, and could deep, go in deep into the third ventricle through that route. Um, they are reasonably common lesions. And usually the deficits will be more of memory behavior uh, rather than pyramidal tract or motor or sensory involvement. Here I'm going for a midline approach. The thalamus, the uh, corpus callosum is exposed. We're making a corpus callosal opening. If we found the interceptal plane and then utilizing the interceptal plane to find out the interfornicial plane, you can see the, the telia choroidae appearing the two internal cerebral veins, splitting them in the middle. And the lesion is exposed. Again, a uh, significant number of the, uh, the midline lesions may be low-grade lesions. But sometimes you may have a very low-grade uh, a lesion which appears like low-grade during surgery 
to be a high grade one. Here your goal should also be to release the entire uh, third ventricle so that there will not be any obstructive hydrocephalus along with tumor removal. And EVD, uh, needless to say, is a must and a life-saving thing. This is a post-operative scan. You can see the lesion has been removed and uh, some degree of hydrocephalus is there which, will, which we expect to gradually resolve. This is another lesion which is rounded large one uh, which also has been removed in a similar manner. This is a very interesting scenario. You see them a little infrequently. It looks like a very nasty lesion. It involves the lateral aspect of the thalamus, the inferior lateral aspect of the thalamus, almost to the going to the capsule if you see. The most of the capsule seems to be uh, deflected. You can see that the, uh, the pedangle seems to be involved. This patient had presented with hemiparesis basically along with on careful examination there was some degree of hemianopia. Uh, no other deficit, hemiparesis, little with a small dystonic component and hemianopia. Here there is actually if you see the, the route of approach towards this lesion is um, pretty difficult. You can't come from the surface. However, there is a corridor which I must admit it again came as part of my uh, epilepsy approaches where you can open the sylvia and dissect the anterior choroidal and between the anterior choroidal and the PCOM perforators there is a corridor where this lesion presents. You can dissect the anterior choroidal artery to its entry into the choroid fissure after opening the sylvia in detail and uh, then medial to that where the PCOM perforator centers. The, 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 this thing has been opened, sylvian has been opened elaborately and the anterior choroidal can be seen here. You can see the anterior choroidal and the lesion started to present itself at that spot. So because the anterior choroidal is dissected and used as a landmark, I have put it as a transchoroidal. I have just termed it as a transchoroidal approach. This again these, what is the structure that can come at the base, inferolateral? It's usually a pilocytic astrocytoma arising from the optic tract and invading the uh, lateral geniculate body secondarily. All the, we have, I've operated on around eight of these lesions. Almost all of them have been pilocytic astrocytomas, although they look nasty. So this lesion seems to have come out as a whole. It's, it's, I've, I think I have forgotten to demonstrate the, the intact anterior choroid after the resection. This is a post-operative scan. You can see the lesion seems to have come out. This patient had NF1. So this is a post-operative picture, six weeks post-op. She had a significant hemiplegia, hemiparesis, could walk only with strong help before surgery. Her pyramidal tract has recovered in the form of an intact pincer. That is me talking over phone behind her. <laughs> so this is another patient. She was a, a seven-year-old kid. kid daughter of uh, two nurses, uh, two staff nurses, who came with hemiplegia and a um, uh, little bit of behavioral problems. If you see, you have find a large lesion which seems to be right on the capsule, cutting into the capsule or into the thalamus. It's difficult, only with clinical examination you really can say where this lesion comes. From pure radiology, it is difficult to say. Predominantly seems to be capsular, but on examination the patient also had a hemianopia. With a presumpt, with a, a diagnosis, this must be arising from the infralateral predominantly. 
that the same approach was used. This lesion was so large that the brain was so full and when you entered uh, after some decompression, the, rest of the, the, the tumor could, would not further drop in. So this is the first, after the first surgery through the transylvian, like exactly it's the same route. We have decompressed it significantly, but you can see there is a significant residual tumor. This patient was reapproached approximately one year later, the same size tumor, but it had dropped down. You can see an arachnoid cap that is uh, some form of a fluid cap that has started to arise on the surface. Now we reapproached it, and this is the excision. You can see there is only a small puncture hole like thing on the capsule. The patient remained intact. And this is her seven years after diagnosis. No, no evidence of any form of pyramidal involvement now. So this is the lateral thalamic lesion. And this is the last of the uh, lesions which I'd like to show last of the approaches. It is located on the lateral aspect, just posterior to the capsule the internal capsule or through the sublentiform or the lateral lentiform capsule seems to be covering it. This, uh, here I am going to approach it from the posteriormost part of the insula. This approach has already been published by Dr. R.C. Misra, uh, but actually he has done it for a, uh, for a putaminal lesion. But it's almost at that, so posteriorly, a thalamic as well as a putaminal lesion can be approached. A putaminal will not cross the retroendiform capsule, while a thalamic lesion will cross the retroendiform capsule. So here the sylvian is being opened. A radical sylvian opening, or you can actually go for a posterior limited posterior sylvian opening, which is actually technically a uh, little more difficult and maybe image guidance controlled, but you may not be able to expand. But for a lesion like a cavernoma, a limited posterior sylvian opening may be enough. So you are reaching the sylvian point. This is the angular artery. Maybe we are entering the posterior. You can use an image guidance. Image guidance may actually increase your confidence. You can use landmarks on the surface of the temporal operculum, like the Haschel's gyrus to reach there. The cavernoma, once you reach a cavernoma, it's a fairly easy lesion, which is not usually very vascular. There are clear landmarks. The staining is a good landmark. This patient had actually presented with a little bit of dystonic features and some memory dysfunction. It's post the patient improved. Now, to summarize, the regarding thalamic tumors, the anterior thalamus is associated with the limbic system. An anterior interhemispheric approach may be useful or a, a transventricular pro uh, process approach. On the medial surface, a transcalosal interfornicial approach would be ideal. The lateral thalamus or the somatosensory nuclei, mostly not operable. On the posterior aspect that is in the retrolentiform, uh, I mean on the posterior aspect of the lateral uh, uh, thalamus, you can go for a transsylvian approach. The posterior thalamus is perhaps the easiest one. The pulvinar region, a trigonal approach if it's in the dominant side, a superior parietal lobular approach on the non-dominant side, an inferior parietal lobular approach. And those inferior, that is, 
those arising in the lateral geniculate body or the inferior aspect of the thalamus. You can go for a terional, subfrontal, a transcortical or a transchoroidal approach. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay. Now I invite uh, Dr. B.G. Bahulain, Senior Neurosurgeon, Medical Trust Hospital, Cochin, to deliver his talk on the usefulness of intraoperative neuronavigation guided diffusion tensor imaging in resection of epileptic and brain lesions. Respected uh, teachers, uh, Dr. Suresh Nair. Dr. Sanjay Bihari, uh, Dr. Dilipanika, uh, other distinguished uh, people available, uh, my dear friends. I'll be talking to you about, in the next few minutes, I'll be talking to you about the usefulness of intraoperative neuronavigation guided diffusion tensor imaging in resecting epileptic and brain lesion. It's a very small topic, mm, and uh, before that, I would like to I think my presentation would be incomplete if, uh, if I won't talk about few, uh, talk few words about my experience in this uh, department. For those of you who do not know me, I'm, uh, I trained in uh, CMC Bellur and then I joined in, uh, in, this in this institution in 2007 as a fellow and then I joined as a faculty. And uh, I would say those uh, two years uh, I was here was one of the wonderful uh, times in my uh, entire career because I learned a lot uh, neuroanatomy, surgical, uh, uh, surgical neuro neurology, and many, uh, how to handle the brain, the, 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 the wonderful area of epilepsy surgery, the opportunity that was given to me by Dr. Suresh Nair and his team. And I, I was trained by Matthew, uh, for the wonderful talk that you have heard now. There's no doubt that he's an excellent surgeon. And uh, also by Dr. Girish Menon. Uh, Dr. Ravi Mohan Rao, and uh, and also the presence of my uh, great friends uh, Ishwar, KK, and uh, other people. Where it was a wonderful experience that two years that I had here. So I'll, uh, this is a small topic. I'll just uh, quickly go through that. So tractography is nothing uh, new to us. This has been there uh, in the field of neurosurgery for the last two to three decades, and I'm not going to go through all these things. And uh, so this is this is what we had when uh, about two to three uh, decades back. This is the picture that we used to get on our neuro navigation machine and also uh, on MRI image, Im images. So the blue was vertical, green anteroposterior and red, right left, and this is a coding. And I, I I'm sure all of you would agree if I say that uh, if you have a tumor located here and the displacement of these uh, color coded tracks would never give us a clear cut idea of where these minor tracks are and also uh, in some cases the major tracks identification of major tracks would also be difficult if you have such a picture in front of you but now uh, the uh, software uh, the diffusion sensor imaging and navigation software has advanced uh, significantly that enable us to de delineate each of these tracks so that we can uh, uh, we can identify them while resecting this epileptic and brain lesions so uh, the uh, limitations of tractography is this crossing fibers and the brain edema around the lesion that uh, cut off so many of these tracks that are available that won't be uh, available there that won't be available for us to uh, study while uh, before uh, excising these lesions or approaching these lesions. So the, uh, the uh, navigation software, these people have come out with a... Uh, a, a principle called constraint spherical deconvolution. So uh, this is a new algorithm. I don't know the finer detail, technical aspect of it, but what it does is it it avoids all these uh, disadvantages that was there in the previous one. And this is the image of uh, of, of an old uh, DT. Uh, can I have a spot? 
So this is the old old DTI where uh, the there is a lot of edema and crossing fibers, and the old DTI gave only this many number of fibers. And now this CSD has given in a numeral number of about four to five times the number of fibers that we can identify with the help of CSD when compared to the old uh, old one. So this is an excellent tool that's available. So this is the uh, this is the CSD. Uh, the, the number of fibers CST gives, and this is the less number of fibers that is available in the old uh, old MRI. So I'll just uh, show some of the cases that I did with this uh, with this, and uh, I'll show you uh, how I approach these lesions and uh, how I was able to uh, resect some of these tumors with uh, less deficits. This is a, this is a young uh, uh, engi a software engineer who came to us with seizures. This I operated with Dr. Rajesh Shaya, who was in who is an epileptologist in Kovey Medical Center. And uh, so this, uh, this is a case of focal cortical dysplasia. This is a mantle sign that you can see here. Uh, everyone knows that this is a focal cortical dysplasia. And so then uh, again, this is a coronal image showing the mantle sign going up to the ventricle. And we all know that the corticospinal tract is the tract that we are worried about in this case. Of course, there are other fibers like arcuate fasciculus. And since it's on the right side, we don't have to be worried about that. In fewer, uh, 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 th there are other uh, 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 inferior longitudinal fasciculus, all these fibers, tracks are there, but corticospinal tract is that we have to focus on. That's, this lady was a software engineer, she was good looking, she was very energetic, and she was very particular that even if I continue to have seizures, I do not want any deficits. So, uh, so then, uh, so this is, this is the uh, corticospinal tract that we identified just deep to that. And then uh, we went ahead with the uh, stealth uh, navigation, uh, and this is the uh, small incision that we made and we did an intraoperative ultrasound. An excellent uh, ultrasound machine is, 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 is really helpful for us to resect these lesions, and the involvement of neuroradiologists in the theater was really helpful. And this is the lesion that we can see. And uh, then we did, uh, we did all measures to make sure that she, we have a safe resection. We did it with awake uh, brain surgery, and, uh, and this is the electrocorticogram that we did, and we identified that this was the lesion, and this, this is the electrode that gave us uh, spikes, and these two did not show spikes. They, they had only conducted spikes. So we knew that this was the lesion, and went deep to that, and uh, we used, again, phase reversal to make sure that we identified the motor tract, mm, uh, the central sulcus, uh, the sensory and motor tracts, and then this is the end of resection. We got a good resection. We had intraoperative uh, uh, this thing, uh, awake monitoring, and she did not have any deficits post-operatively, and uh, she's, uh, she had no deficits. We are tapering, a process of tapering the anti-epileptic medications, no more seizures, neuropsychological assessment was intact, and uh, she's continuing to work as a software engineer. So next is a, a lesion posterior uh, to the uh, central sulcus. So this is, this is a lesion that we did uh, two weeks back, and uh, this, is, uh, this lesion was here, and to be very frank, I was not sure whether this lesion was arising from the motor cortex, sensory cortex, or the parietal, uh, parietal lobe. So we, the, this is the uh, motor cortex on the opposite side, so we did not know what it was. So the, uh, the major, the, again, a young lady who was uh, in the third trimester, and uh, we identified when she came to us with intractable seizures, and then we took her up for, uh, she continued her pregnancy with anti-epileptic medications. Dr. Ashalada was there, and with her support, we uh, uh, got her to complete, uh, to uh, have a normal delivery, and then we took her up for surgery. So uh, our idea was to uh, leave her without any deficits, and we did not know what it was, and we had to take uh, take the lesions. So what we did uh, did is we uh, we identified uh, we our 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 plan was to identify all the descending fibers surrounding the lesion, so especially the anterior aspect of the lesion. So we we marked this, we got it as region of interest one, and then we went to the crust and got it as region of interest two, in, uh, region of interest two, and we got all the fibers that are ventral to that, and uh, this is what we did. So, uh, so this is the, uh, uh, the navigation just before surgery. These red fibers are the descending fibers. We don't know what it was, whether it's a sensory or motor fibers. We marked everything that, that came anterior to that. And our, our idea was to make sure that these fibers are not involved or not uh, transgressed while resecting this tumor. So we again use a phase reversal there and, uh, and then uh, so this is, uh, the, the, you can very clearly see that this is the abnormal brain here, and this is where, where the central sulcus was, and this is a sensory cortex. So this is an anterior parietal uh, lesion, 
and this is a sensory cortex and, and motor cortex. And we, it was a, a, a beautiful soft tumor to take out. We used QSAR to take it out. And we were very careful anteriorly. This is the anterior border. We were very uh, uh, careful here to make sure that we did not uh, transgress those descending fibers. And uh, we were aggressive on the posterior aspect. And uh, during the process, what we did was we used the uh, uh, tracker to make sure that we did not go anteriorly. So in, t in between, uh, you can see that I'll be, so this is a tracker that we are using to make sure that we do not, uh, we, we do not go anterior to the corticospinal tract fibers. We, we are very careful in that as, uh, when we are reaching that area, we got awake monitoring and we got her to move her hands and legs during this process and we got the whole thing out at the end of it. So this is the uh, this is the, this is what we did when uh, this when the tracker was used during surgery. You can see the tracker is at the depth of the lesion, and we are close to the uh, just posterior antero inferior border of the lesion. And this is where the tip was, and this is the corticospinal tract and the sensory tract. The, the, those red fibers includes both motor and sensory fibers. So this is a very difficult uh, to delineate tumor uh, radiologically before surgery, where you don't know where the sensory tract, motor tract, or the thing. This is the most difficult tumor in this region where we have difficulty in uh, identifying, or we have to be very careful, or, or else we'll have uh, a contralateral hemi, uh, hemiplegia, in fact. So posterior contralateral disconnection, this is again uh, uh, a very difficult procedure for epilepsy surgeon, especially for the for the beginners for experienced people this is this just a walk in the park but for beginners and also at uh, for me it is uh, i am really worried about whether i would go and cut the corticospinal tract during the during the ventral ventral disconnection so the, i you, uh, usually do the same uh, same process so what i do is i identify the lesion here we the, this uh, this lesion here in the in the anterior uh, parietal uh, parietal region i the yellow color is a sensory tract red is the uh, uh, the motor tract and what i do is to keep it safe I, I i'm not worried about the superficial part of it where we can identify the central sulcus with the help of uh, uh, with the help of phase reversal but posterior to that what i do is i put a evd uh, tube here so that i i put it parallel to the uh, parallel to the uh, sensory tract and also ventral to the uh, to this lesion and i make sure that i stay within it because the problem is when we go down when there is CSF uh, loss and when there is brain shift, there is a chance that you can go, uh, your, your uh, resection can go anteriorly and there is a chance that you can uh, develop weakness on the, on the contralateral sides because you may cut the sensory and motor fibers. In fact, this lady, despite doing this, she had mild weakness of her uh, lower limbs for one or two days after surgery and then she recovered. So uh, next I'll uh, uh, talk to you about uh, some of the cranial, uh, how uh, cranial nerves can be delineated with this. So this is a uh, case of uh, pediatric uh, case of vestibular schwannoma. It's a very rare presentation. A 13-year-old girl with right CP angle syndrome with raised ICP. It's a large uh, uh, preoperative uh, scan showing a huge tumor. She was in her 12th standard and the only uh, thing that she wanted was to have an intact facial nerve. It's quite reasonable because uh, she is going to curse us for the rest of her life if she give her a seventh palsy. So, so this, is, uh, this is what we have. So what we did is we uh, did a DTI and you can see that we are moving from inferior to superior. This green color is the, uh, is the seventh nerve. And you can see that it is going anterior superiorly, uh, one of the commonest sites of displacement of the seventh nerve. And it's going superiorly, and uh, then uh, it is gracing the superior surface of the, of the tumor and going, uh, going medially. So this is the uh, this is a coronal uh, image uh, of a, sh a video showing the showing the seventh nerve. This green colored is the seventh uh, nerve that's going superiorly along the along the tumor to the to the brainstem to the root and tree zone. So 
So uh, we did a rotomaster craniotomy uh, for this case. We got a near total excision. I never attempted to take it out completely because there are recent studies showing that partial excision with preservation of the seventh nerve and subsequent radiation therapy, uh, serotachic radio surgery would be ideal in these cases. And uh, did with a seventh nerve monitoring, made sure that the uh, the we found that there is a concordance between what we saw. Uh, in the preoperative DTI versus what we saw during surgery. It was in the anterior superior surface of the tumor. The uh, facial nerve uh, identification was uh, really helpful in this case. She did not have uh, any uh, uh, facial palsy after that, no deficits. Uh, she was sent for radio surgery for residue. This is a six months uh, follow up after radio surgery. And uh, she, the, uh, she had a small residual tumor and still uh, with us for follow up. So um, basically, uh, just wanted to uh, send uh, home the message that it will be nice to have this uh, DTI uh, software also along with our navigation machine. The navigation machine is available everywhere. And uh, I use S8 navigation software. It's a very uh, useful tool, and it's uh, by Medtronic. And uh, previously in uh, Lissy Hospital, I, uh, we bought, about, uh, bought it about five years back, and it was a very difficult software to use to generate these tracks, about 25 steps it used to take. Now, now the recent one that I bought in uh, Medical Trust, it's very easy. It's like a four or five step process, and uh, you can easily uh, uh, get these tracks. And I think uh, probably we all should start using it. Uh, from what I know, it costs about 25 lakhs additional to what uh, that what you uh, to what people buy. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Now I call upon Dr. Dilip Panikkar, sir, for his talk on functional preservation in hemispheric tumors. Thank you. First of all, I must say I'm happy to be back here, back home, where it all started. And, uh, you know, while we are just getting things loaded, I think uh, one of the people who's responsible for me standing here is sitting right here. <laughs> uh, I've, I've known Suresh for the last 30 plus, 35 years now. Yeah, 35 years. And uh, I've seen him evolve from the very young junior consultant that he was when I joined neurosurgery in 1987 to the very uh, mature person, the very mature and self-confident person that he is now. And and really, but one thing hasn't changed about him is his passion for knowledge. I remember in, in those days, uh, I don't remember whether it was in one of my years as a trainee or when I came back as a faculty here, my short stint, I worked as a faculty. When uh, Suresh once told me that he gets up at 4 a.m. in the morning and every day reads something new, every day. And that has stayed with me every time. One of the, uh, there was a, uh, one of the Saturday evening, uh, Saturday afternoon seminars that uh, we had gone for lunch together. We, we went in the canteen for lunch and after lunch he just grabbed out of man and said, come, let's go to the library. I want to read, this is, a, this is a topic that's new to me. So I want to read something about this before I go sit in the seminar so that I understand what he's talking about half an hour, picked up a couple of books in the library, quickly read through it, and he's as knowledgeable as the person who was presenting the seminar. Some things remain with you. Uh, of course, what also remains with you is the fact that he can quote the test scores of probably every single test match 
right from time immemorial and the wimbledon winners first runner up second runner up all through from i think uh, 19 uh, <laughs> and you ask him about i'm i don't know whether age has dulled this ability but you ask him about an article he'll tell you the journal the page number the author and which institution it came from off hand without referring to it that man never ceases to amaze me but is but has been wonderful suresh and i can't think of a of among the many honors that you have got i think what you got today was probably extremely satisfying to see one of our own being honored by this institution i think it's absolutely fantastic suresh hats off to you uh okay it's a very mundane talk you have heard two absolutely spectacular talks before me very technical very knowledgeable very intricate talks i'm going to be grazing the surface a little bit because this is a probably a very huge topic so please bear with me while i graze the subject as we are well aware functional impairment in hemispheric tumors i'm talking of intraaxial tumors not extraaxial and hemispheric tumors not the diencephalic tumors or the stem tumors functional impairment can come in many ways through the entire course of the illness it can come from the tumor by either a direct involvement which can result in a deficit or it can be indirect as a result of raised intracranial pressure or hydrocephalus or some kind of a distortion or herniation or, or something of that sort the treatment itself can cause additional functional deficits it's not always necessary that the treatment has to make somebody better though we hope for it the treatment can also induce additional deficits which we have to be very cognizant about very aware about the surgery the radiation therapy and the chemotherapy can all have their own deleterious effects upon the patient in this day and age when we are talking about the functional outcomes for everything this becomes very important because at some point you had a tumor it was probably preservation of life or as long as a person gets out of the theater alive and uh, stays alive in whatever shape he or she is it was acceptable to the family but in this day no people are talking about we now talk about the quality of life about the return to work return to livelihood and the ability to return to activities of daily living which is absolutely important in this day and age so what can we do as surgeons to when we encounter these to uh, to minimize the functional deficits or to uh, accelerate the process of recovery of functional recovery or, or, or preserve the patient functionally as far as we can some very important things assessment of baseline deficits which i think is absolutely important you need to understand what the tumor is doing to the patient how the tumor is not only what the imaging shows but but how it is affecting the the person in all ways not only in terms of function but in terms of of uh, how it has changed their life or their activity the actual treatment process you have to take great care to prevent treatment related functional derangements and along with that the third arm is rehabilitation which is absolutely important and can be a game changer when you have uh, many of these issues so when we talk of a baseline deficits a detailed pre or pre surgical assessment across all domains is very important a detailed understanding of the quality how the quality of life is affected how the how the functional uh how the how the uh, tumor or the lesion is affecting the person functionally understand the quality of life and coupled with this is a detailed pre surgical counseling 
for those who are uh, who follow literature very closely and and you do for in particular he talks of what is called an a la carte approach to tumors do for as you know is uh, has a very extensive experience in the surgery of gliomas and he talks of what is called a a la carte approach where you allow the patient to decide the extent of what is acceptable to them and what is not there may be people who want functional preservation at all costs which means you do it at the expense of maybe limiting the surgery there may be people who want the tumor out at all costs even to the point of accepting functional deficits so as you plan as you get into therapy as you as you begin your process your treatment process it is important to understand what the patient actually wants or expects from the treatment process what is also interesting is this concept of pre treatment rehabilitation and retraining especially with uh, lesions in and around the motor tracts and the uh, and the and the periholandic lesions you can begin a process of pre surgical uh, rehabilitation that will help or accelerate the process of what we call the brain plasticity the ability of the brain to reorganize itself to minimize its deficits to minimize the deficits that are consequent upon a lesion or an or a surgical procedure so when we talk of the extent of surgery we now know without any doubt that the extent of excision is is a very important determinant of outcome for all hemispheric intraaxial lesions the greater the extent of excision ideally a gross total excision correlates with an improved survival or a progression free survival across all grades of tumors it's not only the low grade tumors but even the higher grade tumors but increasing the extent of excision comes at what cost the disruption of functional tissue or the collateral damage which the procedure might cost so this leads to to a debate do you practice safe surgery where you limit the amount of excision of a tumor to achieve a functional a good functional outcome but at the cost of a potential leaving the patient with viable tumor that will almost certainly progress and can transform into higher grades if it is a low grade neoplasm so there is this need to be to have a very balanced approach where you maintain aggression your surgery has to be radical but at the same time you take all measures during surgery to protect your patient dr bg has shown us in the in the previous talk about uh, the excellent tools that are now available to understand the fiber tracks within the brain the what is now uh, termed the connectome the mass of white matter tracts which is invisible to the naked eye but in reality connects all the cortical areas and the and with the uh, uh, and uh, provides all the major inflows and outflows to the brain the least amount of disturbance to the connectome is what we hope for so what tools do we have as uh, 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 you had seen uh, uh, all the tools that are used the dti and the tools that are used to process the dti there are now excellent tools available that can show you the fiber tracts and as you see the fiber tracts these fiber tracts are can either be invaded or displaced by the tumor as you see and you trace the fiber tracts you also begin to create a surgical plan where you decide your approach to the lesion in a way 
through a corridor that disrupts the least amount of fibers. And this is something that is very important to understand. Sometimes a very straightforward, what seems to be a straightforward approach may not be the right one in terms of protecting the fiber tracts. But sometimes you might need to use, like for a deep-seated lesion that is more medial in the hemisphere, you might need to select a, maybe a contralateral approach through the medial uh, uh, side of the hemisphere so that you minimize the disturbance of the tracts that are displaced laterally, the SLF and the arcuate. And uh, they, they may all be, dis be displaced laterally. You take a lateral approach, you can end up disrupting all those tracts. So it is important to understand this kind of anatomy to plan your approach. And this is your first step towards minimizing the intra, the, uh, uh, an, an intraoperative event or a collateral damage that uh, your uh, uh, surgery can do. The other thing is once you understand the anatomy and plan your approach, as you get into the lesion, you use all the tools at your disposal to protect the patient functionally. And one of the most important tools is an intraoperative electrophysiological assessment, which shows you, which can identify these tracts functionally, many of these tracts functionally, and can help you protect them. The techniques for intraoperative in electrophysiology are very well described. Uh, these are the two most common uh, ways of uh, the two most common techniques, uh, central sulcus phase reversal that for the central sulcus identification, probably the most basic of these maneuvers, and a direct cortical stimulation and mapping, both cortical and subcortical, that will help you identify the fibers. And uh, you use either a monopolar or a bipolar stimulation, depending upon what function you are trying to elicit. Uh, uh, language functions are better uh, assessed with a, with a bipolar stimulation. For the motor functions, we, gen we traditionally use a monopolar stimulation. The threshold of stimulus also gives you an idea as to how far away from the functioning tracts you are. There are also things what are called tract finders which have been described that can, where you can use it to, to go subcortically and to identify how far away from your cavity walls are your functional fibers. Uh, Dr. Biji described a very interesting technique, what is, uh, what is called the fence post technique for the resection of gliomas, where you put, catheter, where you put ventricular catheters around the periphery of the tumor that helps you put a fence post around this that tells you not only where the margins are, but also where the depth is. What can also be done is you can replace one of the fence posts with a depth electrode, which you can also use to simultaneously stimulate while you're working on the tumor. So all these are techniques that you can use to maintain, to, uh, to ensure that the patient has functional integrity while you're removing the tumor. But this is possible only in motor tracts. When you talk of other areas like the language, your uh, next debate is asleep or awake. Then you go on to the realm of awake craniotomy, of, of awake surgery, where you can assess, apart from the motor functions, you assess language. Now, these are all the functions that can be assessed as a standard. And, and uh, these are the standard paradigms that are used, and language, motor, and apart from these are other, other lot of uh, cortical functions and lobar functions that you can also assess using all these techniques. Now, as you get more practice in awake craniotomies, as your assessment becomes better, you begin to push the margins and you can assess more and more functions. So these are some of the, uh, these are some images from, uh, from awake surgery that show a variety of functions being assessed and, and monitored. This is probably fairly straightforward and standard, nothing new about this. Now, when we talk of the eloquent area of the brain, I'm sure this is a word that is, uh, that is very commonly used, uh, eloquence. Traditionally, eloquence has been, the, the term eloquence has been confined to the language the areas, the motor and sensory areas, and the and visual and auditory cortices. But The concept of eloquence has changed and continues to change. 
And at this point, we now recognize that there are a whole lot of functions in the brain that are not necessarily confined to these simple functions that we call eloquent. Every part of the brain is considered eloquence and should be addressed in the, with the same degree of uh, concern as you do to the perirolandic areas or the brocas or the, or, or the superior temporal gyrus or so on and so forth, or the visual cortex. The functions that are not evident but are important for daily functioning, the executive functions, the visuospatial uh, functions, the social cognition, these are important for a person to lead a normal life for reintegration into society, for reintegration into their normal life. Otherwise, they become a different person altogether. You can take out a, a frontal lobe tumor, perfectly cure the person, but if he's left with no, social, no emotional component, no, no social uh, 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 graces, he's a different person altogether. His family will disown him. They'll say, no, he's, he's not the same person. You have done something to him. You have cured him of the disease, but, you have, but it's a different person. These are very, very important. And there are ways by which you can use, uh, by, uh, by using awake surgery now, it is possible to assess a lot of these functions in terms of uh, visuospatial coordination, cognition, memory, uh, uh, emotional uh, issues, uh, emotional factors. They can all be assessed during awake surgery. The, as part of a preoperative assessment, a preoperative cognitive assessment, all these are tested. But what is more difficult is how do you translate these tests into something that you can use in the theater. But there are tests, these are described, and they can be used. But you need a trained assessor to be able to, uh, 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 to give the tests and to, and to interpret them. So, when we do an awake craniotomy, the general sequence of, uh, of assessment that we do is the baseline cognitive function. We start off with the baseline cognitive functions. As it said, attention, registration, comprehension, language, and memory. Then we go in sequence to so the language assessment, the motor assessment, then the, then the non-language assessment, that is facial recognition, social cognition, working memory, executive functions, all these can be tested and they're all tested in, in, in the sequence. The next set of tests are adapted based upon what the preoperative deficits were. And this is why the pre-surgical assessment is important. You need to understand your patient before surgery. And once you do that, you can tailor the, the intraoperative assessment to the kind of deficits that they had before the procedure. And the third set of assessments depend on the tracts that are in proximity to the tumor or involved by the tumor that you predict based upon your preoperative imaging, your tractography and your preoperative imaging. So, uh, like I said, many of these are straightforward and standard to administer, but some of the more uh, complex cognitive tasks will need a trained assessor to be able to administer and interpret the tasks. Once you finish the surgery, the adjuvant therapy itself can induce further deficits. With radiation therapy, uh, especially that is a well-known issue, especially the, where, the, where the radiation fields are larger, the whole brain, the brain radiation, they do induce a lot of cognitive uh, damage to the patient and there's a cognitive decline. So how do you address this by using limited radiation fields and by using techniques like hippocampal sparing, which can help protect a certain memory and cognitive functions as far as possible. Also, the ask the question, is radiation absolutely necessary? Now, in a higher grade lesion, now in a grade four tumor, there is no doubt that radiation is absolutely necessary. Or in an astrocytic tumor, is radiation absolutely necessary? But how about a grade, how about an anaplastic oligo? There are studies that tell you that treating the patient upfront with just chemotherapy alone does not change the overall survival. It just, the progression-free survival changes. That's better when you administer radiation. But radiation given at the time of progression does not change the overall survival. So, that, so, so we need to ask a question, is radiation absolutely necessary? Can you get away without radiation? 
and in, which can potentially induce a cognitive decline. In the same way, chemotherapy, though it is much better tolerated, can also induce uh, a, a functional decline, but that's largely because of systemic problems from the chemotherapy. When you use more targeted chemotherapy, the tolerance is better. The third arm is rehabilitation. Like I said, you begin rehabilitation, this concept of beginning rehabilitation, even pre-treatment, you begin uh, in, in a tumor that is in proximity to your language areas, you can begin speech therapy even before you get your patient into treatment. In a peri rolandic tumor, you begin uh, physical therapy even before you get your patient into treatment. The recovery, the rehabilitation, the post-surgical reha recovery and rehabilitation is much better in that. In the same way, like you do physical and language rehabilitation, you can also do cognitive rehabilitation. So there are a lot of cognitive functions where your psychologist can work on the patient and put them through an extensive cognitive retraining program that can help uh, improve uh, skills that are deficient or impaired and uh, help them to get them uh, reintegrated into society. So to conclude, uh, maintenance or restoration of functions or co and, and the quality of life is a very important goal in this day and age. Early identification of performance status and uh, management depending on the uh, existing deficits and the predicted deficits. Use all efforts to minimize the deficits by using tools that are available at your disposal and early rehabilitation in all domains will certainly help. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for that talk. Uh, now we have some of the some of our well-wishers who couldn't make it today to convey their messages on a Zoom link for us. It was a lovely uh, talk we gave. In fact, I took some pictures also. The message he has given, <coughs> you know, see you have various types of intrinsic tumors, you know, between oligo and astro, he made a pertinent point. So oligos, they respond. They respond well to chemo and radiation. He made it a point that we should give both chemo and radio at the same time. And not that one radiation at the time of recurrence, not like that. But the point which I have, which you should know is, uh, say you can leave a little bit of oligo if you think it is in eloquent area. Uh, but for astro, it is not like that. Astros, they don't respond that well to chemo or radiation like oligo. So it is of paramount importance. You should try to take it out, maximum possible. Uh, whatever he has told, using all those gadgets. Am I correct? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think the, I think oligo as uh, as uh, uh, the biology of an oligodendroglioma is different from an astro, and the behavior is different. So as you understand these, you understand that astrocytoma is more resistant, and you have to be more aggressive with an astrocytoma. With an oligo, you have a leeway. Even an anaplastic oligo does respond. Like I said, there are publications that tell you that you don't need to irradiate all anaplastic. Uh, uh, oligos because the because they survive irrespective they are better tumors We use a touch screen and there's, a, and there's an assessment battery that you use. So, in fact, I didn't show some of those images, but uh, you can assess, I mean, memory and all become standard assessment, but you can check attention, you can check, uh, uh, there is something called reading the mind in the eye. 
So you show them pictures, ask them to identify emotions. You, uh, you, you tell them a small, uh, ask them to interpret a fable or a, or a uh, phrase or a, or a proverb. You ask them for word association. There's something called sheritory. That's a word association. You give them a set of words and then you ask them to create a set of words. So, so that way you, you, you are assessing networks that are important for cognition. See, but unlike motor and uh, all this, where, where you stimulate, you get a response. See, that is not clearly defined. What happens when you stimulate? Because some of these tests also take time. It's not a, it, it's not a spot test. So, but you get, you get an idea of the overall performance of a patient. Then the moment you begin to see a decline, you know you're interfering with, you're starting to interfere with those functions. Can I start? Hello. 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 Am I audible? Yeah, you're audible. Can I start? Is Professor Suresh Nair there? Good afternoon, sir. It's so good to see you receiving this award. I know that you are one of the most dedicated, sincere, and knowledgeable teachers ever there was. And uh, I know the students have benefited immensely from your uh, rounds and teaching sessions. But uh, what I certainly do know is I benefited more from you than uh, they would have benefited as you are my teacher in surgeries too. So thank you so much, sir, for a very richly deserved award. Hello. Yeah. Yes, Ravi. Am I audible? Ravi, hello. Yeah, now we can... Uh, yeah, yeah. Ravi, you know, thanks, Ravi, for the kind words, you know. I still remember we used to sit together, open the books, sit in my room, yeah. read the anatomy. <laughs> The whole day, whole evening day. before we go for surgery next day. Really, you know, I benefited through you, maximum. All skull-based procedures. You taught me. You taught me, Ravi. And no, and that's the other way around. Thanks, Thanks Ravi. Dilip is here. That is yeah. also like to yeah, yeah. Uh, say congratulations to you. Yeah, hey, I'm, I'm here. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Ravi. Good afternoon, sir. Hey, good afternoon, Dilip. How are you? Yeah. I'm fine, sir. Congratulations, sir. Thank I you. I still Thank remember you. Uh, my interview for the exam, entrance exam. Really? What Thanks is... for selecting me and then uh, teaching me for the next four years. Thanks. Thanks. So Thanks, Unfortunately, Dilip. I couldn't be with you for a longer time. Thank you. You have all surpassed your teachers. You are a big man now. As kind words from you, sir. Thank you, sir, and uh, continue to inspire us, sir. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Dilip. Sharat is here. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Hey, good afternoon, May Sharat. Nice to see you. Yeah, many uh, of you. Many congratulations, of you. sir. Sarat. Thanks, thanks, Sharat. Sharat is one of the great neuroradiologists of our country. If I have want an opinion, because you know our neuroradiologists, Kesavdas and uh, Bijoy, they are so good, but they are very busy. So, but you know, always say access Sarat for any opinion. Thanks, Sarat. And I am sure you have settled in your Thank new you. house. Uh, your house, house, yes, house. Yeah. Thanks, Sarat. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, sir, we shifted, sir. Thank you for remembering, sir. You Thank remember you. everything. <laughs> Thanks, Sarat. Again, sir, congratulations. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you, Sarat. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Good afternoon, Mishra, sir. So good to see you. 
Yeah, good afternoon. Suresh, I can't see your face. That's the problem. It's okay. I can see your face. You came back from Prague. Yeah, but... Uh, you yeah, were... I came back for to congratulate you. But I got up at 6 o'clock in the morning. I mean, I reached at 6 o'clock in the morning in Mumbai. But I said, no, I have to be there. So I'm not sleeping I'm because of that. So if I go to sleep, don't worry about it. <laughs> Suresh, I mean, what can I say? We have spent so many, so many months, weeks, years together. Uh, and uh, Suresh used to be there at uh, 6 o'clock in the morning. Unfortunately, uh, the residents have to be there and he used to teach them and screw them and whatever, <laughs> all the teaching. And he continues to teach. In fact, he is taking care of uh, my residents. He is an official visiting professor in our department. And uh, so our... Uh, Fortunately, I think unofficially, I think that my both the candidates have have done well. The results have not come out, but I understand they have done well. And thanks to Suresh. Uh, thank you, Suresh. Uh, all the best. God bless. And uh, you remain for next 25 years at least teaching people. Thanks. Thanks, Mr. for the <laughs> kind words. And uh, I don't know when we are going to catch up again. I don't know for some NSI Young Neurosurgeon Forum. You are there. You are one of the speakers. Myself too. I don't know why they have called Which me. What? But Young, young Neurosurgeons Forum. They want some people. Yeah, yeah, to but I, I will be again. I will be on the webinar because I am traveling that time. I'll, I'm abroad that time. But he told me that you can call talk on webinar. So I'll be talking on webinar only that day. Okay. Myself too. Okay. I'm in Egypt that day. I think it's on the tenth. But I'm in the I'm in Egypt that day. So I will be. Yeah. Uh, I'll be on the on online. If the online permits, I'll do it. But you know, all second Saturday of June, you used to have your academic program in Mumbai. And this is one year where you are not holding. Say your Alcom program used to be on the second week of, second Saturday of every June. And probably this June, you are not holding it. No, no, we we I, we're going because this is uh, there is a little bit of our post COVID the the you know the meetings have come back with a vengeance so we need to lot of traveling I have so we will have it I will let you know we are going to we are planning for the next month not in June yeah. but month after that because it's going to be online again. Okay, okay, Mister, thanks. I thanks. I will let you know. I am trying to get because every week weekends are booked for some uh, important webinar of the WFNS. So I love to find a time when it doesn't clash with some important uh, webinar. That's how it is getting, you know, delayed. But uh, I, I, we will do it in July. Because they are after me, so I will we'll fix up the time. I'll let you know. Thanks, thanks, Mister, for your time and go and have a nice sleep. Okay, you can have so a nice the sleep. They, they gave you some award. You are giving a talk now. What's the no, problem? No, no, no talk now. Afternoon session is for all uh, some big consultants like our. Dilip and all, they have given talks, but youngsters, now Chitra residents who have passed out, I think they are going to talk now. And uh, we will so your listen. Your function was in the morning, was it? Yeah, and that the, all the, got the, over, the... yeah. I think it will oh, be no, in the okay. web or uh, I think it will be in the YouTube. I hope so. You want to talk to Sanjay? Sanjay is sitting next to me. Uh, hello, sir. Uh, yeah, yeah. Great hello, honor. Hello, yeah, sir. Professor Sanjay yeah. Bihari, director, sir. How are you? Fine, sir. How are you, sir? So, <laughs> thank you. No. Thank you for doing this. This is very, very no, thoughtful. No, I think uh, the credit goes to neurosurgery and Dr. Ishwar and Dr. KK. Actually, it's their brainchild. No, no. It's very, no part, very thoughtful of uh, both you and the department to do. And uh, it cannot be more appropriate uh, than choosing Professor Suresh Nair to be the the first uh, the outstanding teacher award, Arim Bomber teacher award. I mean, there's no, ob obviously, I mean, there is just no question about it. Yes, there sir. is no second opinion. There is no the, the <laughs> controversy about it. So yeah, yeah. you have chosen the teacher of neurosurgery. <laughs> yes, I consider him the teacher of yes, neurosurgery. Sir, there's no question yeah, about yeah, it. Absolutely. Thank you for doing that, Sanjay. Yeah, no, thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. No, Isur is there. So tell Isur also, thank you, Suresh. Isur also had called me. So... If he's there, just say thank you very much for asking me to be there, part of this, uh, the, you know, kind of delightful program. Thank you. Isu. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you, you, sir, for being part for of it. Getting this organized. All the best. Thank you. Please carry on. Okay? Right. Sonal is there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Sonal. 
I think there is there is a young lady there, uh, some <laughs> director in some Delhi hospital is sitting there. <laughs> see that. <laughs> Sir, you always start with that, right? That's why I but you, switched you on my video because I wanted I, I, to hear. But I can't do anything. You are the director. What can I do? I mean, somebody the director is the director. But that, but that sarcasm in your sentence is always, I <laughs> no, guess, no, why, oh, why so and director. <laughs> no, 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 sarcasm is not sarcasm. It's not love, it's not This is love, love and affection, not sarcasm. <laughs> we are so happy and proud that you are you are become a director. We want more, more, more of uh, this gen to become directors of different, uh, you know, kind of places. In thank you so much. Uh, it has been you, Doctor Suresh. I had to bless me so that I could reach here, sir. Thank you so much. Honestly, you have done very well. We are proud of you. Thank you so much, sir. Are there some more uh, people yeah, yeah. Are there? Uh, some Sonal, Sonal. I, we I have to talk to Sonal also. Sonal, Hi, no. sir. Yeah, Sonal, thank you. Sir, for, yeah. I would just... Please, continue. Sir, like Dr. Mishra, I also wanted to see you. I wanted to see you, but we are not being able to see you. No, no, we can see now. But we I have see. just... We can see I now, I cannot sir. see, sir. Yeah, I, I can see him. I can see him there. He is there in the photo. Maybe you move yeah, your... He is there, there, there maybe. top panel. Now I can. Thank you. Hi, sir. Uh, okay. Uh, Sonal, hello. Oh, she has gone. Eh? Sir, just few lines. Yeah, yeah, just please, few please, lines please, from please, bottom please. of my heart. Can I? Please, please, please. Yeah. Sir, first of all, thanks to Professor Ishwar and his team to allow me to pour out my heartfelt memories with you. Sir, uh, I... I fully agree with uh, Dr. Mishra that there is no more appropriate person to be selected for this Distinguished Teacher Award. Sir, you know what you gave me in life? My hunger for neurosurgery knowledge. And do you know how did you give that to me? By coming at 7 o'clock to the department when I joined my neurosurgery training and I thought, why not 6.45? Because we are not being able to answer your questions. And sir, believe me, not only those lovely four years that I enjoyed being in competition with you to reach early and know everything about the patient, I still have that hunger. And that's why probably I stand out today. Uh, amongst my colleagues here, that's what every other specialty colleagues tell me, that I still have that hunger in me, that if there is something in the patient that is not one plus one, two, I get into the depth. And so I always say that that hunger for knowledge, that is what you have given me. And thank you so much, sir. For most of the students, I don't think you are just a teacher, you are a hero for us. And I'm so happy that I got this opportunity to say a few words for you. Uh, you are very warm. You are very caring. I remember, in fact, both of you, sir, uh, Dr. Mishra and Dr. Suresh Nair, how you helped me in my second year of neurosurgery when I fought with some kind of illness. That is how I am MCH today. I would have left that year, believe me. So cannot thank you enough. And I would have loved to be... Uh, physically present there but the distance mm, was so that's why it was not possible and uh, of course I want to thank uh, Professor Sanjay Bihari for being such an excellent mentor and be that's why I think Department of Neurosurgery at Chitra is being able to arrange uh, many more uh, such events isn't it sir? 100% uh, Sonal uh, so it's so what a great time I had with you uh, das, then Girish Menon, Yeshish Dalal, then uh, our Sai Sudarshan, Chakravarti, then Rajinish Kachara, Kurian, then uh, our uh, Kurian, and then Sumit and Murali. You were all the residents that time. Eh? What a wonderful team I yes. had. Eh? A wonderful uh, residents I had. And in fact, I still remember when uh, Dr. Raut and uh, Dr. Misra left in uh, late, Misra left in 1995, December, and route in 96, January. One fine day, I took over as uh, head of the Department of Neurosurgery in 96, January, without having done any other cases. Eh? And, uh, and look, you people uh, helped me, helped me in uh, 
uh, taking up the challenge, I will always remember that. Eh? You yourself, Rajneesh, Girish, Sai Sudarshan, eh? all of you helped me a lot as residents because I had a very young faculty. And uh, later only I got the help of Rabbi Mohan Ravu, then uh, Panikar came, then uh, Bhattacharya came. But you know, that two years you all were real uh, consultants to me while you were residents in training. Thanks, uh, thanks for everything, Sonal. My pleasure, sir. My pleasure of being a student. Thank you. Thank you, Sonal. Thank you. Okay, Suresh, so have a good time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Okay, I will call okay. you. Okay, okay bye, bye, bye. Bye, bye, bye. Yeah. Recording so thanks. Eh? Next, we have uh, another talk from Dr. Ravi Mohan Rao, sir, uh, on the on carotid endarterectomy with continuous EEG monitoring. Uh, he couldn't make it in person here, and uh, he has, uh, we have recorded the talk. Uh, he'll be presenting to you now. Thank Professor Ishwar and his uh, team for this wonderful invitation to participate in the Professor R. M. Verma Memorial uh, Continuing Medical Education uh, Program and also for uh, honoring our beloved Professor Suresh Nair for being an outstanding teacher. I, at the outset, I would like to apologize for not being there in person as I have been down with severe laryngitis and only just recovering. So pardon my hoarse and croaky voice and uh, I hope I'll be understood well by the audience. Can, yes, sir, visible. Is it visible? Visible now, sir. Oh, thank, you. thank you so much. So the talk I'm going to give today afternoon is on carotid and artrectomy under continuous EEG monitoring. And this work has been possible only because of the excellent neurosciences team with whom I'm working, which includes neurologists, other neurosurgeons, neuroanesthetists, and neuroradiologists. And not, but not the least, uh, neurotechnicians to do intraoperative neuromonitoring. We are today honoring two great teachers, Professor R. M. Verma, who was the founder director of NIMANS and an excellent teacher. Though I have not worked with him, I have listened to a few of his lectures and also seen his wonderful demonstration of chemothalamotomy for Parkinson's disease tremors. Professor Suresh Nair needs no introduction and he is the most deserving teacher to receive this outstanding neurosurgical teacher award being organized under the Professor R.M. Verma Memorial uh, CME. Many of us have benefited from uh, him teaching us nuances of neurosurgery and I have personally worked with him through many difficult cases and uh, we have managed to learn and handle them successfully. So the workup for our carotid and artrectomy includes carotid Doppler, CT angiogram of neck vessels, MRI brain with MRA, DSA to see the ACOM and PCOM and the cross circulation. Aspirin is continued, clopidogrel is stopped. There is a thorough cardiac and systemic evaluation of these patients. We do our endotrectomies on the GA, <clears throat> one gram of levitacetam, 20 grams of mannitol, 
and 4 grams of dexamethasone is given before cross clamping. 5000 units of IV heparin is given 3 minutes before cross clamping. <coughs> Excuse me. Continuous EEG monitoring is instituted and goes throughout the procedure till the cross clamps are removed. We have a small series of 60 patients from May 2012 to January 2023. There were 47 males and 13 females. The age group ranged from 33 to 87 years. 32 patients were symptomatic cardiac, uh, carotid stenosis, 60 to 99% stenosis. And 23 were asymptomatic carotid stenosis. Five patients had symptomatic floating thrombus in the carotid artery or ICA. And 13 patients had varying degrees of bilateral carotid artery stenosis. 17 of the 60 patients had carotid endarterectomy with CABG <clears throat> in the same sitting. And two of them had staged carotid, uh, uh, carotid endarterectomy and CABG. The average carotid cross clamping time was 34 minutes. So I go through cases to illustrate the variety of cases which we have dealt with in this series and also to stress the point that carotid cross clamping time is not one of the most important prognosticating indicators of carotid endarterectomy. The first patient I want to show is an 81-year-old female hypertensive presented with left upper wing limb weakness of one day duration and had left hemiparesis at the time of surgery of grade 4 by 5 power. You can see this is the pre-op CT angiogram showing the uh, critical stenosis of the internal carotid artery with this plaque and this is the post-operative CT angiogram. The degree of stenosis was between 95 to 99 percent, and this is the post-op. We routinely do post-op CT angiograms in the same admission for all patients. This is the continuous EEG monitoring throughout the surgery. The first uh, is the baseline study. This is with the carotid clamp on end of carotid clamping and 10 minutes of release. <coughs> the total cross clamp time was 36 minutes and there was no EEG change during the surgery which correlated with the excellent outcome the patient had. The second case is that of a 39-year-old male hyper hypertensive. He had hyperhomocysteinemia and presented with left hemipheresis of less than one day duration. There was a voting thrombus in the CCA extending into the ICA. And you see the small infarcts which have occurred in the hemisphere corresponding to the carotid artery. And this is the floating thrombus which was removed and the patient post-op. This is a small video to show the removal of the floating thrombus and the carotid endarterectomy to remove the plaque on which the floating thrombus had formed. This is after cross clamping, the carotid artery is being opened. You can see this is the thrombus within the lumen of the common carotid artery extending into the internal carotid artery. This floating thrombus is easily removed with a dissector. It has formed an, an ulcerated plaque. So that is the plot, yeah, that, that's the floating thrombus which is being removed. And this is the ulcerated plaque. So one needs to do an endarterectomy to prevent reformation of the thrombus. Again, this is easily accomplished between the adventitia. With the help of a dissector, the plaque is dissected. <clears throat> mm. 
meticulousness in removing the debris, ensuring that the distal intima is feathering well, and there are no debris which are left behind uh, to embolize distally is one of the most important steps in the endotrectomy. This is after closure, removal of the clamps, the Doppler being used to check for... Uh, and this is the post-op ICG angiogram showing very good flow without any obstructions in the common carotid artery and, and the internal carotid artery. Total clamp time was 31 minutes, and this is the EG done during the procedure, which showed no change. The next case is that of a 45-year-old male smoker presented with a history of right upper limb weakness. And uh, you see this small infarct in the left hemisphere. And this is the angiogram showing extreme thinning of the internal carotid artery. This is the external carotid artery branches filling first, and there is a circulatory delay in poor filling of the internal carotid artery circulation. There is severe stenosis or the origin of the internal carotid artery, external carotid artery, sorry. So the plan was for an STA and MC anastomosis to bolster the intracranial circulation because the superficial temporal artery was arising from the external carotid artery, which was stenosed at its origin. We did an external carotid endotrectomy, followed by the STMC bypass. This is the angiogram after the STMC bypass showing that revascularization of the anterior circulation has occurred. This matures over a period of time and becomes bigger, and this is the post-op. <laughs> and this is the AEG. The clamp time was 25 minutes. We noticed one peculiarity when the ECA was cross-clamped. We saw that uh, there was a drop in amplitude of the right frontocentral leads. However, at the end of carotid clamping followed by a release of the carotid clamp was followed by an immediate return in the right frontocentral leads to normal amplitude, which maintained 10 minutes after the release. The next patient is an asymptomatic high-grade carotid stenosis, a 76-year-old gentleman, diabetic smoker, who had a coronary artery disease with CABG in 2005. He was being followed up for carotid artery stenosis and was detected to have progressive asymptomatic right carotid artery stenosis, which had reached up to 90% on follow-up. He also had contralateral non-critical carotid and vertebral stenosis. This is the CT angiogram pre pre-op which showed progression from 70% to 90% over a period of time. And this is the post-op MRI showing uh, complete removal of the block and full expansion of the CCA and ICA and the and patient post-op doing very well. And then you can do a smooth movement. And uh, the cross clamp time was 34 minutes. The serial ECG during the surgery, continuous EG rather, showing no change. The next case is that of a 75-year-old gentleman, diabetic hypertensive. He had acute coronary syndrome of inferior wall MI, which an ejection fraction of 45%. He also had peripheral vascular disease and was hypothyroid. And this is the extensive degree of calcification with critical stenosis in the carotid artery. This patient also had coronary artery disease, so a single sitting uh, endotrectomy of the carotid artery and the CABG was done. And this is the post-op CTA showing full expansion of the carotid artery. And uh, 
throughout the procedure, the patient showed the normal EEG pattern which did not change with the initiation of carotid cross clamping and ending of the cross clamping. Now I want to show some problems we had encountered in our series. This is an 87 year old gentleman. This is the first red flag he presented to us in August 2020. Generally, we do not do endotrectomy unless the patients are extremely healthy above the age of 80 years. <coughs> Excuse me. This patient. <coughs> <coughs> had type 2 diabetes mellitus with hypertension. He had a PTC done in 2004. He was also a known case of atrial fibrillation, which is another red flag. Developed transient limb weakness and speech difficulty and seen by cardiologist elsewhere. He had developed a series of TIAs in August 2020 and advised carotid stunting elsewhere. But the patient got referred to us. Here you see the small infarcts in the white matter and in the cortex of the motor cortex and uh, the sensory cortex. And you see this carotid stenosis, critical carotid stenosis <coughs> in the left internal carotid artery. In the patient developed an in-hospital stroke and the MRI done in August 2020 showed a small pontine infarct along with other infarcts. So these were interpreted as uh, arterioembolic uh, strokes, old arterioembolic strokes, plus new cardioembolic strokes and started on anticoagulation. The family wanted the carotid stenosis to be treated. In fact, we should have refused and if at all any treatment had to be done, we should have referred him for stenting. However, after discussion with our interventional cardiologist, they again wanted an endotrectomy to be done. And uh, after a thorough discussion, they refused stenting and uh, wanted the endotrectomy to be done. When the endotrectomy was done, the cross clamp time was 25 minutes. There was no EEG change during the procedure as shown in these slides. And uh, MRI done after endotrectomy patient had delayed recovery with right hemiparesis. The initial MRI did not show anything suspicious. The MRI showed again uh, a successful uh, carotid uh, revascularization. A flare and uh, diffusion weighted plus uh, ADC mapping showed a mild abnormality in the left hemisphere. However, this mismatch was more prominent. This was interpreted to be two possible things, either hyperperfusion or ischemia. The patient did not show improvement and uh, the patient died 10 days after surgery. He continued to have, uh, remain hemiplegic and uh, in uh, poor sensorium. So this was several ischemia, which was uh, seen as a hyper intense cortical mantle and not as a generalized large infarct. So the lesson learned from this was, there was a mixture of cardioembolic and arterio arterioembolic strokes in this patient. In view of his age and cardiac status, he should have been left alone with uh, either anticoagulation plus minus uh, carotid stent rather than carotid endotrectomy. The last case is that of a 64 year old lady hypertensive, one episode of TIA. This is the pre op CT angiogram showing the calcification and the carotid plaque. 
and this patient underwent an endarterectomy. During one endarterectomy, the mistake committed by our team was the dissection was done underneath the adventitia <laughs> without realizing it. The plaque held and we put our uh, cross clamps in the proximal carotid artery, distal ICA, ECA, superior thyroid artery and completed the endarterectomy. However, during the procedure of uh, suturing, the plaque gave way and there was torrential hemorrhage. This could be controlled because the cross clamp, <coughs> we had a rescue cross clamp on and uh, with that, the arteriotomy was closed. However, due to the frantic nature of the surgery, there was two intimal flaps which are non-flow uh, restricting, which were uh, left behind as seen in the post-op angiogram. And this was tackled with a stent, which uh, reduced the flaps. The cross clamp time was 46 minutes, but the EG did not show any change and the patient had an uneventful outcome. So in all, we did about 16 carotid endarterectomies. No carotid shunt was used during this procedure as none of the patients had shown an EG change during the procedure except for one who had external carotid artery. <coughs> Cross clamping as described earlier, post-op CTA MRA was done in all patients. There was one stroke as I had described in that 87 year old uh, gentleman who died on the 12th post-operative day. One patient with poor cardiac function died after discharge and was brought in a very poor state to the casualty 31 days after CE and CABG. He had an initial stormy post-operative period recovered and was discharged. He was brought dead to the emergency room. One patient required a carotid stent for non-flow limiting CCA intimal flap as shown earlier. So what were the results of continuous EEG monitoring? EEG change in amplitude and slowing was seen in one patient with bilateral ICA long segment stenosis with cerebral and ischemia. He underwent a STA, MCA anastomosis as I had demonstrated. There was EEG changes during the ECA carotid endarterectomy which reverted on releasing the cross clamps. He had no deficits post-op. In 58 of the 60 patients, intraoperative EEG correlated with postoperative outcome. One patient, intraoperative EEG change reverted after reverse of clause camps and the patient had no deficit. In one patient in whom the intraoperative EEG did not show any change, the patient had an ischemic insult and this was the 87 year old gentleman who developed ischemia of the hemisphere and had a fatal outcome. So in our small series, we have seen that intraoperative EEG monitoring predicts safety of carotid endarterectomy under GA. We keep a shunt ready for introduction in case there is a change with the common carotid artery and ICA cross clamping. And uh, we feel that meticulous C carotid endarterectomy technique to remove the plaque and uh, clear the artery of any internal debris and not the cross clamping time is the key to a good outcome. Thank you very much for your patient hearing. And my apologies again for the disturbance created by my voice. Thank you so much.
we will all be uh, moving on to the next session now it's called the residence corner the first speaker is dr santosh kumar who will be speaking about atypical presentations of high grade gliomas in a child dignitaries today on this auspicious event of uh, a felicitation of a beloved teacher he may not me know like uh, there are some ekala vishishas some teachers will have uh, uh, disciples unknown to them <laughs> that is uh, the story of ekala vya my teacher raja kutti sir as of now he is not present here but still i wish he sees this coming to this presentation the patient or i can say this gentleman this infant is an apparently normal one year old male child with uh, unremarkable uh, antenatal and postnatal post neonatal history he is hailing from vimanapuram trivandrum district present to the casualty of sri avitam tirunal that is sct hospital with the complaints of uh, the bystanders the caregiver multiple episodes of nausea and vomiting so we were not even knowing that it is a cns case the pediatricians were taking care of the child so they have done a huge battery of work up non bilious non hemorrhagic non projectile more during the morning hours that morning more during the morning hours may be a useful marker for a neurosurgical point of view no history suggest of changes in feed no unusual orders no history suggest of accidental consumption of harmful substances copper sulfate zinc salts these are all from pediatrics uh, case sheets because they wanted to rule out uh, involvement of gi tract in a case of an infant who was uh, vomiting repeatedly since last five days and uh, he was not on medications and uh, there is no history of intestinal obstruction or gastroenteritis uh, neither operation history nor ear related pathology now they added the ear related pathology here because uh, they wanted to rule out involvement of uh, vestibular system and uh, motion sickness and uh, munchausen sy syndrome by proxy bore have tears and malaria vest tears were all ruled out by careful history taking then he also complains of decreased feeding not associated with developmental disorder and uh, craniofacial abnormalities were not there like midface hypoplasia that we discussed yesterday Uh, that resulted in difficulty in respiration difficulty in feeding etc and craniosynostosis class this gentleman this is a baby he was not having this uh, craniofacial abnormalities or pediatric dysphagia syndromes uh, feeding skill dysfunction etc because he is an infant one year old and uh, no oral motor uh, motor hypotonia was present and uh, there is no evidence of uh, underdeveloped sucks swallowed breath reflex pattern and uh, there is no evidence of poor lip closure or excessive drooling from mouth all these things are necessary for us to isolate the Uh, pathology means uh, isolate the cause pointing towards uh, whatever that is not probable and uh, whatever that is not probable will be usually there if you remove all the prob uh, non probable things whatever remains is the cause so uh, he is not a picky eater skipping of feeds has been ruled out no overfeeding or underfeeding no spitting out of feeds aerophagia has been ruled out choking cough reflexes gagging apnea cyanosis 
and psychosocial factors like change in the caregiver and uh, child in, uh, child uh, caregiver child relationships See, these points are all important for us to take into consideration when you are dealing with pediatric tumors or pediatric uh, cases per se because we cannot isolately say head injury uh, patient is having uh, vomiting patient is having raised icp patient is having papillary edema then it might be because of icp we have to rule out all the other causes and that have been done elaborately in this workup and uh, noticeably disinterest in surroundings was told by the mother maybe this was not an important factor for us at that point of time we thought this is not important but just we added that then we came to know the importance of this factor here disinterest in surroundings etc etc and inability to stand and sit without support see this gentleman was having a regression like a regression of milestones at that point of time uh, we didn't think too much about that inability to sit and uh, stand and sit without support because at 8 months of age the infant usually uh, sits with support and by 1 year of age the infant stands with support and with the pincer grasp etc but uh, this gentleman this baby, this baby was not able to sit and stand without support which he was doing earlier so we ruled out muscle weakness joint disease and uh, clinically we have ruled out all those uh, orthopedic in, uh, necessities for uh, support to sit and stand he also had sustained a high grade fever sudden in onset no prodrome deferences was present it was not associated with chills rigors rashes or increased respiratory rate now this uh, chills rigors and rashes we wanted to rule out uh, septic foci or uh, because of pneumonia or because of uh, hemorrhagic diastasis increased respiratory rate was present that is true and uh, no localization of fever focus was made out on history and uh, there is no history suggestive of travel or prolonged sun exposure this was also taken to prevent uh, to rule out uh, sun stroke heat stroke etc and on clinical examination it's not a bad battered baby now we ruled it out by uh, this was necessary to rule out uh, intracranial bleed subdural hematoma neglected child etc clinical non syndromic child we ruled out developmental delay regression of milestones uh this is important uh, in non syndromic child but the regression of milestones was present in this case only short lived and uh, he was irritable febrile af was bulged no neurocutaneous markers no evidence of rashes petechiae etc that i told earlier we wanted to rule out fever with the hemorrhagic diastasis and poor, uh, poor skin turgor dry mucous membranes we ruled out because dehydration was present in this child oral cavity there was no trust uh, dysphagia vomiting can uh, esophageal candidiasis what do we ruled out because the child was repeatedly vomiting for more than uh, five days and we wanted to rule out uh, multi systemic involvement and then isolate to the cns part and uh, pupils were reactive equal and uh, there was no nystagmus now this is important because he was not having a uh, uh, vestibular involvement and uh, we missed one finding at that point of time we did not check for the papillary edema we were not able to see the we, were, we did not uh, check papillary edema at that point of time and vitals were stable and uh, patient was not having any hypovolemia and uh, raised uh, this one hypotension in systemic examination uh, patient was dull and drowsy but uh, luckily electrolytes were normal in this case and uh, there were no cerebellar signs and uh, locomotor systems bulk tone and power were all normal that uh, told earlier we ruled out orthopedic interventions also and uh, sensations were perceived to the child there is no goiter thyroid endocrinopathy was ruled out by subsequent uh, clinical exam yeah, this one um, biochemical parameters chest was clear there is no focus of pneumonia and uh, heart there was no evidences of uh, postural hypertension murmurs arrhythmias etc and abdomen was also clear he was not having ileus obstruction scar or surgical battlefield that was not a battlefield abdomen and uh, abdomen cause for vomiting were also ruled out and uh, remaining is genito urinary he was not having torsion testes because torsion testes is one of the reason for crying and uh, vomiting in a child that's uh, but we also ruled out that and uh, there is no evidence of urinary incontinence etc so how did we approach this case investigations uh, we took the routine hemogram that was neutrophilic leukocytosis was there and uh, but increase in the hematocrit was there then that we attributed to presence of dehydration in this child we have to rule out diarrhea vomiting polycythemia and many other causes for uh, raised hematocrit and electrolytes were within normal and uh, uh, lft and uh, this one renal function test were also within normal limits there was no hypovolemic shock secondary to fluid loss by vomiting amylase and lipase were also normal we ruled out pancreatitis etc and uh, there was no diabetic ketoacidosis sterile pyuria and appendicitis and uh, cultures were negative chest x ray not genogram and ecg and thyroid function were all negative were all normal now comes the main part in imaging as a part of a uh, workup we uh, assess the entire system ranging from uh, head to toe and then we started with imaging we did not take ct in one year old child because of radiation exposure this mri is showing intraaxial cystic icsol with cortex and white matter involved irregular thickening of anterior and uh, lateral wall 
iso intense to cortex diffusion restriction so basically this is a picture there which you can see two uh, two types of uh, components cystic component and solid component that we will come to know as i show the further slides with a significant midline shift and a prelational edema here we have two components that can be made out solid and cystic this is dwi images we have mr spectroscopy we had uh, one more problem since the fever was the focus there was a fever in this child we were suspecting any uh, tuber this uh, fever uh, related uh, issues in the child maybe maybe any infective focus or maybe is it an abscess or uh, because of this the child was dull and drowsy with uh, vomiting multiple episodes we also did mr spectroscopy and then mr spectroscopy is showing increased lipid lactate along with that there is increased co increased choline in this uh, child so this was the and also there is a thin rim of uh, wall enhancement in this case usually this thin uh, rim of wall enhancement we usually go with abscesses but uh, lipid lactate peak is also there that is also suggestive of abscesses but uh, choline peak is also elevated so this is a complex case uh, in one year old child with who is presenting with fever and uh, decreased uh, ability to feed and dull and drowsy the spine was also the spine was also taken as a screening and uh, that is showing uh, no abnormalities then we did mr venogram this is also fine there is no thrombus there is no occlusion there is no major uh, vascular supply to that uh, lesion which we saw in the left frontal lobe which is extending to the parietal aspect so what are we going to do with this case intervention is to be done we did left ftp craniotomy and uh, we did the maximal safe resection now during resection we don't know whether it is a glioma or whether it is ependymoma but that is extraventricular or maybe it is a pnet so we did maximal safe resection and uh, wherever we left it, uh, the tumor which was other end to the ventricle wall and the tumor which was other end to the sylvian uh, region that uh, regions were left behind and then we underwent uh, the patient underwent uh, maximal safe resection of the frontal icu as well intra findings were tense dura grayish cystic area which was intraaxial with a brown turbid fluid it is soft moderately vascular succable with well defined planes now this well defined planes is important because the differential diagnosis of this uh, can be extraventricular uh, ependymoma but uh, for that the planes has to be not well defined and it may be glioma that is there but even it may be glioblastoma now that multiform has been removed it may be glioblastoma but uh, well defined planes is one which is differentiating this from uh, other two things and the rarest of the rare diagnosis may be primitive neuro uh, this one ectodermal uh, tumors and uh, thrombus vessel the tumor bed remnants of unresected tumor at ventricle wall and uh, sylvian fissure these two areas were left behind because we did not want to uh, internally decompress the tumor into the ventricle we were not knowing whether it is an abscess or whether it is a tumor or whether it is infective etiology or it may be if it, if at all it goes into the tumor and then if at all it goes into the ventricle there may be more chances of ventricular edema and the patient may expire at that point of time so we didn't go, go towards that uh, ventricular wall and uh, we left the tumor at sylvian fissure as it is post op recovery paraxia is still there even today the patient is on pa patient is a uh, hyper uh, paraxia patient is having a uh, patient is febrile pediatrician's opinion was sort they told meningitis to be meningitis has to be ruled out for that uh, we did lumbar puncture and uh, luckily there was no meningitis in this child but uh, as of now the fever is still persistent the child will be shifted to rcc following recovery in a short amount of time after uh, completely the fever has been subsided now at the time of discharge patient is alert active and febrile moving or verbal output is adequate difficulty in sitting without support is persistent and uh, feeding has improved bowel and bladder are normal so these two qualities are still present in the child as of now it is uh, paraxia as well as uh, ability to inability to sit or stand without support so the differential diagnosis include anaplastic supratentorial lipendymoma that is extraventricular glioblastoma and pnet now the question says what may be the cause of fever in this child i'd like to ask honorable dignitaries to shed some light on this uh, atypical case because we are at loss of words we don't know what is the cause did we touch the thalamus or did we, uh, did we uh, disturb the hypothalamus or what is the thing and second thing is uh, this uh, histopathology came as a high grade glioma but with uh, well uh, differentiated planes Uh, high grade glioma with well differentiated planes uh, is it a common entity or is it so with those words i'd like to end this presentation thank you for your valuable time really honored to be here
Yes, sir. The child presented with fever and uh, multiple episodes of vomiting and followed by inability to eat and mother uh, perceived a generalized disin disinterest in surroundings. That is lipid lactate as well as choline. Both were elevated, sir. Diffusion restriction. Yes, sir. Turbid brown fluid. Interop also. Yes, yes, it is there. Interop. The it's motor oil. I don't like. It's it's not like craniopharyngioma, sir. Like uh, we don't know exactly what is it craniopharyngioma, but the report came as HGG, high grade glioma. That is only outside. That is not a provisional report. That is not final. Yeah, it was moderately vascular, sir. No, no, clot was not there. No, no, no. Drop metastasis. Drug induced. That's what, sir. Yes, yes. Yes, sir. No, but uh, post-operatively also there is no improvement, sir. That was what is wor worrying us. So that, uh, and the fever is worse. Yes, yes. So, uh, I think we need to do this case for the moment. What, what is the solution to this? No, from outside. Uh, we'll start. Especially with ATRT, I mean, there's a huge metastasis. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Honored.
Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much, sir. We next have Dr. Mary Francis, who will be talking about final outcome at three months of decompressive craniectomy for a malignant MC infarct, a case series. Good afternoon, respected faculty and my colleagues. Uh, so as we all know, patients suffering from malignant MC infarction, they have an increased incidence of significant disability and mortality. An occlusion of the internal carotid or the middle subgular artery leads to a significant cerebral ischemic infarction. And this accounts for approximately about 10% of all supratentorial ischemic stroke cases. And a hypotensity of more than 70, 50 to 75% of the um, middle cerebral artery territory, including the basal ganglia involvement of additional vascular territories. And a significant midline shift in the initial 48 hours usually indicate a life-threatening infarct volume, which is generally referred to as a malignant MC infarction. And neurological deterioration usually occurs within uh, five days, with the highest frequency of deaths occurring due to a transtentorial herniation, and most frequently, the brain death usually occurs on day three of ictus. And the mortality of an untreated uh, malignant MC infarct, that is without a neurosurgical intervention, is about 80%. So here I'll be presenting a case series of 30 patients who have been of uh, malignant MC infarcts who have been treated with uh, decompressive hemigranectomy and their functional outcome as assessed by the modified ranking scale. So we included patients uh, in undergoing uh, decompressive surgery for the malignant MC infarct, excluding very low score patients and patients who are already showing signs of brain death. And this was a prospective study of 30 patients over a period of one year. So coming to the results of the study, uh, we had patients all the way from the age of 32 to 70, and uh, one third of them being in the 41 to 50 year age group, and we had a male predominant, that is 80% were males. And uh, coming to the assessment of the duration of symptoms uh, to uh, before presentation, so the majority uh, presented in the 24 to 48 hour period after the onset of symptoms, followed by the three to 24 hours there were only two patients that were thrombolized. That is the first uh, category. That is the less than uh, three hours. They were initially thrombolized prior to uh, neurosurgical intervention. Uh, coming to the association of the GCS at the presentation as well as at the intervention uh, to the final uh, outcome. So th there were like 40% of patients who had a fairly good GCS, that is 13 to 15 at presentation. But this had dropped to 3% uh, by the time of intervention. And 27% uh, of patients who had a poor GCS initially itself, three to se that is 3 to 7, this had increased to 50% by the time of intel outcome. Uh, most of our patients were operated within the first 24 hours, but they did have a uh, severe morbidity. And then uh, again, uh, there was a significant association between uh, non-dominant side and the functional outcome. Uh, they had uh, there was the mortality as well as the morbidity, the severe disability was much higher in the dominant uh, dominant hemisphere side. The mean duration of hospital stay was higher with uh, patients who had an MRS of five, but and those who uh, uh, those who did not survive uh, this uh, series, they usually did within the first, they usually expired within the first week. There's no association with the uh, duration of post-op ventilation with outcome. And all patients who, who had uh, developed a post-operative myocardial in infarction eventually expired, usually within the first 10 days. Uh, then uh, coming to the uh, final uh, GCS at discharge, uh, we're coming to end the outcome. 
uh, those no none no patients who had a very low GCS at the time of discharge had a good function. All of them were had severe disabilities. Whereas uh, the those that had good uh, functional out, relatively good functional outcome, there is an MRS of four seventy two percent. They had uh, a GCS of thirteen to fifteen at discharge. So a majority of the patients were of uh, malignant MC in fact who deteriorate do so within the 72 hours of uh, ICTUS and the mortality in our study was 37% with a severe disability rate of 47%. And post-op mortality was increased among patients who had severe coronary artery disease and patients who developed acute uh, myocardial infarction in the post-op period. Uh, Decompensive hemicranic rate does improve the functional outcome of patients, especially when the neurological deterioration is not so severe and there are no other major comorbidities which may contribute to post-op mortality. May predictors of a better functional outcome include a good GCS and pupillary reaction at the time of intervention, a non-dominant hemisphere infarct, absence of pre-existing coronary artery disease, and a higher GCS at the time of discharge. Age, gender, timing of intervention does not have, have a significant outcome on the functional outcome. Uh, we had a couple of limitations. Uh, that is the short follow-up period. We were assessing the functional outcome at three months. And uh, it was a relatively small sample size of 30. Perhaps a longer follow-up or uh, and a larger la sample size may have shown a further improvement in the functional outcome, especially those of the MRS4 category might have improved to an MRS3. Thank you. So what do you understand by uh, uh, this uh, malignant MCI in fact? It includes MCI and imaging. Okay. Now, you have a large infarct. Eh? Uh, you have a patient is fully uh, awake, large infarct. Uh, you know that patient is likely to deteriorate. So you do a proactive uh, this decompression or you wait for GCS to dip down and then, because you told that uh, GCS has dipped down after 24 hours, 48 hours. At the end of uh, some 48 hours, only one person had a good GCS or so something like that. You yes, know. sir. So what is the message? These people, large infarct people, uh, you know that these people are likely to deteriorate. So do surgery when they are. Uh, yes. GCS is good. Is that the message? Yes, sir. Is that? Yes, I sir. don't know whether it is correct or not. Uh, that may, people may not think. I have two, two issues with your study. First is always put numbers because percentages are very fallacious, especially with small numbers. Because see, supposing your number is, supposing in a small number, if you have four in, your, in one subgroup and uh, it becomes five uh, versus some, there are only two in your subgroup and out of that one develops an infarct, then the percentage changes from say, uh, for 40 to 50 percent, from 25 to 50 percent, even by one change in your thing. So then you cannot use uh, parametric statistics. You can't have a proper pre-value there. Do you understand? Yes, so therefore, yes, you must always have, either it has to be more than 30 or uh, 30 is the number, below which you cannot have parametric statistics. You can't have mean, median, no mode, p-value like that. So you know, there are different param non-parametric statistics that you need to use. You get it? There is another very important point here that if you look at MCA and Fox, uh, there the difference will really, you will get the difference in the same study when you look at proximal infarcts versus distal infarcts. So supposing you have an MCA infarct which is proximal infarct, which is involving lateral lenticulostriate perforators, the prognosis will be much lesser with the same, same size of the infarct. Whereas if it is a little distal infarct, say it is coming up to the bifurcation, you know, that means that the lateral lenticulostriate vessels and the medial lenticulostriate vessels have been spared, then the prognosis will be much better. You understand? Yes. So you again analyze your study and look at the, uh, look at the uh, area of the infarct, which is more proximal, which is more distal in your angiograms. And then you will get very, very different uh, study. Uh, um, Results. In, in most of your cases, have you studied the uh, vessel, anatomy, MRA, or CT, angio? No, sir. Actually, uh, most so of these. You have not done an, no. uh, even a CT, angio, or MR, angio. Even MR, MR, angio was not done. No, no. So, okay, so then you repeat this study again, go prospectively, and, and look at the difference between a proximal infarct 
you know, proximal MC infarct versus a little distal MC infarct, which means sparing of the lenticulostriate vessels. You will find a huge difference in your prognostic values. You get my point? Thank you, sir. I mean, uh, our experience has been that even surgically sometimes when you're doing meningiomas of the perisylvian region and all that, and if there is an uh, uh, MC injury, uh, so then what happens is that if it's a proximal MC injury, then the infarct size is much larger and the patient does, uh, does not do well. But if it's a distal injury, then there may be a little deficit, but the patient often recovers. You understand? So even in strokes, you can look at that. And the other thing is when you're looking at pupillary asymmetry, what is your timing of intervention is very important. So you will get, if with pupillary asymmetry, the maximum you get is between three and five minutes. You know? So if you have been able to, so therefore look at the timing of intervention following pupillary asymmetry. If with pupillary asymmetry and the timing of intervention is say two hours or three hours, then you have already lost the patient. You get my point? So that will also make a difference. These are some things you need to look at. The timing of intervention is extremely important. Now, most of these, if you have caught the patient after they have decompensated, after they have herniated, the outcomes are going to be significantly worse. If you have a situation like Dr. Suresh has said, if you have a large infarct where predictively you, where you can predict that this person is going to decompensate in the next 24 to 48 hours, there is a role to do a, a prophylactic decompressive craniectomy because you know that this is going to blow up and the patient is going to herniate. Now, there are uh, studies that look at the area of the infarct as opposed to the area of the hemisphere, the percentage of hemisphere involved. And that is one of the definitions where you say it's a malignant infarct. Now, if the higher your percentage, the greater chance that your patient will deteriorate. So you have a very low threshold for uh, doing a decompressive craniectomy. Even a one point drop in the GCS, it's enough to go in and do a decompressive craniectomy. Waiting till the patient becomes anisocoric, you have already probably lost the patient by then. These are, these are not going to do well. Also this difference between the dominant and the non-dominant hemisphere, that's also significant because the dominant hemisphere infarcts, functionally they don't do well non-dominants tend to recover much better, or they can be rehabilitated. So these are things you have to keep in mind. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. <coughs> Our next presenter will be Dr. Nitin Das. Uh, he'll be presenting uh, something uh, on uh, role of cilistazole in post aneurysm clipping. Good evening, respected teachers and my dear colleagues. Today, my topic of presentation is effect of silastrosol in post aneurysm clipping uh, for um, and um, post aneurysm in patients who develop cerebral vasospasm. spasm. So, I would like to start my presentation with two recent cases that we have. One is a 58 year old female presented with a sudden onset severe headache and giddiness in May 2023. No seizures, vomiting, or weakness of limbs. Or Pignus or limbs or associated fever was present. The GCS was full. Pupils were validly equal and reacting to light. Uh, all limbs were moving equally. And uh, a score of 1, WF minus 1, and MFS 3. So she was uh, detected with uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage with a superiorly projecting ACOM aneurysm and then uh, underwent a right renal craniotomy and clipping of ACOM aneurysm. Uh, she was extubated post procedure. Uh, GCS was full with uh, full range of movements and shifted out of ICU on post of day 3. On day 5, 
she left she developed weakness of the left upper and lower limbs uh, the mrc grade 4 by 5 power with altered sensorium e4 v4 m6 uh, electrolytes within normal limits the post op ct brain showed no development of hydrocephalus oh, so she was uh, started on con continued on induced hypertension maintaining a cvp of 10 to 12 cm water and continued on nimodipine and we had started on a add on silostazole 100 mg bd for the patient on from post op day 8 she became symptomatically better power improved to mrc grade 5 by 5 on post op day 10 the gcs was full this is a ct on a post operative day non contra ct on the post operative day 10 discharge on day 12 uh, 73 year old male patient who was a chronic smoker hypertensive uh, diagnosed with a sh with the bilobed echomaneurism and then left renal craniotomy and clipping of echo of a bilobed echomaneurism on day 2 he was on still on ventilator uh, his gcs became e3 vt m6 and he was moving all limbs and uh, he had a sudden onset decreased responsiveness while on in icu gcs was e2 v, vt m2 uh, he was uh, continued on induced hypertension uh, and the cvp was uh, maintained about 10 cm and anemodipine was continued and we had uh, started on a tapsilostazol and mg bds add on on day 7 his gcs improved to e4 vt m6 and we extubated on day 8 e4 v4 m6 on day 10 his gcs was e4 v5 m6 well moving all limbs equally and uh, discharged on day 14 so after aneurysm repair so minimizing harm from the vasospasm by avoiding hypovolemia ensuring adequate blood pressure and nimodipine administration are the main stays of sih management Uh, but close monitoring of the clinical and the cerebrovascular status of the patients allows for intervention and um, what human says is a induced hypertension and the endovascular treatment the res other rescue therapies in an effort to is a, in an effort to avoid cerebral infarction so angiographic vasospasm sets in uh, for to 14 days after sh peaking at 7 to 10 days and resolving by day 21 incidence of 50 to 90 percentage is noted and uh, 40 percentage of the patients with vasospasm will develop delayed cerebral ischemia and uh, there will be presence of neurological focal neurological deficit or a decrease of at least 2 points on the gcs score lasting longer than 1 hour with no other identifiable cause the risk factors for vasospasm are spasm are in the ct there will be thick subarachnoid clots intraventricular hematoma persistent subarachnoid clots poor neurological condition on admission loss of consciousness associated with rupture history of cigarette smoking pre existing hypertension diabetes and cocaine use so <coughs> the vasus spasm uh, prolonged mechanic mechanically distinct biphasic vasoconstriction is uh, thought to be the cause of the vasus spasm at the end of the line one overproduction and a nitric oxide underproduction and inflammation mediated remodeling and narrowing of the arterial wall so diagnosis of vasus spasm uh, there can be detectable neurological worsening and uh, deficits referable to ischemic territories and other causes of delayed deterioration uh, should be ruled out and the pathological increase in the transcranial doppler velocities with a high probability of significant large artery vasus spasm with velocities more than 200 cm per second and um, cerebral blood flow pathological reductions can be detected by various methods like spect synon enhanced ct ct perfusion studies thermal diffusion flowmetry and a detection of cerebral ischemia by mri diffusion weighted mri nirs and uh, microdialysis and the vascular imaging by um, uh, catheter based angiography so <coughs> we have to rule out the new or worsening neurological deficits and uh, quickly rule out hyponatremia and uh, hypo uh, hypoxia hypoglycemia fever and in, uh, signs of uh, intracranial hypertension and any seizure urgent ct scan should be advised to rule out hydrocephalus a new or large uh, enlarging infarct increased vasogenic edema around the contusion of hematoma a new hemorrhage formation uh, if a evd is inserted and um, review any uh, any monitoring underway like a transcranial doppler or uh, if available nirs brain parenchymal oximetry microdialysis or blood flow blood flowmetry vascular imaging has to be considered for these patients ct angiogram for detection of large artery narrowing when diagnosis is unclear and angiography to avoid the poor coil and uh, artifact and especially if balloon angioplasty is being considered for significant deficit despite hypertension and um, ct perfusion has to be considered if there is new or worsening neurological deficits 
and there are signs of uh, focular uh, neuralizing weakness, dysphasia, abulia, increased confusion, and um, quickly and uh, consider invasive hemodynamic monitoring uh, by a pulmonary artery catheter, especially in patients with a severe COPD, MI, or heart failure. And for all these patients, um, normal volume has to be ensured, hemoglobin more than 9, at least oxygen saturation more than 95 percentage, and optim optimal intracranial pressure with proper positioning of the EVD drain. And uh, induced hypertension beginning with a prompt 20 millimeter increase in the systolic BP with then titrate according to the clinical response with support from norepinephrine or phenylephrine. Early balloon angioplasty can be considered uh, if it is available for, for proven large artery vessel spasm, no new cerebral infarct or hemorrhage, and a fragile cardiopulmonary status. Coming to the topic, uh, the literature says this is a um, Silastasol is a primarily used in the treatment of uh, intermittent claudication. It's a 2 oxyquinolone derivative that works through the inhibition of the phosphodiesterase 3 and a rated increase in the cyclic adenosine CIMP levels. And it may attenuate the cerebral vasospasm because of its, because of its antiplatelet and vasodilatory effects. Various studies have also been there. Double blind uh, randomized controlled trial. A Japanese study in 2016 was under, uh, has been undertaken. And um, 140 patients were randomly allocated to silastasol group or the control group. And the symptomatic was spasm was significantly lower in the silastasol group than in the control group. And the poor outcome was significantly lower in the silastasol group than in the control group. And uh, multiple logistic analysis demonstrated that silastasol use was an independent factor that reduced the incidence of poor income, poor outcome. Another Japanese study in 2012, effects of silastasol uh, it was a randomized open label blinded end, end point trial only. So 109 patients were uh, randomly assigned to silastasol group or the control group. And the symptomatic vasospasm occurred in 13% um, of the silastasol group and in 40% of the control group. So significantly lower in the silastasol group. And the incidence of new cerebral infarctions was also significantly lower. Uh, they also studied the clinical outcomes at 1, 3, and 6 months after SH in silastasol group were better than those in the control group, although a significant difference was not shown. Um, a meta-analysis, trial sequential analysis study with the review of multiple studies was done in India also. That's how silastasol decreases the prevalence of vasos symptomatic vasospasm was found out. But uh, further studies involving patients from other geographic areas uh, were also required. Uh, in, our, in our institute, uh, in the uh, Department of Neurosurgery, MCH Trivandrum. Um, for the past six months, 20 patients with the cerebral vasospasm post aneurysm clipping were started on add on tap silastasol 100 mg BD at the onset of symptoms. And um, patients started on silastasol in our institution, showed good functional outcome with improvement in GCS <coughs> uh, in, and improvement in limb weakness and maintain improved status in post OPD reviews. Thank you. Vasospasm is a, uh, we can define it. Uh, sir, uh, one thing is uh, most of our patients uh, we are detecting it by uh, neurological examination only. The the angiographic clinical, the neuro the angiographic picture it's very difficult to get in our department. There is one one problem, and critically ill patients it's very difficult to. You know, 
we are uh, we are not able to tra transport all the patients in ICU in the critically ill for a This is the first CT. Sir, uh, can this uh, transcranial Doppler be done for um, other than MC infa? Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Our next presenter will be Dr. Ravya, whose topic is a case scenario titled Dilemma of Shunt Procedures in Post Meningitic Hydrocephalus.
good evening respected teachers and dear friends uh, thank you for the opportunity to present here today uh, i'm going to talk about elizabeth kinge meningitis and post meningitic hydrocephalus you can see that electron microscopic figure of El uh, elizabeth kinge meningoseptica uh, the index case was a term baby whose birth weight was 1.39 kg who developed post uh, developed continuous fever on his uh, postnatal day 18 and he was evaluated and found to have elizabeth kinge meningitis the child developed increasing head circumference since his one and a half months of age and serial af tapping was done on examination the child was active alert feeding adequate with a bulging anterior fontanelle with a head circumference increased up to 40 cm when he presented to us at 4 months of age with a positive sunset sign uh here is a cs of analysis which shows positive culture of elizabeth kinge um the sample was obtained by lamba puncture and the culture uh, of elizabeth kinge was ob obtained and according to the sensitivity he was started on meropenem amikacin and ciprofloxacin serial uh, csf studies on the successive days which shows uh, uh, reduced sugar and increased total count in the csf analysis and subsequently antibiotics was changed to cefepirazone and sulbactam admitted as elizabeth kinge meningitis with a post meningitic hydrocephalus serial af tapping and iv antibiotics continued with a progressive increase in head circumference and the positive sunset sign with an af bulge persisting with mr imaging and csf analysis a decision of vp shunt was made um bilateral you can see the frontal horns dilated with a periventricular lucencies in the imaging post operatively following vp shunt the child improved symptomatically the child became less irrit irritable af was flush sunset sunset sign disappeared and the head circumference remained static after follow up of 2 months coming on to the discussion macrocephaly is defined as an occipital frontal circumference greater than two standard deviations above the mean for a given age sex and gestation age that is more than 97th percentile the normal head circumference growth velocity in a child less than 3 months is 2 cm per month 3 to 6 months is 1 cm per month 6 month to 1 year is 0.5 cm per month 1 to 3 years is 1 cm per 6 months and 3 to 5 years 1 cm per year adult head size is achieved by 5 to 6 years a catch up of uh, pre for the preterm is 18 months it is to be measured at every visit less than 3 year with a non distance distensible plastic measuring tape and recorded on a head growth chart serial monitoring in case of a large head for monthly for a for the first year and every 3 months for the second year and up 6 monthly for up to 3 3 and a half years errors in measurements can be due to scalpedema cephalhematoma and overriding suture head circumference at birth might be 34 to 35 cm this shows the measurement of an occipital frontal circumference and uh, it is more informative when plotted over time in a head circumference chart either by the cdc or the who charts uh, hydrocephalus is excessive csf in the cerebral ventricular system with increased pressure in, which causes increased pressure and dilatation it may be caused by the increased production decreased absorption or obstruction to the csf flow coming on to the elizabeth kinge meningoseptica It is a non-fermentative gram-negative bacillus ubiquitously found in the hospital environments, soil and water, inherently resistant to multiple antimicrobials, commonly used for gram-negative bacteria including the aminoglycosides, beta-lactam agents, chloramphenicol and carbapenems. They can cause outbreaks of neonatal meningitis in neonatal ICUs. Hospital emergency infections are related to contaminated medical equipments. It can cause severe infection with high risk of mortality and neurological sequelae. in the neonates uh, in our study in conjunction with the department of neonatology government medical college tiruvannapuram the study was to study the clinical profile in neonates with elizabeth kinge meningoseptica sepsis in neonatal icu and the need of shunt procedures in the study group it's an ambispective study which is going on now uh, till june 2023 and we present you an interim report of the study in this the gestational age whether the child was a term preterm or birth and the birth weight the age of presentation of sepsis the clinical features the total count crp the platelet count features of meningitis duration of antibiotics outcome development the empirical antibiotics and the treatment given was analyzed 
3 out of the 13 children uh, the neonatal icus 3 uh, 13 children over the one and 18 month study period were diagnosed with elizabeth king meningitis and uh, 3 of them required vp shunting conclusion early suspicion and sensitive antibiotics may prevent the development of severe complication of meningitis in the case of elizabeth king meningitis meningitis frank pus appearance of css CSF should raise the suspicion of Elizabeth King meningoseptica. Septran or ciprofloxacin or vancomycin or cefepirazone sulbactam can be added to or replaced with a conventional empiric treatment of neonatal meningitis till culture results are available. Those cases in which ciprofloxacin was added early in the course did not develop ventriculitis and showed a rapid clearance of CSF and did not require multiple antibiotics later. VP shunt was procedure was done in 3 out of the 13 cases and on 3 monthly, 3, 3rd month follow up cases were symptomatically be better with no shunt related complications. Uh, required multiple and prolonged antibiotics in meningitis unlike other bacterial meningitis. Also active infection control in hospital environment is necessary to prevent Elizabeth King meningoseptica epidemics. Thank you. Till now, 21 days of antibiotics were suggested, uh, but uh, many of the CSF cultures still doesn't become negative. So oh, they remain sterile, they remain sterile but, uh, with a less sugar and uh, persistently 10 to 15 total count. Yes. Yes. Neurosurgery. Yes, sir. No, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker, Dr. <coughs> Tanzir, will be talking about the outcome analysis of transvessel screw fixation with decompression in the management of cervical spondylotic myelopathy. Teachers and my dear colleagues, uh, my topic for today, uh, my paper presentation is outcome analysis of transfacet fixation with decompression the management of cervical spondylotic myelopathy. Uh, posterior cervical uh, spine fixation for subaxial spine is one of the stabilizing procedure commonly done for cervical uh, spine pathologies due to trauma, inflammatory neoplastic and degenerative disorders. In the past, it was mainly inside of fusion with autologous bone graft and wiring techniques. But in the present era, their uh, utilization is only for limited cases due to high rate of pseudoarthrosis and uh, long-term immobilization. Uh, uh, the aim of developing a, a, a system with a minimal loss of range of movements, strong biomechanical stability and fusion leads to the invention of the present day screw fixation modalities like lateral mass fixation, pedicle, uh, pedicle interlaminar and transfacetal screws. These techniques pro, uh, prove to have a better construct with a good surgical outcome. Out of that, this uh, transarticular facet fusion is one of the evolving technique used widely due to uh, its safety, inexpensive and free hand technique which has a uh, safety equivalent or better me mechanics than that of a lateral mass and pedicle screw. Uh, my aim of my study is to analyze the outcome of transfacet fixation and decompressive laminectomy in cervical spondylitic myelopathy by comparing with lateral mass screw fixation. Uh, 
study setting in Tanjavur Medical College period from 1st January 2022 to 31st uh, December 2022. It's a retrospective uh, re descriptive study, sample size of 20. And it, uh, in that uh, 20 patients, 10 patients were uh, uh, grouped into group 1 where we operated with transfacetal screw fixation and decompression and another group 2 uh, we did uh, lateral mass followed by cervical decompression and they we also uh, we assessed the preoperative as well as the postoperative functional outcome uh, with uh, modified japanese orthopedic scoring and neuro, uh, neurix functional grading we also compare other postoperative parameters like duration of surgery blood loss number of uh, fluoroscopic shot pain and length of hospital stay uh, inclusion criteria, patient operated uh, for spondylotic myelopathy, more than three level involvement, K-line positive and posterior element, element involvement and uh, traumatic listosis and uh, less than three level involvement were excluded from my study and the operative procedure, patient in uh, prone position and head in neutral position, maybe on a horseshoe or a Mayfield. Uh, uh, then the dissection up to the in dissection both lateral mass uh, exposed both side uh, and in the group one I did professor N Muthukuma technique of transfacetal screw uh, which is like uh, 2 mm entry point is 2 mm above the middle of the lateral mass without any lateral angulation the facet is curated prior to that and it's pa packed with bone graft and drilling continued till the uh, four cortical surface purchase and after that a tapping uh, screw insertion was done. Usually 14 and 16 mm screw we select and some patient 18 mm screws are also used. And in group 2 uh, lateral mass I used a um, uh, migral and colleagues technique and uh, followed by decompression done at corresponding level and uh, followed by bony impl implantation at the facetal region for fusion and this is my one of the surgical photos where uh, the, there is a three level screw fixation with a wide laminectomy and the subsequent uh, are showing the preoperative MRI and uh, post-op day 7 x-ray and flexion extension in after three months and uh, outcome of group 1 uh, and group 2 is analyzed uh, and other variables as I mentioned before was also analyzed. Finally, in the uh, my outcome study, in transfacetal screw in post-operative uh, day 3, there was a 50% improvement and in the lateral mass it was 40 and in POD 7, transfacetal it was 90 and lateral mass it was 80%. Upon follow-up study, both studies showed a similar uh, neurological out outcome. And when I studied the other criteria like time, average blood loss, number of fluoroscopic shots and post-operative pain in hospital stay, the group 1 that is a transfacetal with uh, decompression showed a, a significant uh, uh, reduction in the number uh, like uh, the, crit uh, the measured criteria when compared to the group 2. In terms of time, 80 minutes on a mean was in group 1 and there is 131 in group 2 and uh, blood loss is minimal in group 1 that is transfacetal 272 ml when compared to 430 ml in group 2 and fluoro uh, fluoroscopic shorts were significantly less in transfacetal and uh, postoperative pain in the form of postoperative score is also less when compared to the lateral mass fixation and hospital stay also reduced in uh, transfacetal screw. Uh, as I mentioned in the prior thing uh, the most of the patients showed uh, improvement uh, in both uh, group 1 and group 2 but uh, as in the final after 3 months both of them showed the same uh, improvement in terms of neurological outcome but when compared to the other uh, post operative variable uh, uh, transfacetal was superior to uh, lateral mass fixation. For biomechanics, when I reviewed the literature, Gio and Tong uh, says uh, in his biomechanical difference of transfacetal versus lateral mass, there is a flexion extension constraints in uh, uh, LM, uh, lateral mass when compared to transfacetal screw. And uh, uh, um, Dr. Professor Nadrajan Muthukumar's uh, 
paper on how I uh, do it on transfacetal screw fixation. He said that it's a simple, inexpensive, biomechanically effective, equivalent or even superior to lateral mass screws due to four cortical purchase. And in Peter Newton and colleagues study on biomechanical difference, this year he has done it on a cadaveric study which shows almost similar uh, biomechanical strength for both transfacet and lateral mass. But uh, the trans articular will show uh, lower neurovascular injury and implant profile when compared to lateral mass screw fixation. I conclude that both transfacetal screws and lateral mass fixation provide a better and a similar neurological outcome. But transfacet fixation is simple, safer, inexpensive technique and it is better than lateral mass in reducing the duration of surgery, blood loss, pain, exposure to radiation with early discharge. Transfacet is four cortical purchase screw, hence the chance of screw pullout is less. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. No, sir. Uh, transacetal screws are less when compared to lateral mass. Uh, we can reduce our core, like each screw will be uh, 500 to 600 in JESCO, and lateral mass will be double of that, sir. And we can achieve a wide laminectomy when compared to lateral mass. And there is no rod fixation, so that cost is also reduced, and the post operative wound. Uh, uh, healing also better in uh, transfacetal because rod is not there. Wound infections are also very less in transfacetal when compared to lateral mass. Mm, sir, uh, scoliosis then lateral mass will be more preferable because to improve the scoliosis. I need a rod fixation. In my study, I have not included listasis also in my study because it's not possible with transfacet. When facets are intact only, I can go for it. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Our next speaker, Dr. Sachin Biradar, will be talking about the risk of recurrence evaluation score for chronic subdural hematoma from a tertiary care center. Good evening all. So this is uh, from a tertiary care trauma center, Tanjavar Medical College. I present a risk of recurrence score evaluation for a simple yet troubling neurosurgical condition, chronic subdural hematoma. So aim of this study was to develop a chronic XDH grading system that is risk of recurrence assessment score. The objectives are to determine the proportion of chronic XDH patients going for recurrence and to determine the predictive factors at the admission time, during treatment and during post-op period and to develop a scoring system based on those risk factors. This was a cohort study with a purposive convenient sampling, period-based sampling from January 2021 to June 2022 and six months of follow-up. 118 chronic SDH patients are analyzed with inclusion and exclusion criteria. It was a single pros center prospective study with six months of follow-up, all hematomas were classified uh, according to Nagakuchi et al. classification as homogeneous, laminar, separated and trabacular types. Pre-op and post-op volume, volume was calculated based on ABC by 2 formula, which was found to be more accurate as compared to the uh, CT-based volumetric analysis. So coming to the procedure, a standard tuber hole technique was used. Standard irrigation was done with 1.5 to 2 liters of normal saline or ingolactate. Glow drain was used and removed after 24 hours. The patient was shifted to ICU with oxygen support and asked to lie down on the side of surgery for 24 hours. Postoperatively, CT was done after 48 hours at 2 weeks and at 6 months and followed up. So increased in the subdural collection and midline shift. And if either the preoperative symptoms either persisted or recurred, then chronic SDH was diagnosed. So these were our some of intraoperative picks pictures and the CT findings showing various types of chronic SDH, isodense, hypodense and the hyperdense. 
this is the laminar gradation separated types and the trabecular types. Uh, statistical uh, data was tabulated in the MS Excel sheet and analyzed during SPSS version 22. Uh, data was described with continuous variables and number of patients as categorical variables. The pre-op volume and post-op volume was fixed with 130 and 90 with area under the curve and mean value with standard deviation after analyzing all 118 patients' volumes. So the risk of analysis for each variable and its relation to risk of recurrence in the final model were presented with an odds ratio and confidence interval of 95%. So 118 patients were included with no loss to follow up. So among 118, 23 recurred in the first three months and no recurrence was seen in three to six months. So statistical analysis demonstrated that age over 60 years, pre-op volume more than 130, post-op volume more than 90, and presence of intraoperative membranes were significant predictors of recurrence. The CT imagings, that is of the, uh, according to the Nagakuchi et al. classification, isodense or hyperdense subtypes and laminar or separated subtypes were at higher risk, whereas hypodense gradation or trabecular subtypes were not seen to recur. Results are analyzed. Uh, I can, uh, we can see that 51 to 60 out of 29, 6 cases recurred and more than 60 out of 60, 12 patients recurred amounting to 20%. Male, uh, male, uh, male sex was predominant, 87.2% out of 103, 18 patients recurred. Coming to the pre-op volume, out of uh, 80, uh, 86 patients had pre-op uh, volume less than 130, out of that only 2 recurred, whereas 32 patients had pre-op volume more than 130, and out of that 21 recurred with a showing a percentage of 66. These are various CT findings, trabecular, separated, laminated, hyperdense, isodense and hypodense, showing that hyperdense out of 4, all the 4 recurred, whereas laminated out of 11, 7 recurred, and trabecular out of 23, none recurred, and hypodense also out of 65, none recurred. So coming to presence of membranes, no membranes were seen in up to 70 patients, out of that 3 recurred where a single membrane was seen in 40 patients, out of that 8 recurred, and multiple membranes were seen in 18 patients, out of that 12 recurred. So coming to brain surfacing, this was purely subjective, based on the surgeon's inference during the operative period. Out of that 66 patient brain surfaced intraoperatively, out of that 3 recurred, and <coughs> when the brain didn't surface, 20 recurred. So post-operative volume was found to be more predictive rather than compared to pre-operative volume. So we developed a final cumulative score considering the six factors, age, CT findings, pre-operative volume, membranes, brain surfacing, and post-operative residual volume. We gave age less than 50 as 0, 1, and 2 CT findings which showed no recurrence uh, as 0 and showed recurrence as 2. Preoperative volume, also we gave 0 and 1. Membranes, again 0, 1, 2. Brain surfaced and post-op residual volume. So we analyzed our, our, sco our scoring system to our own 118 patients whom we uh, analyzed. Out of that, we found that score 8 to 10 was seen in 10 patients of non-recurrent and 9, nine patients were recurrent showing a high grade of recurrence in high, with high score. Again, after, uh, after finishing our study, we internally validated our study and 44 patients are analyzed from June 2022. We found that out of, non, uh, out of 44 patients, 37 has no recurrence, whereas 7 has recurrence. And in the 7 recurrent patient, the score 8 to 10 was seen in 4 patients showing high grade recurrence associated with our score. So we uh, come into discussion. Chronic SDH is no proper standard widely accepted grading system. So we developed a six component prognostic uh, grading system. Our six tier system improves, uh, involves the various variables and each of variables which were used had both logical uh, and uh, evidence based scoring in the system. And pre as previously published by Jack et al, it was a three tier model with pre-op volume, age and presence or absence of septations. It was a retrospective study. 
so the CT findings were included. Hypertension or gradation subtypes are considered to be earlier stages. So they have the chances of rebleeding. Whereas trabecular uh, subtype of chronic SDH is considered to be the resolution stage in which the rebleeding uh, re seems to be abated. So based on statistical analysis, pre-op and post-op volume was fixed with a cutoff of pre-op volume less than 130. And more than pre-op volume, the post-op volume signifies that brain failed to expand. And so it carries the better prognostication to assess the risk of recurrence. So post-op volume more than 200 ml actually indicate a lower tendency and ability of brain to re-expand. So may have practical implications for the patients and high risk of recurrence. If the brain surfaced immediately during the surgery, post-evacuation or post salva as suggested, there is less likely evidence of recurrence, recollection and hence recurrence. Earlier studies also observed that well-developed subdural neomembranes are crucial factors for cerebral re-expansion, a phenomena that it takes at least 10 to 20 days. And hence, re immediate re-expansion or surfacing and lack of membranes are considered to include in our scoring system. Male gender, coagulation abnormalities, and history of brain infarction were not statistically significant and with independent and there were uh, not uh, significant independent predictors hence excluded. This prognostic system can be generalized likewise on the basis of ICH grading for better outcomes of a patient. So to conclude, as there is no widely accepted grading system, this can be used on more patients and can be validated thereof. Combining subcomponents in prognostic grading system is a powerful and applicable tool for post-op risk of recurrence stratification in patients with chronic SDH. This grading system is our own assessment of cases and may not be 100% accurate. So for this, a large scale and prospective application of proposed grading system would strengthen its clinical utility and universal applicability in practice. These were my references and thank you Sri Chitra for giving me this opportunity. Okay. Let me ask you. Yes, sir. Uh, Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We are giving, sir. Uh, but uh, I started in the midway uh, in the study, so I have not included those patients in this. Yes, sir. They are. Recurrence of for yes, sir. embolization they are doing, but our center is not equipped with that. Yes, hold on. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes, sir. Open. It's open. Okay. Statistics. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes. You see, you see, all of them will have between 60 and 70%. 60 and 70% recurrence. So, you are talking very rarely of these statistics. All of them, yes. Study. 
सूत्र यस सर they were not completely hypodense they were i we tried a means the that post trauma day in them didn't match with the symptoms and the gcs was good so in that we tried barhol aspirin clopidogrel so resident there is a uh, hypertension hypotension hypotension spontaneous intracranial hypotension Dr. Akarsh will be presenting about uh, cervical spine TB, a case report. is not working.
సార్ ద లీజన్ వాస్ ఫ్రమ్ సి త్రీ టు సి ఫైవ్ సార్ యాప్సిస్ వాజ్ యాంటీరియర్ అండ్ ఎపిడ్యూరల్ బోత్ సైడ్స్ యాప్సిస్ వాజ్ దర్ విత్ కంప్లీట్ డిస్ట్రక్షన్ ఆఫ్ సి ఫోర్ అండ్ సి ఫైవ్ వర్టిబ్రల్ బాడీ విత్ ఆన్ ఇంటర్ ఆపరేటివ్ లాట్ ఆఫ్ ఫస్ అండ్ లైటిక్ లీజన్ ఆఫ్ ద సి త్రీ బాడీ వాజ్ దర్ కంప్లీట్ కార్పెక్టమీ వాజ్ డన్ అండ్ వి ఆర్ టేకన్ ఐలి గ్రాఫ్ట్ మెజరింగ్ అరౌండ్ ఫైవ్ సెంటీమీటర్ అండ్ యూ ప్లేస్ ఇట్ అలాంగ్ విత్ ద ప్లేట్ ఫిక్సేషన్ ప్రెసెంటేషన్ షీ ప్రెసెంటెడ్ సార్ పెయిన్ అండ్ షీ ప్రెసెంటెడ్ వాజ్ విత్ క్వాటరీ ప్రైసెస్ సార్ విత్ పవర్ యాజ్ త్రీ బై ఫైవ్ విత్ సెన్సరీ కంప్లైంట్స్ అండ్ బౌల్ అండ్ బ్లాడర్ ప్రెసెంటెడ్ లేట్ అరౌండ్ సిక్స్ టు ఎయిట్ మంత్స్ లేటర్ ఆఫ్టర్ ద ఫస్ట్ సిమ్టమ్ ప్రెసెంటేషన్ వన్ ఇయర్ ఓవర్ సార్ ఎస్ సార్ నౌ షీ వాజ్ ఏ టీచర్ ట్వంటీ ఫోర్ ఇయర్ ఓల్డ్ టీచర్ నౌ షీ ఈస్ గోయింగ్ బ్యాక్ టు ద జాబ్ అండ్ షీ ఈస్ ఏబుల్ టు పర్ఫామ్ ద జాబ్ సార్ ఆల్ ఫోర్ వన్ వన్ ఇయర్ రెజిమెంట్ వీ ఆర్ గివెన్ సార్ సార్ సిక్స్ మంత్స్ ఇన్స్టెడ్ ఆఫ్ సిక్స్ మంత్స్ విల్ కంటిన్యూ ఫర్ వన్ ఇయర్ అండ్ ఎస్ సార్ అండ్ విల్ ఆల్సో యాడ్ సిప్రోఫ్లాక్సిన్ ఫర్ అరౌండ్ సిక్స్ మంత్స్ విల్ యాడ్ సిప్రోఫ్లాక్సిన్ సార్ లిటరేచర్ ఆల్సో దే గివెన్ ఎయిటీటీ షుడ్ బి కంటిన్యూడ్ ఫర్ సిక్స్ మంత్స్ టు వన్ ఇయర్ ఫోర్ డ్రగ్స్ ఇనిషి ఫుల్ వన్ ఇయర్ ఫోర్ డ్రగ్స్ will also add uh, ciprofloxacin sir ah uh, yes sir uh, neurological deficit quadriparesis uh, which is uh, progressive initially compressive myelopathy was there sir Uh, one is uh, one is uh, one is uh, uh, instability due to bony destruction yes sir so that means is it one stable instability or two stable two two gram instability uh, uh, this is just uh, one column instability uh, sir only the anterior uh, part was uh, posterior part was intact there was uh sir uh, anterior uh, uh, body anterior uh, two third of the body is uh, one part sir to uh, anti posterior one third of the body is second and uh, so second so that means two column distribution uh, not sir, one sir, right sir, yes. then the second important point is early mobilization not that uh, ab- there is an abscess abscess so what happens is anti tuberculous therapy does not enter this act only in the abscess right yes, sir 